May the 3rd last year is a really important date for everybody that are dealing with obesity because uh, for so long we fight within the WHO to have obesity as an independent risk. Uh, I will say that we are partners here, but you know, obesity was always connected with diabetes. And that was like one indicator. But from May the third last year, obesity was recognized within the WHO as an independent risk factor and as a complex multifactorial disease. Two months before May the 3rd, World Obesity Atlas established something that we know for quite some time and actually the first technical report that, that uh, established that was back in 2008 that obesity now as a chronic non-communicable diseases and we know according to the international classification of diseases that there are, that it is a disease, but WHO never recognized that so far, is a significant risk factor for type, uh, type two diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, plus many, many other things. Um, actually, it's, it's the only common denominator, I would say, is the only statistically significant risk factor, not only for those three things, but uh, mental disorders and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and another two biological risk factors, uh, hypertension and dyslipidemia as well. So by tackling obesity, actually you tackle not only the obesity, but five main causes of, of deaths these days, actually those five are responsible for the more than 90% of deaths in the Western uh, part of the world. And when I said that, I will move back to Croatia because I mean, after all, we are all in Croatia now. And let me tell you, if we just halted the race, just halted the race of obesity in Croatia, we, we would avoid, believe it or not, uh, by 2050, half of the million of chronic non-communicable diseases that I mentioned, quite a lot, right? especially if you know that we have 3 million and 900 people in Croatia, not that much. Out of that number, 167,000 uh, would be diabetes type 2. And actually it's 75% of diabetes by dealing with obesity. And ever since we know how to calculate um, longevity, and we do know from 1953, and we have a census, actually this is the first uh, thing, this is the first disease, if you will, that might reduce and that will reduce life expectancy at birth. And by 2050 in Croatia, it will reduce the uh, longevity for 3.5 years which is quite a lot, but we do have a big problem. Are we still talking about 15 minutes, Dario? Still 15? Okay. No, no, no. Okay. So let me give you a few numbers about epidemiology of obesity in adults. Worldwide, we are talking about nearly 40%, a bit more prominent in female in comparison to male. Out of that, 30% obese people, body mass index 30 or higher. In Europe, plus 13 to make it easier, 52.7%. More prominent, as you can see, statistically significantly higher problem in men in compar comparison to uh, women. Out of that, 16.5% of obesity. What is it like in Croatia? Plus 13. So it was 40 plus 13, 53 plus 13. We are here on 65. That's an approximation, this 13. So 65% of adults in Croatia, uh, and you can compare that with an EU average of 52.7, 53% are with overweight or obese. 
73% of men in comparison of 59% uh, of female. More or less the same, the same situation is in, in, um, uh, in, as EU average. And as you can see, men in the EU are significantly, statistically significantly, and we know that by calculation, of course, uh, more uh, overweight and obese in comparison to um, female population. I already mentioned this situation. I don't know if you, if you know that, but we are number one not only in soccer, almost. I mean, on Sunday we will beat them, probably. Uh, let's hope. But we are number one in obesity as well, together with Malta. I would say that we share the first place with Malta. We are 1B, they are 1A, because they have more obese people, we have more overweight people, but you know, all together the sum is 65%. It goes the same for men and female as well in Malta. 23% of our adults are obese. And as you can see, from 2003 and ever since then, we have the uh, cross-sectional studies of representative samples, so we can, we can compare the numbers because the methodology is quite important and we have the same methodology for all the data that I'm presenting here. We have an increase uh, of adults with overweight and obesity. We did, we did actually, can I use that? We did, as you can see, we reduced that just a bit in 2015 because we had an excellent response on our campaign that was unique for everybody and female population respond quite well. But as it always will, we sense, I mean, actually what happened, to be honest, a high educated a female, high educated women, and we had the smallest problem, of course, among that population of high educated uh, women responded, you know, on our campaign. And due to that, we had a significant, you know, uh, decline of, of female with the problem of overweight and obesity. But ever since 2015, there is an increase for men, women, and of course, both. If we continue like that, in only a few years, by 2030 will be, we're talking about adults, number 10 within WHO European region, out of 53 countries. Quite some results, right? Uh, share of people with overweight and obesity in Croatia by age, it's very visible, as you can see. By the way, the, the, the darker dots are men, the lighter dots are uh, women. Uh, there is an increase by age, which is something that we expected by the age 65, 74. And then due to the chronic diseases, people start to take care about their weight and we have, uh, we have a decline for the age six, uh, 75 plus. Share of people with obesity in Croatia by educational level. It's something that most probably you expected. Uh, every lower level of education uh, reach, you know, is, is a risk factor for, the, uh, for obesity. The same goes for the uh, people with a uh, lower income, 40% of the, which is first and second quintile. 40% uh, uh, of the people with, within the first and the second quintile have a higher risk for being obese. Uh, when talking about level of urbanization, as expected, if you live in the urban places, you have a lower risk for being obese. I would stop with adults and tell a story about epidemiology of obesity in children, and they are going to be adults one day. In the world, 18.4% or, 18 or of children uh, and adolescents aged 5 to 19 are overweight. And within that, 6.7 of them are obese. More boys than girls. In the Europe, 29% um, 
Oh, okay. Um, what is important to say that Croatia is on the fifth, on the high fifth place out of 39 countries that are presented, the data that was presented here. Um, and uh, I would say that it's very important here to emphasize that the first seven places are Mediterranean countries, always. There is a clear geographical gradient from north to the south. And the biggest problem of obesity is in Mediterranean countries, especially among boys. I will go briefly through this. 35% of children are overweight and obese. 15% of them are obese. There is, as you can see, an increase from 2003 till these days. We did stop, you know, before COVID, just before COVID, we did stop an increase of obesity among children, but then COVID came. I'm not going to tell you the story about two-way pathways between COVID and obesity. If we continue like that, what's going to happen? Our children will be on the third out of 53 places within the WHO region, European region, in just seven years. I think that I will stop here due to the time. Oh, I can, okay. What are the determinants of obesity? Oh, of course, uh, beside biological factors, there is a balance between healthy nutrition and physical activity, but there is an environment. I think that more or less nobody chooses to be obese. Some people maybe does, but you know, you never know. And it was stated quite clearly in Lancet in 2011, it was something like this. Um, obesity is just a normal response of a normal person to an abnormal obesogenic environment that we are living in. So basically, older age, living in rural area, lower level of education, lower socioeconomic status, excessive alcohol use, and in Croatia, processed meat con consumption are the risk factors for obesity. Believe it or not, there is always something that I want to add, believe it or not, you know, everything that I, um, I mean, every single determinant that is connected with obesity is socially determined, just like obesity, except pure meat products. 67% of our adults, no matter to what socioeconomic group belongs, eat, uh, cured meat products regularly on a daily basis. The roots are very, very deep, as you can see, possible connections. And since we are here at the 40th International Symposium on Diabetes and Nutrition, and you are all aware of the facts that connect obesity with diabetes, and let me show the newest data that I have on diabetes in Croatian adults, or how many obese people, overweight and obese people, are in Croatia with diabetes type 2, you can see that 85% of our adults who have diabetes type 2 in Croatia are overweight or obese. So let me ask you, Professor Rahelic, what is it? Or maybe all of you, is it obesity? Is it diabetes? or is it diabetes? Thank you. Yes, question. Dear Professor uh, Milanovic, thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, the questions will be at the end of this session. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to invite uh, the president of Croatian Society for Diabetes and uh, Metabolic Disorders to share with us some uh, data on the current situation on diabetes in Croatia. Thank you very much, Professor Klobuchar. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Music Milanovic, for an excellent talk and also for for great introduction uh, for uh, diabetes, obesity, or diabetes. I would say that the diabetes would be the appropriate term, uh, as well as mild instead of nothing right now. So um, when we talk about uh, the Croatia, I, first I have to share several uh, important facts from Croatia. Uh, several years ago, 
according to the last records, we had 4.2 million people. Right now, we have, according to uh, last uh, data, uh, less than 4 million, so we have 3.8 million uh, inhabitants in Croatia. On the other side, we have uh, 388,000 people with uh, diabetes in Croatia, uh, which have registered diabetes, so diagnosed uh, people with uh, diabetes diagnosis, but approximately we estimate that uh, our National Institute of Health uh, estimates that we have more than 550,000 uh, 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 people with diabetes last year. On the other side, uh, the cost of treatment is uh, in every single country pretty high. In Croatia, uh, you wouldn't believe that uh, almost 10% of uh, our national, uh, almost 12% of uh, our total expenditures of, of our national uh, health uh, insurance company went to treatment of people with diabetes in uh, 2009. So it was 12, almost 12% 12 of total uh, expenses. And from that uh, part of the uh, expenses, 86% uh, were cost of treatment of chronic complications. Seven years after that, uh, and that was the, our last uh, information regarding the cost, and it was the uh, co uh, cost effectiveness study in Croatia, uh, can you imagine the total, the total cost of treatment of diabetes in Croatia were uh, 6.4 billion kuna uh, since January the 1st. We have euros as a uh, currency, as you could not notice, and it's not some good experience because kuna, uh, after introduction of kuna, everything is much more expensive than it was uh, last year. But still, right now we have uh, euros as well, so uh, we spent uh, more than six hundred million of euros for treatment of diabetes. And can you imagine, since 2009 and 2016, uh, uh, in, uh, it was 12%. Right now, we have uh, almost 20% of cost of uh, total expenses of our national insurance uh, company. And uh, you can see it. First, we uh, spend 86% of that money for the cost of uh, chronic complication treatment. Right now, we are using uh, a, almost 88% of that money for treatment of chronic complications. Probably the one of the reason is what already Professor uh, uh, Music Milanovic already mentioned, because we have high number of people with diabetes, high uh, number of uh, diabetes uh, people in Croatia, and right now, this was the last cost effectiveness study, right now we are performing the, another one, and can you imagine, we are uh, right now the, the cost of treatment is uh, approximately 800 million euros per year for the diabetes in Croatia. So you could see here that treatment of cardiovascular complications are, uh, are the worst because almost 60% of those, those expenses are uh, the cost of treatment of chronic complications. And we can ask ourselves why. Well, sometimes I feel like this guy because um, usually when I speak about our success, great success in Croatian diabetology, and we are, we are uh, spending much more money every single year, we are treating more people with diabetes and with less uh, success, so uh, sometimes I feel like him. And diabetes in Croatia is on the fourth uh, cause of death. Before COVID, uh, diabetes was on the third. So COVID changed it, and right now, after COVID, we will again, the diabetes will be the third cause of death in Croatia. Approximately 2,000 euros we are spending for every single person with diabetes in Croatia, and it's not just about money. I still am using this slide because I really, I was, I was emotionally connected with our previous money, Kuna, Croatian Kuna, but right now I should replace the, this uh, slide with euros, but still I'm still using um, Kuna slide in instead of euros. So uh, we already heard from, from the previous uh, lecture that uh, also the uh, life duration is shorter in people with uh, obesity, but also in, uh, with diabetes. And uh, reality in Croatia that we have approximately between 170 and 200 endocrinologists and diabetologists, including residents of endocrinology and diabetology. 
on the other hand, we have 2,500 general practitioners who have 40 to 80 patients per day. So people, uh, general practitioners, they cannot treat 40 to 80 patients per day and to treat them appropriately. It's not realistic. Like this uh, photo is not realistic. It's Photoshop. Right now we can do a lot with the, uh, lot of Photoshop, but it's not realistic even in our clinical reality. We do have global forces for endocrinology and dermatology, and uh, already we heard about the new revolution, uh, re resolution, but it's also revolution against uh, uh, obesity. And uh, we, have, we do have a resolution, our parliamentarian resolution uh, um, um, for people with diabetes, and we are trying to renew it in the Croatian uh, parliament. Uh, but also, uh, uh, when we talk about residency and fellowship, prior we had uh, four years of uh, in general internal medicine and plus two years of um, residency or fellowship in endocrinology and diabetology. Right now, we have completely just endocrinology and diabetology with very uh, low amount of hours spent with general internal medicine. So fellowship plan and list of competency is determined by Ministry of Health. And uh, right now, I'm, I'm happy that uh, Professor Klobuchar and myself, we are uh, the advisors uh, of Ministry of Health uh, uh, about diabetes. On the other side, we know that uh, it's important to think globally, but act locally. So we are trying to do that. We increased the cooperation between healthcare professionals and patients. We included uh, also people with diabetes uh, societies, collaboration with general practitioners and diabetologists, partnership with Ministry of Health, with National Insurance Company, Nas uh, National Institute for Health, and also with NGOs. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say that we have a very good connection with all those uh, um, uh, institutions because uh, only from that perspective we can do something. On the other side, we have Croatian experience. I, I am proud to be Croat, so you, you know that from our previous meetings, and I'm always uh, proud to, taste, to say I'm from Croatia, and my friends, they know, okay, he will talk about Croatia. But Croatia maybe is not the most beautiful country, but for me it is, and I hope that you will share my, experience, uh, my feelings uh, after this Pula meeting as well, maybe not uh, the more beautiful, but in the first five places. We do have Croatian guidelines for treatment of type 2 diabetes. The first guidelines were published uh, in uh, uh, 2011. We uh, published even then, we recognized the importance of um, personal approach to target uh, of HbA1c. Also, we, uh, we uh, perform and uh, published new guidelines 2016. And right now, we are in the process of publishing new guidelines, completely new guidelines, which will uh, take into consideration all new information and all new clinical studies which are published. Also, we completely change and switch uh, our, uh, our focus from insulin therapy, especially from premix insulin to basal insulin, and also modern therapies uh, which are uh, with proven uh, cardioprotective and nephroprotective uh, action. Uh, modern basal insulin analogs are now available for people with even with type 2 diabetes um, in, and, uh, in combination with basal oral therapy with reasonable co-payment. So co-payment is approximately 12 euros per, per box of insulin, the modern insulin, which is uh, pretty affordable for the majority of the people. Uh, first, we had uh, 100 uh, insulin pumps per year. Right now, uh, pump therapy is um, fully reimbursed for people with uh, type 1 diabetes and uh, especially with some uh, special criteria, and it's on the list of, or of orthopedic things. Uh, several years ago, we increased the number of test strips for pediatric population uh, from 2,000 to 2,500 uh, fully reimbursed. And, uh, and uh, the director of uh, insurance company, they asked me, why you did it? Yeah, why you asked it for increasing? But uh, uh, she didn't know that uh, I did it just to, uh, to decrease the, uh, the price difference between uh, test strips and uh, samples. And uh, very soon we got uh, a free uh, uh, fresh um, uh, flash glucose monitoring system for pediatric population for type 1 diabetes, also population adults, but with frequent uh, uh, hypoglycemia. Right now, we have uh, FGM and also continuous glucose monitoring for all people with type 1 diabetes fully reimbursed. 
and uh, within next m one month or two, uh, we will have also continued glucose monitoring system for all people with type 1 diabetes, no matter, uh, but only for those who, were, who will be treated with MDI, so with multiple daily injections, also fully reimbursed. So we have pretty good situation, and we are proud to say that people in Croatia are in, at the same level of uh, opportunity like people in some other countries all over the world. We organize many conferences and postgraduate courses, including also EISD uh, conferences. The first EISD uh, postgraduate course was in former Yugoslavia and uh, also uh, 75, and we organize uh, twice 2014 and 2017. Also, we organize Diabetes Nutrition Study Group, as you know, first 2013 and uh, again uh, 2018. And um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Cyril Kellner and John Sivan Piper, also the Secretary Al Adir and Harrison, uh, the Executive Committee, Hannah uh, and uh, Ursula and Ulf, uh, previous uh, chairpersons of Diabetes Nutrition Study Group to give us that opportunity to, uh, to uh, be proud of with Croatia. On the other side, I have to say that we are a small country, we are uh, in the middle of the Europe, and I, am, I said I am proud of it. We are in the central part of the Europe, and also we have uh, 1,185 islands. Uh, we have one special island in the, uh, in the shape of the heart, uh, and also uh, we are proud of our history, and we are uh, proud that um, Croatia is the uh, next uh, home, uh, homeland of necktie, as you already mentioned and already mentioned uh, in previous. And we are very proud and that we have uh, very good uh, soccer players, like um, Professor Music already said, and we are proud uh, to, to have our heroes in, in football. And uh, of course, uh, we have very, very good players and uh, majority of them are uh, world-known uh, players, um, also in your countries as well. And for the end, uh, the most important thing, no matter about the modern technology, no matter about modern therapies in diabetes, I have to say that um, we usually forget about the uh, non-pharmacological measures and also education. Because education is one of the most important parts of the treatment of type 2 diabetes, including type 1 diabetes. And like George Orwell said, helping others is good, but teaching them to help themselves is even better. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank Professor Ahlic, not only for his presentation, but for everything he does uh, to improve the outcomes of people living with um, diabetes in, in Croatia. Thank you very much. We, we are also very good friends, so uh, probably that's the reason why uh, Professor Klobuchar said that he is also vice president of our society, so uh, it's our, uh, we did it together, together with our executive committee and people who already helped us. So my, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, hopefully he, he is already online. It's Professor Davor Milicic. Uh, I would like kindly ask uh, technical support to, uh, to put his presentation also and to share the screen of Professor Milicic. Professor Milicic is the uh, uh, professor of medicine, professor of cardiology, and also he's the president of Croatian uh, um, Society of Cardiology. On the other side, and he, is, uh, he was a dean of medical uh, school of medicine, University of Zagreb, and also he is the uh, director of uh, uh, clinic of cardio of, for cardiology uh, at uh, Zagreb University Center. Uh, uh, and also, uh, he currently is also the vice president of Croatian Academy of uh, Science and Art. It's my great pleasure to have you here, uh, at least virtually. Unfortunately, Professor wanted to come, but uh, he has another obligation in the same time today, so he will join us even uh, this evening. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Miricic, and right now I would kindly ask you to deliver your lecture. Thank you, Dario. Distinguished Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure and honor to participate on this jubilatory meeting. And I'm really sorry that I couldn't make it to, to, to join you physically. But you have my warm greetings and uh, you have my welcome, uh, in particular on behalf of the Croatian Academy of uh, Sciences and Arts, because uh, its medical department 
uh, is patronizing this uh, wonderful meeting. Uh, my task is to, to end this uh, very interesting session uh, and to tell you about cardiovascular diseases in Croatia. Okay. So as you know, uh, we know, but probably all of us don't know that a, a mortality of cardiovascular disease is declining over the years. If we look uh, to year 2005, it was about 50%, uh, it was 53%. Then uh, you can clearly see that mortality uh, was decreasing over the year, over the years in 2013, it was already below 50%, and here we see 2014. In 2016, it was 45%, uh, we were not still satisfied, and uh, Croatia was still among uh, the European countries that were categorized as countries with high cardiovascular risk. And finally, uh, these are the newest results uh, dating from 2021. Uh, where you can see that uh, the deaths from cardiovascular disease uh, were uh, still declining, and they are, I hope, and now we have uh, below 27% of total deaths caused by cardiovascular disease. But still, cardiovascular disease is on the first place uh, uh, in mortality list, uh, in our national mortality list. Of course, on the second place, Malignancies, and uh, don't forget that COVID-19 also played an important role in total mortality, but we have to take into account that many deaths uh, in COVID-positive patients were due to uh, severe endothelial dysfunction and uh, cardiovascular breakdown. What are the key problems when we talk about cardiovascular disease in Croatia, we still fight with unrecognized and un undertreated arterial hypertension. As we have heard, there is a growing epidemic of obesity. Uh, people still eat unhealthy diet and uh, they don't live uh, in a way that they move enough. They, they, they are prone to, to, to spend their days uh, sitting uh, either working on the table, by the table, or watching TV, not enough sports activities. Metabolic syndrome and diabetes are growing. We have excessive salt intake, and we know it very well. It's surely still above 10 grams per day, instead 5 or below 5 grams per day. We have a lot of smoking population. Now it's a little bit above 30%, uh, uh, below 30%, but it's very significant. And if we, if we compare our countries with the other EU countries, then probably we are on the top or very close uh, to the top. Uh, myocardial infarction and stroke are still the leading causes of death. And last but not least, and that is extremely important, besides insufficient primary prevention, we surely have insufficient secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. However, it's not so bad in Croatia. What are the greatest achievements of Croatian cardiology? Surely, primary PCI network for not only ST elevation, but now in non-ST elevation cardiac infarction as well. It started in 2004 as a pilot project uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a project, a project uh, initiated by the Croatian Cardiac Society and endorsed by our Ministry of Health. Then we are introducing all the novelties in the era of, in, in, in the sphere of interventional cardiology, and there is no intervention that can't be done in Croatia. Now, uh, of course, uh, we, we are very advanced in the cardiac diagnostics. We have uh, very nice achievements, uh, I would say, recently in arrhythmology and pacing, and now we are very comparable with the uh, uh, most developed countries in Europe, and we have great uh, program of heart transplantation and uh, treat treatment of advanced heart failure, including 
various kinds of mechanical surgical support. A few words about our primary PCI network. It started as a pilot project immediately after the guidelines were published uh, telling us that primary PCI is superior to fibrinolysis in treatment of ST elevation myocardial infarction. So it started in Zagreb region and in Rijeka region, and uh, then it developed and covered the entire Croatian population. And this network is still, still functioning very well. It's extremely effective. It is, of course, 24 seven. And as you can see, we have many centers uh, in our country treating 24 seven acute coronary syndrome uh, in our uh, patients. If we compare us regarding primary uh, PCI per million per year uh, among uh, uh, other European, with other European countries, we see that uh, we are regarding the numbers of primary PCIs per million, uh, nearly on the top, the same as in as Italy and, 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 and really uh, most developed countries uh, in, the, in, in Europe, uh, achieving uh, now more than 6,000 primary PCIs per million per year. But there is always but. What about secondary prevention? A good example is Eurospire study where we participated, participated together with uh, the listed countries, countries listed on this slide. And I will talk, uh, tell you a few results concerning uh, patients who have already suffered myocardial infarction. So we are talking about secondary prevention. Uh, look at this, resistant smokers after suffering uh, myocardial infarction. The overall was 55%, which is also very high, but we were worse in Croatia, it was 60% of smokers who already suffered myocardial infarction. So that is much more than one third of the entire population that is smoking in Croatia. And it is really a disaster. Then prevalence of obesity. We were just uh, in, in the middle. Prevalence of post mi obese patients uh, in Croatia was 38%, and that was as was the overall for European studies, uh, European countries that were studied. But you can see that there is a huge span uh, regarding obesity prevalence in, in, in these countries that were uh, participating in Euros 5. Five. Prevalence of central obesity, uh, more than 50% of our post MI patients uh, suffered from central obesity that is in particular atherogenic and dangerous, much more than, than other types of obesity. Regular phys physical activity at least 30 minutes on average five, three, five times a week. We were worse than the average. Uh, almost 40% uh, percent of people uh, exercised regularly, but the rest were uh, exclusively sedentary. And of course, it is an indicator of failure of our secondary prevention despite excellent treatment of myocardial infarction. It is a huge case. LDL cholesterol. In that time, the study was performed. Uh, the target level of LDL was below 1.8. Now we have the target below 1.4. Only 31% of patients in Croatia achieved that target in their secondary prevention, which is really uh, frustrating. As we know that LDL cholesterol is one of the main predictors and main causes of uh, progressive atherosclerosis. And it's in particular important in these vulnerable population, which is not covered with uh, adequate anti-lipid therapy. Then we introduced some new techniques like TAVI, and we are performing TAVI in several centers in each uh, region of Croatia, and that program is uh, going on very successfully. Uh, there are many pro progresses in interventional cardiology, as I already mentioned. Here are some details. All the new methods 
are introduced in our uh, departments, uh, particularly in academic departments, but also in some uh, county hospitals uh, with very ambitious cardiologists that also try to introduce everything what is effective and what is modern uh, nowadays to, 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 to intervene in, in various uh, heart diseases and vascular diseases. Uh, electrophysiology centers in Croatia, we have nine, five in Zagreb, and the rest are in the regions that are uh, depicted here. Uh, ablations in Croatia are uh, growing, uh, particularly during the last, uh, I would say, uh, 10 years, and here you can see that in 2007, we started very modestly but in 2021, we reached uh, very nice numbers of ablation procedures in Croatia. Here you can see also growth of AFib ablations. AFib ablation is uh, the most uh, frequent arrhythmia uh, that uh, indicates uh, the possibility to be ablated uh, intervention. Uh, we, also, we also introduce in some new methods in these ablative techniques uh, preferring more and more cryo ablation in atrial fibrillation versus classical radio treatment ablation because it is a, a simpler method and uh, with less complications. Uh, here are data showing ablations of arrhythmias per million in various European countries. Uh, in the last 2017, and here you can see that we were under quotation marks, of course, better than Austria, Latvia, Poland, Spain, Portugal, Greece, and uh, it was a kind of a nice uh, result for, for our electrophysiology that was, uh, uh, that doesn't have so long lasting tradition as other segments of cardiology. And uh, if we compare us with uh, uh, Balkan countries and in Central Europe, even in 2017, we had the leading position uh, regarding the ablations per million. And here are cardiac pacing centers in Croatia. There are much more, of course, than uh, centers that do ablations, uh, that do ablations, but all of the centers that do ablations, of course, they, they implant cardiac pacemakers. But the need for cardiac pacemaker implantation is much bigger, and therefore our cardiologists now in all these centers listed here are uh, very experienced in uh, uh, cardiac pacemakers implantations. We took that, that uh, procedure from cardiac surgeons entirely. ICD per million uh, cardioverted defibrillators, implanted cardioverted defibrillators per million in Europe. Uh, here are data that ends with 2017. In 2017, after many years, we finally uh, almost reached the magic number of 100 per million. So we were not at the European top. Uh, the same was with CRTs, cardio uh, recent synchronizing uh, devices. But if we analyze the, uh, here are we among Central Europe and Balkan countries, until 2017, but if we uh, now use 2020 and compare us with European countries that were better than us in 2017, and they didn't uh, they didn't register such a growth in, in, in numbers of these procedures, then we see that uh, we have uh, further progress, and now in ablations we are uh, almost like France. Uh, uh, in uh, AFib ablations, we are much better than Austria, France, and Poland. In ICD implantations, we are very, very good. In CRT, uh, uh, these cardio synchronizing uh, electrostimulators in uh, Europe, we were also uh, very good. So, uh, this is really a great achievement of our clinical cardiology uh, that was quite recently. Uh, observed and uh, these numbers are still growing. And finally, I would few, uh, I would uh, spend a few minutes 
to comment uh, our uh, treatment of advanced heart failure in Croatia. In my hospital, University Hospital Zagreb, we started with heart transplantation program very early, which was 1988. And since 1998, that program was con continuously going on, even during the world, uh, during the war for uh, liberation of our countries, uh, of our country in the 90s. We were transplanting as well. And uh, we introduced uh, uh, from, uh, the entire program of mechanical circulatory support started from 2008. Uh, heart transplantation rates in Europe uh, 2017, we were on the second place uh, after Slovenia with uh, almost eight transplants per million in 2017. Slovenia was the only country in Europe that was better. Look at this, Great Britain 2.9, uh, Spain 6.6, Portugal 4.5, before they were transplant champions. And uh, according to the newest data, we are on the first place in heart transplant numbers per million in Europe. Uh, we are performing 10 or more than 10 per million, and we are better than all the countries that are uh, transplanting hearts in, in, in Europe. Uh, by the way, uh, some of our neighboring countries and not few countries in what is called Europe, according to the World Health Organization, are not uh, having heart transplant program at all. Hospitals with cardiac transplantation per million, we have two hospitals, that means 0.5 per million, and this is completely enough for our needs. We started with mechanical circulatory support in 2008. Uh, that was our first paracorporeal pump, and it ended spectacularly because this very, very sick young patient who would otherwise die was successfully transplanted after dealing with cardiac and septical shock, mouth organ failure, and heparin induced thrombocytopenia. He was um, uh, almost one month on this extracorporeal pump, he was saved. And since then, we started uh, very, uh, very um, intensively with our mechanical circulatory support program. And we use various kinds of support from implantable pumps on, on the right side of this picture, paracorporeal uh, pumps. We also, uh, we also use ECMO, uh, even this transportable ECMO for transportation of patients with, uh, in different parts of Croatia to our center or to other, uh, to, to, to one more tertiary center in Zagreb who is dealing with these patients. And uh, we are among the rare, rare countries in the world uh, with experience with uh, total artificial heart as well. Uh, during the last three years, we have introduced in Bella, this is innovative uh, percutaneous pump which supports the failing left ventricle. Uh, it is inserted very elegantly and it, has, it can last up to 30 days or even more. And now we are using the Bella RP for supporting the right ventricle because they are very rare right ventricular uh, assist devices and we use them as well. Um, we also introduced some other innovative approaches to temporarily support, in this case, uh, left heart, and in this other case, right heart. Uh, and, uh, besides the very successful heart transplant program, we have experience with various kinds of implantable left ventricular assist devices. Now, as the rest of the world, we are implanting only HeartMate 3 because the only pump on the market available, but we have experience with all these pumps you can see here and more than these. And uh, we have some successes in that program that are internationally recognized, such as uh, the case of this patient who was implanted with, with two uh, ventricular assist devices, one for the left heart and one for the right heart, and that is very rare in, 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 in clinical practice uh, worldwide, and that was the longest survival uh, as a bridge to transplant. He lived more than four years 
very uh, nicely with these two pumps uh, for being transplanted. And now this patient uh, has been successfully transplanted and has an excellent quality of life. Our experience is total articulation heart among very rare uh, centers and uh, our experience with various kinds of implantable pumps over the last uh, decade. Uh, some important thing, uh, the people, this is uh, Professor Jarvik, who is an inventor of artificial heart, uh, uh, visited us several times, not only him, and just to, 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 to show you some of our patients. Um, our cardiac society is deeply involved in activities of our cardiac community. We don't have many societies, we only have one society of cardiology. And we all uh, work together to uh, improve uh, our clinical and uh, preventive cardiology, to raise awareness of uh, cardiovascular diseases in Croatia, and to fight for uh, benefits of our patients with our health insurance company uh, in dialogue with our Ministry of Health. So we are very active, but we also organize many educational conferences, domestic and international. We are hosting the European Society of Cardiology update meeting, which is a great honor for our society, uh, gathering together very famous uh, cardiologists from all over the world, not only Europe, but USA, uh, including Eugene Gronwald, who is called the Zeus of Contemporary Cardiology. And uh, we also founded a foundation, Croatian Heart House, which works together with Croatian Cardiac Society with many public health activities in Zagreb and in the rest of Croatia. This, uh, this foundation is a member of the European Heart Network, and here you can see that we are uh, dealing with many problems and, uh, and organizing many activities that uh, raise awareness and that improve some skills in uh, our citizens, like uh, uh, basic resuscitation, and some other uh, some other important knowledges uh, everyone has to have to, to help uh, to, to to some people that need help around them. Heart Keepers, uh, e platform for education uh, about cardiovascular problems. That was the first educational e platform in Croatian medicine, still going on. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude. Croatia is still among uh, high cardiovascular risk European Union countries. Uh, primary prevention definitely should be improved. Cardiovascular mortality in Croatia is decreasing almost 10% during the last uh, years, but still cardiovascular disease are number one uh, cause of death in Croatian population. As I showed you, curative cardiology in Croatia has reached really a very high level, but secondary prevention is unsatisfactory, ununiform, and we have to focus uh, very much on these problems I uh, have to show you and I want to discuss with you. With these thoughts, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Milicic, for excellent talk. And uh, you would agree with me that uh, it's nice to be a Croat uh, when we heard about uh, uh, all those success uh, in, in the field of cardiology, in the field of diabetology, and also we have many different aspects of medicine which are very successful, and uh, I'm grateful to Professor Milicic uh, who, uh, who did a great job in the field of uh, preventing cardiovascular disease, but also the treatment of cardiovascular disease and uh, also the modern technologies. So right now we have only a two or three minutes for discussion. So if is there any uh, question or comments from the audience? Uh, yes, Professor Luxan, please, uh, can you uh, kindly ask uh, Please wait for the microphone. Thank you. For the first speaker, I have a question for Professor Lucic. Uh, uh, being expert in obesity and knowing, I assume, something about low quality, what you would say, the question is, are older politicians less trusted than people? 
are less trustworthy? Do they believe them less if they are offering it? You know, in other words, are there correlation between Bagumas index and corruption? Or in other words, parliament, they should not declare their possession. They should weigh them every year and then see if they increase the weight they have to deter them to spend taxpayer money on their weight. But please, Professor Vuxan, don't, don't uh, No, I'm not, uh, go I'm not going to talk. Don't no, talk about it. the politics, uh, especially because this is the- No, uh, politics <laughs> is all around, come on. It's uh, just a scientific, uh, a scientific conference, so we will not talk about politics. And uh, Professor Musij Milanovic. <laughs> I mean, I don't find it as a question. Uh, and they do measure them, by the way. They measure, actually, they did study, I didn't invent this question. They did study Russian or former Russian republics. And they found that the most corruptive, I cannot even pronounce, Uber Khans or whatever, Dazil's Khan, whatever, more fat, more corruption compared to some Latvia, Estonia, etc. So the answer is yes, there is a correlation between Bagus mass index and corruption. Okay, you ask it, and you give Sorry. the answer. So I, no, no, I, I know, believe that there is no answer, and no I, reason. To I was agree. asking for opinion. Yeah. Universal. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, but Professor. Uh, Dario, this, this is universal question. You ask question and answer. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with you just partially. The, we have another question. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, see. The Yes, please, the microphone is over there. Thank you, thank you Andrade Kanaga. Uh, really excellent presentations around the, 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 the problems in Croatia. So my, my question, which probably is, uh, might be a bit difficult to answer is, to what extent, so there is high consumption of salt, there is high um, prevalence of cigarette smoking. To what extent is there um, a dialogue with industry to try, for example, the salt, the sodium content um, of, of diets. Uh, we will have this evening, we will have a special special session or uh, a talk um, which will be delivered by um, Professor Bojan Ilaković, who is the president of uh, Croatian Society for Hypertension and also he is the full member of uh, our academy and he can change uh, uh, the attitude uh, regarding of uh, industry salt productions. So he will speak about salt production program. So I, I believe that he will be the right person. But uh, also Professor Musić Milanovic or also uh, uh, Professor Milicic can can give their uh, their uh, comment. But this evening we will have the, the complete session or, or the, the lecture regarding the salt production program in Croatia. And also I would like to comment at the the, uh, the uh, Eurospire uh, five just to not to be confused that Eurospire uh, Eurospire five program which uh, Professor Milicic is uh, included only people with myocardial infarction so it's completely different than population of Eurostat of uh, with Professor Musić Milanovic maybe she can comment about it. Do you have question for? because Professor Yalakovic is an expert, so he will go in details. But just briefly, we recognized our, our problem. Uh, the intake of salt is 12 grams per day, and it makes, it put us actually on the high third place just behind Hungary and Turkey. Uh, so back in 2050, uh, we made an action plan on salt reduction in Croatia. And... Uh, Professor Yalakovic, we, we started to negotiate with the food industry, started uh, with the bread industry at the first place. So, so far, I think that we reduced, I, I'm not sure about the numbers, but so far, I think that we reduced uh, quite significantly uh, the amount of salt, the proportion of salt in the bread products. Now, we need to do that with the dairy products. And I don't know if you recognize, I mean, we are really champions in um, cured meat products intake. Thank you very much. We have, uh, we have some reductions in uh, bakery products uh, up to 25%, as well as uh, uh, in a uh, few of our meat industries that reduced salt 
in their uh, meat products also for uh, 25%. So there is 25% less sold in some meat products, uh, in industrial meat products, but not in all the industry that is producing, uh, I don't know, salami, etc. But there are one there is one factory for sure, and I think another one is also joining joining this initiative. Thank you very much, Professor Milinkic, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Music, for uh, your comments. And you will uh, have opportunity to, to hear all details about the salt reduction program. But um, also after that session, I will be also proud to be a Croat. And the, the last comment or question, uh, I will allow to my co-chair, and we have to finish this session. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question or comment. Uh, um, to Professor uh, Milanovic, uh, who is uh, actually uh, has a role uh, in um, development of uh, Croatian uh, action plan against uh, obesity. So to tell us some more about it, maybe you um, can foresee what would be the major obstacles in, in its uh, implementation in the future in Croatia. How many minutes do you give me to give you an answer? Because there are going to be so many obstacles and most probably, you know, political ones at the first place. Uh, the last action plan that we uh, we had was back in 2010, 2012. And ever since we didn't have an action plan and it seems like, like that we are going to have one uh, just in a few months. I've been told in July this year that it's going to be accepted in the parliament. But we will see about that. And uh, the main issue is actually money, I would say. Because we, um, somehow there is no money in prevention part. Because it's, you know, not easy to give a result uh, when you are dealing with prevention. So it's not something that politicians like to invest in. So I assume that it might be the biggest problem. And we are all aware, you know, of uh, most probably you, you've heard about La Londe report uh, from Canada. And we are all aware that unless Minister of Finance doesn't recognize something as an economic burden, and obesity definitely is an economic burden for each country, most probably we, we won't uh, have a good result. So I'm counting on Ministry of Finance at the first place, and uh, uh, every single time I can, I, I'm asking him to think about obesity as an ec economic burden. Because if they give us some money, if we withdraw some money from the budget to prevent something, I'm quite aware that we, we won't be successful in a few years. But you know, we will be in a decade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for more uh, questions, uh, but we will have an opportunity during coffee breaks and also during uh, the next few days to, to discuss with our speakers. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for attending this session. And I would kindly ask uh, our uh, next, next um, chairpersons, Professor Kaha from Czech Republic, or better say USA, but the, I, you are from both Czech Republic and USA, and also Professor Sigan Tutor from uh, Canada. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. everyone. If you need to stretch or grab a, a glass of water, please feel free to do that. And let's continue with the next session. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Hanna Kaliova. 
I'm, an, I'm originally from Prague and Croatia is close to my heart. Uh, growing up, we used to go to Croatia each summer for, for summer holidays. And how many of you like the beautiful views and the venue? So let's give it up for Leo and the, the organizing committee. Uh, and my co-chair, John Stephen Piper, is from the University of Toronto in Canada. So it's our pleasure to introduce the next session, which will be dedicated to nuts. Nuts for glycemic control in diabetes and nuts in the reduction of risk of uh, diabetes. Um, where are we with the scientific evidence? Where are the holes that need to be filled? So that's a question for me, I guess. So John C. Murray, University of Toronto, pleasure to be here. I, we think this is a very important session. We currently have in the US an approved health claim for nuts for coronary risk reduction and cholesterol reduction. And EFSA has allowed a claim for um, vasodilation uh, dependent uh, endothelial function. Uh, but we don't have any glycemic uh, claims for nuts. And so we want to have this session to be able to explore, um, you know, where are the gaps, opportunities, and research needs. And we're thrilled that we have such a great faculty to bring this present, uh, this important topic to life for us for this session. So with that, I want to introduce our first speaker. So I can invite Hans to the podium, if you would. Um, uh, so um, our first speaker, Hans Verhagen, he's uh, formerly uh, from EFSA. So the, uh, you can read in the bios or in, in, the, uh, in the program, um, which you can find. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on the bios because you can read them, but I think it's important here. Uh, Hans brings a lot of expertise, I think almost 15 years from EFSA, both working there and also being on the committee as it relates to health claims. And so we brought him uh, all the way from the Netherlands to join us here um, in Croatia to be able to talk about that experience and, and shed some light. Hans. Okay, thank you, uh, John, for this uh, nice short introduction and inviting me to uh, the beautiful city of uh, of uh, Pula here in uh, Croatia, I enjoy very much. I'm talking science uh, today to you, and the, the title of my presentation will be on scientific substantiation of health claims in Europe, in general, and the subtitle uh, with respect to fasting and postprandial markers of blood glucose control and other de research design considerations. The content of my presentation will be distributed into three different parts. The first part on health claims in the EU, the general introduction, then zooming in on blood glucose control in particular, and of course I will end with some conclusions. We're talking about functional foods first. And food, functional foods, let's say, 25 years ago, there were a lot of claims in the European uh, seen in this slide. Foods that uh, your fat melt overnight, which must be very attractive also in light of the previous performance enhancing co constituents, superfoods like extension complex, who doesn't want these? So there were a lot of these things on the market. The European Union, realized that these may not all have been true. And after many years of debate, they issued a regulation, the 1924-2006, which came into force uh, in that year. And the regulation stipulates amongst that health claims should only be authorized for use in the European Union after a scientific assessment of the highest possible standard. And they explicitly also identified that these evaluations should be done by the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA. Okay. We take a deeper look into the regulation 1924-2006. It falls apart two different uh, entities, nutrition claims and health claims. Nutrition claims are shown to the right. It identifies what a certain food contains. Content claims, comparative claims like this uh, is low in sugar, low in fat, contains vitamin C, is a light product, sugar-free, and so on and so on. This is not the topic of today. I'm talking today about health claims. Health claims identify what a certain food or food ingredient does. And it falls apart into function claims, 
based on textbook, based on general accepted scientific data, newly developed scientific data, or disease risk reduction claims and claims on the growth and development of children. Since the regulation was introduced in 2006, Europe has seen around 4,500 individual health claims. I will not go into all, all the details, etc., but here you can see that these fall apart uh, for almost half in the area of botanicals, but also vitamins, minerals, macronutrients, foods, diets, fiber, probiotics, other substances, and so on, and so on. So Europe has seen uh, an application for around 4,500 health claims. EFSA, being the entity to do the scientific evaluation of all these four, uh, four and a half thousand health claims, identified what are the scientific criteria to really subsidize health claims. And as such, EFSA issued in 2007 a so-called scientific and technical guidance, which identifies which are the criteria. And I will identify them one by one to you. It identifies that you as an applicant should present all the pertinent scientific data, both the ones that are in favor of the health claim as well, as well as the ones that are not in favor of the health claim. This will allow the, to evaluate the totality of the scientific data and weigh the evidence. So all the data need to be presented. The characteristics of the food is required. You need to describe the identity of the food also to allow enforcement once a claim would be authorized. Human data are pivotal. If you don't have human data, you can forget about your health claim. Yesterday I saw a paper by the publication said, yeah, we found great effects in rats. And I said, oh, congratulations with the paper and congratulations for the rats. But it is not enough for humans. You use human data, you should use study groups that are representative for the target population. Of course, it seems like an open door, and it is an open door, but it's also relevant. You must show that the claimed effect is relevant for human health, and that there is a causal relationship between the consumption of the food and the health outcome in humans. And finally, last but not least, you should be able to demonstrate that the health effect can reasonably be achieved as part of a balanced diet. So now we have the health claim regulation, the system to the right in the nice figures, the different criteria, and all these different uh, criteria can be fed into a dossier to be submitted by an applicant. Okay, let's see what has happened. EFSA, being the entity evaluating the health claim dossiers, always evaluates three different steps. It evaluates, first, the extent to which the food or the constituent is defined or characterized. If it's not sufficiently defined or characterized, it can never be an approved health claim. EFSA identifies whether the claimed effect is beneficial to human health. Obvious. And of course, the, thir the third one, EFSA identifies whether or not a cause and effect relationship is established. And you must realize that you must provide all these different questions, because a negative answer in any of these three steps will stop the further process and will not allow EFSA to conclude that the health claim is scientifically substantiated. After EFSA has evaluated a health claim dossier, there's three possible outcomes. And you can already expect by showing the traffic light what will be the potential outcomes. It could be, congratulations, yes, a cause and effect relationship has been established. You did good science. Or, there is insufficient evidence for a cause and effect relationship. Or, of course, the, the third one, a cause and effect relationship has not been established. That's not exactly the same as it doesn't exist, but just the science is not there. So, this is the outcome. Uh, theoretically of a health claim dossier evaluation by the European Food Authority, which EFSA publishes in a scientific opinion and then passes on to the European Commission and the member states to take a decision on authorization. The Commission and member states draw a red line here. 
they will only authorize health claims where EFSA has concluded a cause and effect relationship has been established. If there is insufficient evidence or no evidence, uh, the health will not pass. Okay, as I said, four and a half thousand health claim dossiers has submitted uh, to the Commission and, and passed on to EFSA for its evaluation. So EFSA did a huge effort evaluating these thousands of claims. And I'm very proud of it that I've been a member of the committee doing all these evaluations in the past. EFSA found only a small amount of these health claims to be scientifically substantiated, around 250. That is not many if you submit 4,500. So only a low portion is scientifically substantiated. The large majority of health claim applications, as I was easy to conclude, not scientifically substantiated. And there's a handful where there was insufficient evidence. So they are somewhere there on the balance. And in addition to that, we are currently stuck with 1,548 health claims on botanicals that are currently on hold. Here, there is politics involved, and I don't like politics and science, but okay, here's politics involved where uh, the food supplement industry uh, put pressure on the European Commission not to ask EFSA to start the evaluation of the botanical health claims because they probably expected that EFSA would not uh, found it, find it substantiated, and then the Commission would have to say, okay, then they need to leave from the market. As long as they are in the process, which is now already for more than a decade, they can still be used with the disclaimer uh, that they're in the process. Okay, so far for politics. Some e examples of where EFSA concluded, yes, certainly scientifically substantiated. And these are the obvious ones. It's textbook knowledge, like calcium and bones, or calcium and vitamin D and bones, or fluoride and teeth. Magnesium and energy, yeah, yeah, you know all these things. So there's nothing strange here that also ESSA will conclude, yes, this is scientifically substantiated. And I see some people making pictures, etc. I can give you a scientific paper later on that gets it all. Or uh, uh, the presentation, which you can also get. Okay. There's also many, many claims that were ESSA concluded not scientifically substantiated. For instance, and of course, I'm not going to present thousands of uh, unsubstantiated health claims uh, to you, but a, an excerpt. Microorganisms. More than 100 so-called probiotics, which is an implicit health claim already, uh, EFSA considered it to be inefficiently uh, ca characterized. So if you don't know what the bug is, you cannot attach a health claim to it. There's no approved health claims for probiotics. There's no... Uh, scientific substantiation yet that they strengthen the immune system. There's only one claim on, on microorganisms, on the, and that's with, the, with respect to the digestion of lactose, of course. Botanicals, in general, very poorly characterized and very poor data. There's just no evidence uh, there. Taurine, one of these ingredients in these, uh, let's say, energy drinks, there was no relationship found with energy and performance. Glucosamine and shark cartilage and joint health, sorry, no evidence there, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the large majority of proposed health claims, EFSA concluded, not scientifically substantiated. Okay, all the outcome of what EFSA has done has been fed into what is called an EU reg register of health claims, which to date contains uh, two, a bit more than 2,300 different records. You can go to the website, find the health claim of your interest, find the ingredient of your interest, etc. It's quite easy to find. Okay. After this early introduction into health claims in the European Union, I will zoom in a little bit on the a topic that's more closer to the topic of this uh, conference here, blood glucose control. And this is a bit tedious because it literally comes down to what EFSA has exactly written in its uh, documents, etc. But I'll make an excerpt of it. What I took is the EFSA guidance on the scientific requirements for health claims related to appetite ratings, weight management, and blood glucose control. And it was published in 2012 already. It's more than 10 years ago. And in particular, 
uh, identified what the criteria could be in the area of 5.1 claims on the reduction of postprandial blood glucose responses and 5.2 claims on long-term maintenance of normal blood glucose, uh, blood glucose concentrations. Okay, that's obvious, I would say. Let's look at what EFSA particularly said with respect to the postprandial status. EFSA said... Uh, the ability to reduce the blood glucose uh, rise after consumption may be considered a beneficial physiological effect for subjects, etc., as long, and that, that's also relevant, as long as the insulin response are not disproportionately increased. The entire sentence by EFSA is much, much longer, and I invite you to read it exactly what EFSA has written there, but that does not present in this lecture. It also identified that the scientific evidence can be obtained from human intervention studies. Because I already identified this, you need to conduct human studies. So, and these human studies show, show a decrease in blood glucose concentrations at different time points and no increase in insulin concentrations in line with the previous uh, slides. <coughs> It also identified that food constituents could reduce postprandial blood glucose responses to such foods and that these foods should be sufficiently characterized and that there can also be claims for use in replacement of another food constituent. This may be a bit complicated, but it has been particularly spelled out. With respect to the study population, uh, because I, I identified already that you need to study the effects in humans that are representative for the target population, it identifies that the study population uh, could be diabetic subjects treated with lifestyle measures only, so not very severe ones. Uh, they could be used for the scientific substantiation, and you should include a rationale for the exp extrapolation, uh, and that should be then considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So it, it's quite vague, etc. but in general, pr daily practice, it means should Think of your design and make a wise decision what you do. Okay, this is for the claims on the postprandial blood glucose concentrations. With respect to claims on long-term maintenance of normal blood glucose concentrations, EFSA concluded that maintenance of normal blood glucose, blood glucose is considered a beneficial physiological effect. Okay, hooray. There we are. Not surprising. EFSA also concluded... What type of evidence is really there? The real evidence can come from human intervention studies impro showing improved uh, blood glucose control uh, as per, uh, let's say, changes in gly glycated um, hemoglobin at least the duration of uh, 12 weeks, etc. This, this is the strong evidence that you need to provide. Supportive evidence only comes from blood plasma glucose after a standard uh, OGT test or glucosamine concentrations and support for the mechanism, so not real evidence, but support for the mechanism, are changes in insulin sensitivity and a few others. You, you know these better than I am, especially when you're physicians, which I am not. Okay. I already identified that with respect to the study population, the same slide as before. This study population can be used for, let's say, the postprandial blood glucose response as well as the long-term blood glucose uh, concentrations. So. I also looked for, you, for the purpose of this presentation into the EU Register of Health Claims, which I identified a couple of slides ago to you, and I looked for the hits on blood glucose. 56 hits are there. You can easily find it. Do it yourself. Link is in the slide, etc. Ask me and I will send it to, to you. So 56 matching records, but not all authorized. Only 11 of the 56 proposed health claims were concluded by EFSA to be sufficiently scientific supported and then authorized by the Commission and the member states. And I'll give you these 11 in a very short overview. It's on and this will not surprise you, of course, but it's on non-digestible carbohydrates, alpha cyclodextrin, arabinoxylan, beta-glucans, chromium fructose, hydroxypropyl methylcellulose, okay, there were go all these fibers again, pectins, resistant starch, slowly digestible starch, uh, all these starches, uh, fibers, etc. as well as 
sugar replacers, intense sweeteners, uh, xylitol, and so on and so on. All these uh, were, were having an effect, an, a tangible effect on blood glucose concentration. I will only identify one example, which is relatively short, where the commission said, okay, this is the wording that the industry, uh, the producers can use, such as consumption of alpha-cyclodextrin as part of a starch-containing meal contributes to the reduction of the blood glucose rise after that meal. Okay, after all um, these sequences, uh, health claims, blood glucose, etc., this is what, en what ended. Okay, I'm nearing the end of my presentation, still one minute uh, to go. Two slides on con conclusions. Let's, what did we learn from all what has happened in the health claim arena in the EU? That good science is pivotal. The approach by EFSA has been applauded by so many, and um, I'm very proud of it to have been part of that. The rejection for your health claim proposal can be either via insufficient characterization, not being a beneficial effect on human health, or the absence of demonstration of a cause and effect relationship. Another lesson is there are no magic recipes. There are not golden bullets. You as an applicant must provide a scientific rationale. There's not a prefix number of studies, and please put your energy in science and not in marketing or complaining. The last slide is read a lot. You can read commission guidances, existing EFSA opinions, general EFSA guidances, specific guidance documents, and start thinking. And at this stage, I would say thank you for your attention. One second over time, and I'm happy to answer questions later on. And this is my presentation, which you can also get. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Cyril Kendall from Canada. Uh, the uh, Q&A session, I should say, will be at the end of the session in the panel discussion. And Cyril, as our chairperson of Diabetes and Nutrition Study Group, will give us the official <laughs> recommendations for the nut consumption. He will review the current evidence for nut consumption uh, and for control of fasting and postprandial blood glucose, current evidence and research needs. Cyril, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Hannah, for, uh, for the introduction. Um, I would like to thank Dario and the local organizing committee for doing such a great job in pulling this all together. Um, and if I could get my slides up, it would be possibly a more interesting and accurate talk. Uh, we're already running a little bit behind you, so I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can. As soon as we're ready, there we go. My name. That uh, my disclosures. Uh, I've got many. The ones in red are the most important for this discussion. Uh, we know that diabetes is a serious issue, and it's increasing. And what I'm uh, most by by this slide is in the last 20 years how the prevalence rates have really dramatically increased in the developing world. We see extremely high rates in Latin America, South America, parts of Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and East Asia. And we know it's an increasing problem. Um, high rates continuing to increase. By the year 2045, it's estimated that a quarter of all, all adults in the world will have diabetes. So not only is it an uh, increasing uh, problem in terms of prevalence, we know that diabetes causes microvascular, um, microvascular and macrovascular diseases, increases mortality or morbidity. So it's, it's a major issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, what can diets do to help prevent and, and manage it? And specifically, what can nuts do? We know that nuts are part of the traditional diet, they're part of the plant-based diet, Latin American diet, the Mediterranean diet. And we know that these uh, diets are associated, these dietary patterns are associated with decreased prevalence of diabetes. 
nuts and glycemic control. Nuts are low in carbohydrate. They can be helped help to reduce the carbohydrate content of the diet. They're high in healthy fats, high in vegetable protein, high in fiber. All of these have independently been shown to help decrease blood glucose uh, responses. We've undertaken a series of acute studies in this uh, uh, case, we looked at cons uh, pistachio consumption. If you look at the top graph, the, uh, the black line is what happens to blood glucose after you feed white bread, it rises rapidly and goes back down to baseline after about two hours. But if you feed one, two, or three ounces of pistachios by themselves, there's almost no rise in blood glucose. Uh, the bottom graph is looking at the area under the curve. Again, white bread, if it's 100%, 100%, uh, the uh, area under the curve for the pistachio, one, two, and three ounces, is extremely low, around 10 to 15% of that for the white bread. And what's perhaps more interesting is if you feed pistachios with white bread. So this is the white bread by itself, the black line, and if you feed one, two, and three grand, or, um, ounces of pistachios, you get a nice reduction in the postprandial response curve and in the area under the curve. And at two ounces, you get a significant reduction in the area under the curve. So we've now looked at how feeding that effective dose of pistachios, uh, we see it reduces the postprandial response curve to white bread. We've also looked at other common carbohydrate foods, potatoes, pasta, and rice. And in every case, you see a reduction in the area under the curve. And so with bread and pistachios, you get about a 33% reduction. Potatoes, about a 22% reduction. Pasta, 38% reduction. And rice, about a 14% reduction. Now we've done these acute studies uh, with a number of different pistachios, almonds, mixed nuts, and in different subject groups, healthy type two diabetic individuals with the metabolic syndrome. And we see the same uh, sort of response, reduction in postprandial glycemia with nut consumption. And this just summarizes some of the other uh, information. We see lower insulin levels as well as lower blood glucose response curves. We also see an, an increase in GLP-1 as well. Um, Frank, who in his Harvard group has done a uh, cohort study, through it with his cohort study, he looked at the consumption of nuts and found that frequent nut consumption was associated with a 27% reduction in the chance of developing type 2 diabetes. And there's other benefits as well. This is uh, Penny Chris Etherton's group from Penn State did a meta-analysis of, of cohort studies. This is about 20 years ago. Others have been done since. And again, frequent nut consumption was associated with an 18 to 51% reduction in coronary heart disease risk. We've undertaken a intervention study uh, with mixed nuts in, in type two diabetic subjects. We fed them either a healthy control muffin, it was a whole wheat muffin, a half dose of the muffin and a half dose of the mixed nuts, so about 37 grams, or the full dose of mixed nuts, about 75 grams per day. Uh, and we saw nice reductions in hemoglobin A1C in this diabetic population after three weeks. So not only did we see significant reductions in hemoglobin A1C, we also saw nice improvements in blood lipids with reductions in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Um, we've also, our group has undertaken some uh, meta-analysis studies looking at the effect of peanuts on cardiometabolic risk. This has been headed by John Siebenpiper and his group. Uh, I'll show you the data, just some of the data from just the metabolic syndrome and glycemic control meta-analyses. So the effect of tree nuts on metabolic syndrome criteria was headed by uh, Sonia. Uh, we, we looked at waist circumference, triglycerides, HDL, blood pressure, and fasting blood glucose as the main outcome measures. I'll just show you the significant results. 
we saw a significant effect of tree nuts in reducing triglycerides, and we saw a significant effect of tree nuts in reducing fasting blood glucose. The next uh, meta-analysis was the effect of tree nuts on glycemic control in diabetes. This was headed by EFI, uh, and we looked at hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, and HOMA IR. Again, I'll just show you the significant results. So we're associated with a significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C. We also saw a significant reduction in fasting blood glucose. Um, and so from there, that, that study was uh, published in 2014. Um, let's look at some of the more recent data that has been published. Effect of nuts on glucose control and diabetes management, recent clinical trial evidence. Um, Penny Chris Etherton's group did a nice meta analysis published in the JCN in 2019. Um, there were some differences from our um, meta analysis. It included studies up to 2018, included studies with non diabetic subjects. Um, there were actually more studies in type 2 diabetes. 13 compared to 11. It included uh, studies that used nut oils, and it included studies that used peanuts as well. It ex also excluded studies that were not in English. Uh, nuts and fasting glucose. In their meta-analysis, there was no effect of nuts on fasting glucose. Subgroup analysis showed nut type uh, a, to, to significantly reduce fasting glucose with pistachios. Again, this always depends on the number of studies using pistachios. Um, there is no effect of nuts on hemoglobin 1C in this meta-analysis. Nuts were found to significantly lower fasting glucose. Subgroup analysis showed a significant reduction in fasting insulin in pre-diabetes, but not in healthy subjects or those in type 2 diabetes. Nuts lowered hemoglobin or uh, HOMA IR. Subgroup analysis showed a significant reduction in HOMA IR in prediabetes, but again, not in healthy subjects or those with type 2 diabetes. In looking at nuts insulin production and beta cell function, some studies have shown an improvement, others have not shown, so the results really have been quite mixed. And nuts and insulin sensitivity, uh, no significant effect have been observed. Uh, nuts and glycemic control in overweight and obese subjects, this is another study. Uh, significant improvements uh, were observed in uh, glucose and insulin in this study. A study was conducted on almonds and glycemic control in overweight and obese subjects. There was no improvement in glucose or insulin, no improvement in insulin sensitivity, but there were significant reductions in triglycerides and systolic blood pressure. The study looked at peanuts and glycemic control in overweight and obese subjects. Peanut consumption significantly reduced blood pressure, but there was no effect on measures of glycemic control. And what is the effect of nuts on diabetes management? Uh, some more recent evidence. A study looking at cashews and glycemic control in type 2 diabetes found no significant effect in terms of blood glucose, insulin, or, or HOMA IR. A study of almond based on a low carbohydrate diet found that uh, almond significantly uh, reduced hemoglobin A1C compared to the low fat diet. A study was conducted on pecans and, gly and glycemic control in uh, CAD patients. Uh, there was no significant effect in terms of glycemic control, fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, fasting insulin, or HOMA, or HOMA IR. So where are we going? We've got a real sort of mixed bag of results. 
Some studies show quite a significant uh, effect and improvement. Others are showing no effect. Um, I think so, overall, I would say the current evidence from the systematic uh, meta-analyses and the RCT suggests that nut consumption may improve glycemic control uh, in individuals with diabetes. However, the effect still needs to be confirmed by studying individuals with diabetes and without diabetes separately, and we, without mixing interventions of whole nuts with nut oils. There seem to be different effects there. The dose, the amount of nuts consumed, the duration of the intervention, and the choice of control are extremely important in terms of study design. These have to be looked at carefully and in, and in, in, in the way we interpret results. So what's the future direction? Where should we be going? It'd be nice to test the effect of nut consumption replacing carbohydrate on insulin sensitivity using clamps. To better understand the mechanisms, um, we should be looking at gut hormones, MRA, mRNAs, uh, gut um, microbiota modulation and function. And we should be exploring uh, associations with other databases that are out there and available. Uh, and I think the one thing that we would really like to get going, and we've discussed this among some of the members of this group, is to plan a new large multi-center diabetes prevention clinical trial. I think if we design a really good trial, it's large enough, it's in the target population, I think we can um, derive a lot of uh, certainty uh, in terms of nuts, diabetes prevention, glycemic control. So I will end it there. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank the uh, Clinical Nutrition Risk Factor Modification Center group, the Toronto 3D uh, Center at St. Michael's Hospital, David Jenkins, John, uh, Effie, Steph, and Jordy for your help with all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril, for an excellent talk. So we'll now move, and you've saved us a bit of time, so we'll thank you for that too. Uh, we uh, will now move to the next uh, talk from another member of the board, uh, Jordi, Jordi Salasalvado. Uh, I don't think he needs any introduction. He's a distinguished professor of, of both uh, medicine and nutrition, and he's going to talk to us about nuts for diabetes prevention, uh, current evidence, and research needs. Jordi. Thank you, John, for your nice introduction. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this uh, symposium. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here with a lot of friends and uh, here in this beautiful country. So um, the title of my presentation is Nuts uh, for the Diabetes Prevention. But I think that is in the context of talking about a potential health plan for uh, in in uh, for the in, in the context of European countries, so for the first speaker has defined it very well that we need to def for, for defining the the health claim and the substantiation of the health claim we need to answer three questions. So one is is the food constituent sufficiently defined or characterized, and this is one of the problems because one thing is nuts. Another thing is one type of nuts, such as ones that has to get a, cla a claim. The second is, is the climate, uh, climate effect sufficiently defined and it is has beneficial uh, physiological effect. So we can talk about using blood glucose. We can talk about, and also we can talk about prevention of disease, in this case, prevention of diabetes. In, in order to substantiate the health claim, we need a high level evidence in order to substantiate this claim. And this is not clear now for health nuts, for, for a tree nuts, sorry. So uh, we have this guidance that has been established several years ago by the EPSA that has uh, been explained by the first speaker. And the potential and knowledge health claimant effects that this guidance uh, 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 has defined are for 
reduced postprandial glycemic response to maintenance the normal glucose concentration or diabetes control, but not diabetes prevention. Uh, we have several claims in relation to reduction of blood, blood glucose, and here you have the first one that has been established, that is for beta glucan from OEDS, and, and now we have these 11 health claims that the first speaker have uh, defined us, but all of these are for reduction of postprandial glycemic response. At that moment, uh, uh, no health claim has uh, been established for the prevention of diabetes or for the control of diabetes. So I imagine you that it's very difficult, especially in order to get a health claim for a food. So, um, but we need evidence. And we have, if we will have enough evidence, probably we can get a health claim. Um, for this, we need mechanistic supporting studies in relation to postprandial glucose response to insulin resistant diabetes control. And some of these studies have been uh, by uh, Dr. Stephen Jenkins. And for observational studies, and we need also clinical trials. In relation to observational studies, here you have, uh, this is the result of a meeting that we have uh, had uh, this year in, in, in my city. Uh, we had uh, investigators in relation to NADS, and here you have the level of evidence in relation to epidemiological evidence, a very few studies. Uh, have been conducted in order to the association between some markers of diabetes or um, uh, glucose metabolism and uh, and, uh, and the, 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 pre the, the prevention of diabetes, as you can see here. Uh, we have uh, five meta-analyses that have been published until now in relation to the prevention of diabetes using NADS. As you can see, uh, only the first one has established an inverse association between the frequency of NAD consumption and uh, uh, diabetes prevention. But the rest of meta-analysis that have been published until now, they do not have observed this beneficial effect. For this, as you know, it has been presented here uh, two years ago, this uh, that we have conducted because we have observed different limitations to produce a meta-analysis that have been conducted until now, because uh, most of the systematic analysis combined uh, nuts with other foods such as peas or legumes, etc., as exposure. Uh, some systematic reviews and meta-analysis studies using total nuts as exposure with other uh, analyzing only only some specific types of nuts and other limitations that it is not possible to present in clinic. So it's for this that we have started a new meta-analysis uh, that has been conducted by Nerea Becerra in collaboration with a group of doctors uh, in order to analyze all the literature until now in relation to analyze the exposures of Total nuts, tree nuts, walnuts, peanuts, and peanut butter. These are only the exposures that we can, uh, that we have analyzed it because no data we uh, in the literature we have observed at that time. So in relation to cross-sectional analysis, here you can see we do not have observed any association between total nut consumption and diabetes response. In relation to tree nut consumption and diabetes prevalence, also association. In case of prospective studies, no association between total nut consumption and diabetes incidence. No association between peanut consumption and diabetes incidence. And only we have seen a marginal uh, association between peanut butter consumption and diabetes incidence, but only using two studies, as you can see in this slide, and hide heterogeneity between both studies. 
and we have also conducted a linear and non-linear dose response relationship and there was no evidence of linear dose response and non-linear res dose response gradient for total NAD uh, and PNAD consumption in this prospective cohort studies. And here we have the, the, the results. So we have uh, concluded that current results do not demonstrate an association of NAD of total NAD, PNAD, or CNAD consumption with diabetes uh, prevention. And PNAD better consumption may be associated with this disease. After this meta analysis, two other studies have been published, two cross-sectional studies, not more prospective studies, one in Italy and another one in Spain, and no association also have been observed in these two studies. Also, we have indirect data in relation to the substitution of nuts for other food, in this case, red meat or uh, uh, processed red meat. And as you see, the substitution of nuts for red meat is associated with a lower risk in this study. And also, in this other study that has been done in the cohorts of Harvard, But what are the limitations of, of all of these studies, prospective and cross-sectional studies? First, the reverse caution, but one of the most important, most, and, and some, at least in some uh, prospective and cross-sectional studies, it has been adjusted by body weight. And body weight probably is one of the medias of, uh, in the pathway between the uh, uh, food consumption, in this case, the consumption of nuts and the risk of diabetes, because you know, body weight is an important factor. So um, we can conclude that we need more prospective, well-conducted studies, uh, reanalyzing these studies that have been published in the literature and uh, in other cohorts. And also, uh, it will be very interesting to conduct substitution analysis in the future, uh, but testing the replacement not in the meat, but by, 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 by nuts, because uh, it's just a replacement of meat, but probably uh, a replacement of snacks, because usually, uh, in some countries, uh, Nuts are eaten as snacks, rich in carbohydrate or fat-rich food. So, and what happened with clinical trials? So, here you have a resume of acute clinical trial evidence and long-term trial evidence of mechanistic studies that support the potential events. Um, uh, this is a resume. Uh, you have a lot of evidence in, the, in, the, in a column. And as you can see, uh, in participants with pre of diabetes in acute clinical trials or in participants with diabetes, we have very few uh, 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 the, the level of evidence is uh, not enough. Uh, we have a high level of evidence for glycemia, but when substituting uh, carbohydrates, and in, the, in case of long-term uh, clinical trials, we have also low evidence in the beneficial effects uh, on, on uh, insulin resistance, on, uh, on fasting glucose or fasting insulin, and also in relation to insulin resistance measured by indirect measurements. Uh, one of the, I think, more, most interesting studies that we have conducted in, uh, in our uh, in, in our group is this uh, epiderm study that we have published several years ago in diabetes care. It's a cross-sectional study, but uh, this uh, uh, study has been conducted using uh, 57 grams per day of, of pistachios for added to the diet. And uh, we have compared this with the control diet. And this is an interesting study in relation to insulin resistance because we have explored several mechanisms, potential mechanisms explaining this phenomenon. And we have observed, uh, it's not possible to, to, 
I suppose that you can see, we have observed that uh, the consumption of nuts is, uh, was related to, uh, it has an effect on insulin resistance, is measured by HOMA index, but also we have analyzed uh, the, the, the effect of this nut consumption on different protein expression, especially we have observed a, a increase in the cellular glucose uptake, but also the reduction of the expression of GUT4 and IL-6 and resisting in lymphocytes, but also we have observed at peripheral level beneficial effects on reduced inflammatory and oxidative status, and also in another paper we have published the results in relation to some microRNAs that are related to insulin resistance and also the uh, two type 2 diabetes. So this is a proof that, that the beneficial long-term effects of nuts on uh, on insulin resistance and the mechanisms that can explain these beneficial effects. In relation to clinical trials, what do we have direct evidence? One of the, these indirect evidence come from uh, the PREDIMED trial that you know, all you know, that is a randomized uh, clinical trial, a multi-center randomized clinical trial that has been conducted in individuals with high cardiovascular risk free of cardiovascular risk and baseline that we have randomized in two Mediterranean-rich uh, extra-virgin olive oil or a mixture of nuts. We have compared these to the recommendations several years ago of the American Health Association for, for a low-fat diet for avoiding uh, virgin olive oil or oil and nuts. And in our center, in in red every year at baseline and every year uh, glucose tolerance test and we have observed a 50 percent reduction in the incidence of uh, type 2 diabetes in both uh, randomized in, in both groups random in those randomized groups to the mediterranean diet either with uh, virgin olive oil or nuts two years after we have conducted an analysis in all the population uh, using uh, diabetes as an endpoint, and we have observed a 40% reduction in the incidence of diabetes in those individuals uh, randomized to the Mediterranean diet in which it with virgin olive oil, but a non-significant 18% lower risk of diabetes in those that have been supplemented with nuts. Uh, it, this is an interesting study that has been conducted by Martha Guask, uh, um, Harvard University, in collaboration with the, the PREDIMED consortium. Uh, and uh, this is uh, another approach demonstrating that nuts could have beneficial effects on diabetes prevention. It's a metabolomic analysis, a case cohort study that we uh, have conducted, and we have measured the different uh, metabolites, and uh, we have observed, uh, Marta has observed, a metabolite profile including 19 metabolites that uh, uh, are related to a, a lower risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So uh, I think that metabolomic analysis or other omics analysis in the future could be very interesting in order to demonstrate the potential benefits of the relationship between the food and uh, the risk of disease. So, in order to conclude, although several acute and chronic clinical trials have demonstrated that that consumption reduces carbohydrates and insulin resistance, Observational the beneficial effects at that moment on nut consumption in diabetes prevention, and no clinical trial has demonstrated regular nut consumption is good for diabetes prevention. But I think that we need more studies because we have several data that uh, uh, probably uh, give uh, evidence would be beneficial could have beneficial effects on diabetes control or diabetes. What are the future direction? <laughs> this is uh, the, 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 the slide that we have summarized in this meeting that we have had uh, some month ago in, in, in my city. 
uh, and here we, we, are, we, we summarize. One is to test the effect of natural consumption, replacing carbohydrates on insulin, sensu insulin sensitivity using labs. This is, could be very interesting in order to have important data on insulin sensitivity. So to better understand the mechanism involved in increasing the insulin sensitivity, so uh, some of these uh, studies have been also uh, summarized by, by, by uh, Dr. Sylvie Kendrell. Also, it is necessary to analyze the potential benefits of gut microbiota on these beneficial effects on insulin resistance. We have some papers that have been published in the, in the last uh, years uh, to explore possible role of NADS in diabetes prevention and, complica and complications on other prospective goals. A uh, good approach in order to do this analysis, uh, reanalyzing some, some uh, cohorts that have to do with results but, uh, that have some limitations, and also to reanalyze this in to analyze this in other cohorts that have never been analyzed. So not only in Europe and, and United States, but also in China or in India or in other uh, parts of the world. To plan a multi-center new diabetes prevention clinical trials is mandatory in order to have good data, uh, high level of evidence of the potential benefits of not consumption and diabetes, and diabetes prevention. And also, I think that um, it, it will be interesting for the future to explore metabolomic uh, uh, signatures of not consumption in clinical trials and to test uh, its uh, relationship with insulin resistance or to test its uh, relationship with diabetes prevention. So. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, here we have my institutions, uh, the human nutrition that I am leading, and the principal preliminary class investigators here. And I would like to acknowledge the collaboration that we have with uh, several European cohorts, but especially uh, uh, with uh, Harvard, with uh, Dr. Frank Yu and uh, his team, and the Broad Institute in order to do analysis related to omics during the last years and all the funding that we have had in order to do all the research in our unit. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jordi. And I'd like to invite our next speaker, Joan Sabate from Loma Linda, California, who became famous for his research on the health benefits of nuts. And his topic is lessons learned from the FDA approval of a health claim for nuts and coronary heart disease uh, risk reduction. Please, over to you. Well, thank you uh, for the generous invitation that I have to come here and present something that I never did. So when I got the title that I think is very, 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 very long, uh, I thought, wow, what? I should talk about because I don't have any slides prepared on that. I never had a talk on lessons learned from the Food and Drug Administration approval of a health claim for nuts and heart disease risk in the US. So I already spent half of my time, I mean, just reading the, the title. Anyway, uh, what I did was basically a retrospective study. Uh, using my memory, which I'm getting old and I don't know if my memory is uh, good enough, but that's what I did. And uh, basically what I'm trying to summarize in the time allowed is uh, three questions related to the health claims on not in the what, what is a health claim, uh, the other one is the why, matter of introduction, and then I'm going to spend most of the time on the how. I mean, how the health claim uh, on cardiovascular disease was gathered and was submitted, so on and so forth. So this is the outline of the presentation, and I'm going to start with the definitions. And I appreciate the first session on uh, this session that really addressed the health claims in Europe. So what is a health claim, and what types of health claims there are? At least the, the 
uh, Food and Drug Administration has three types of health claims. One is a health claim per se, another one is the structure and function, and the other one is nutrient content. The first one is a food with health outcomes. And this is the purpose of my presentation. However, the other ones have uh, other objects or, or outcomes. One is the role of a nutrient or ingredient in, in a food uh, on the structure or function of the human body. And this we have an example. I mean, eating whatever chirions gives uh, strong bonds. I mean, that could be. This. And the nutrient uh, content claims is probably the, the more common, uh, says what is the level of a nutrient typically in a product that could be modified, because not the nutrients cannot be modified the, the way they are. Uh, and as typically is that is free of cholesterol or high in calcium or low in whatever. So this is the nutrients claims. So <clears throat> as far as health claims in particular, there are two types on the FDA. One is the authorized health claims, and the others are the qualified health claims. What is an authorized health for which there is significant uh, scientific evidence? On a qualified health claim is the one that has supported evidence but does not achieve the significant scientific agreement standard. And only a specific wording is allowed. So, what are the health claims in the US as far as related? So, although there are hundreds of proposals or submitted health claims, there are a little bit more than 20 that has been authorized health claims. And then <clears throat> this just got the seal of approval. As far as a qualified health claims, that this is for nuts, and there are over 30, a letter of enforcement. And not and cardiovascular disease fall into this category. So, as far as not health claims, so far there are three. The one that was approved 20 years ago, that is on knots, generic for knots or specific for some knots. And then there was a specific on walnuts in 2004. And I'm going to speak about these two health claims because are the ones that I was involved, directly and indirectly. And a few years ago, a specific one on macadamia nuts. Okay, so why a health claim? What are the advantage of a health claim? Uh, purported or with scientific evidence? Well, for the industry, or for the nut uh, growers, the advantage is that theoretically they will increase the demand of the product. So it helps in the marketing, in the perceived health benefits, in the competitive advantage, could one not against the other, that's why they have one specific for walnuts or one specific of macadamia, and uh, on the consumer education and trust. In general, beyond, you know, what are the things that uh, are perceived uh, that health claims bring to the table? So it has been proposed that has consumer guidance, consume, increases awareness, uh, promoting of a particular uh, eating pattern, uh, disease prevention or management of the disease, and improve the production quality by the industry. This doesn't apply of nuts. This applies to manufactured products. But what empirical evidence do we have as far as these potential benefits? Uh, just last year, uh, it was published a paper that was conducted in Denmark about uh, a survey of uh, 1,500 uh, participants, it was online. And basically, these are the conclusions uh, by the researchers. The influence of a health claim depends on the product and also depends on the consumer characteristics. Second is that 
the products with claims are associated with increased perceptions of healthiness and health interests. And the fact that is quite important is that the personal knowledge of nutrition inversely is related to choosing the products for which there is a health claim. The more the consumer knows about nutrition, the less influence it is about the health claim. And if the consumer doesn't know much about nutrition, I mean, the health claim, I mean, is more effective in choosing, uh, you know, the foods to consume. What also empirical evidence do we have? Uh, in a systematic review of four years ago or five years ago, uh, it's when we submit the health claim wording under experimental conditions with a control and, and, and the intervention we do, uh, the health claims have a on the dietary choices. However, again, the type of food also is important. And we have that types of foods as nature created them, such as beans and pulses and nuts and fish and fruits and vegetables, with a health claim have a more effective that, you know, man-made foods in which they are high in fat or in sugar. So if a manufactured product has a health claim, it's not as effective if a natural food has a health claim. And however, in the natural setting, the effect of a health claim is not as effective as in experimental conditions. And now goes to the substance of my presentation, that is uh, how the health claim on nuts and cardiovascular disease uh, was conducted uh, in the US as a guiding principle for submitting a health claim on uh, sugar control and diabetes. So a brief history here. The idea was initiated after a meeting of uh, nutrition researchers uh, with the uh, NOT boards, in which the evidence was reviewed in the year 2000. At the end of the meeting, Barbara Schneeman, at that time professor of nutrition at UC Davis, stated, referring to the NOT industry, you have more scientific evidence for the health claim benefits of nuts than was available for soy and oats, for which the FDA had already approved a health claim. So that was the detonance, the incentive for the uh, not boards to file, or the, the site to file a petition on the FDA, as far as not and health claim. The evidence, what was the evidence available in the year to that started? There were already there theological studies connecting nuts with a low risk of cardiovascular disease and a few uh, randomized clinical trials uh, on nuts and uh, CBD risk factors. I was the initiator of those uh, when I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, funded by the American Heart Association in 1988 to 1990, uh, uh, been my mentor. And in this, uh, during this time, we made a discovery. Never before was that uh, even thought of uh, with the Adventist Health Study, and that was not the hypothesis of, of the Adventist Health Study. I mean, this was really, I would say, discovery because it was not planned. And uh, not lower the risk of heart disease. And finally, after much trying to get published, because it was very uh, novel, and as you will see later, nuts have two meanings, uh, it was difficult to publish, but finally was published in 1992. And what was this study saying? That those consuming nuts on a regular basis had roughly half the risk of cardiovascular disease for two uh, outcomes, acute myocardial infarction or death of uh, heart disease. So, and that became uh, from a discovery at Loma Linda University to nutritional policy. And here is basically some of you, like me, uh, 
English is not our first language, and I quickly discovered that knots have two meanings. I mean, not only the foot, but also being a half crazy. So here we have, I mean, uh, poor this uh, little animal had to go to psychiatry when he made, she made this discovery. And in, New, uh, in the New England in 1993, uh, Australian fan of everybody, I mean, uh, made this, uh, whatever, uh, comic that says here is a French restaurant that, as you know, they use uh, butter and other uh, good things, quotes and quotes, that the owner basically now, I mean, knowing that nuts is going to be fashionable, will become fashionable, says we now serve nuts to attract what? Anyway, let's go to a serious business now. What was the evolution from the discovery? So the first thing that we needed to do is to validate the, this data. And yes, we did sensitivity analysis and we did uh, subgroup analysis with the Adventist Health Study. But uh, we were very pleased when six years later, Frank Hu, that I have the pleasure to be here, uh, published uh, that with data with the similar results to the Adventist Health Study, with very similar um, classification of the uh, exposure, uh, same, uh, <coughs> the same uh, outcomes. And there was uh, basically a steady negative or inverse relationship between the frequency of not consumption and these two outcomes for cardiac disease. Other studies follow up, uh, the Iowa Women's Health Study, and after the claim, uh, the Physicians Health Study. And later, it has been other studies done in Europe. As you know, to prove or at least go in favor of causation, you have biological mechanism. So I devoted part of my life to do specific knots in randomized clinical trials as far as risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The first one was published in 93 uh, with uh, blood pressure and also serum lipids. Later, a dose response relationship uh, with almonds, but many others. But other um, researchers follow suit on that, and here we have. I mean, uh, Penny Chris Etherton, uh, the group of uh, uh, David Jacobs and Cyril Kendall, I mean, also uh, published. So, but was what was available, not much else, I mean, as far as, uh, as provided evidence for the health claim then. Dissemination uh, in scientific uh, circles, but also in media. And finally, the policy. In 2003, when the health claim was done, we had to do expert witness to the FDA. And also, uh, the policy as far as dietary guidelines, uh, and changes in the American Heart Association. The ones that sponsored me in the Adventist Health Study were saying in the cookbook that do not recommend nuts because they are high in fat. But in 2004, uh, a few years later, they changed uh, now uh, in the cookbook in the American Heart Association, and now they recommend uh, to recommend the physicians uh, to recommend nuts uh, because they are good as far as the prevention of cardiovascular disease. So how, specifically for uh, the brief history of the health claims. And here we have three things. One is filing a petition. The petition uh, was prepared in 2002 by two consultants hired by the NOT boards, and they gathered all the documents. I was able, just uh, a few weeks ago, to get copy of the table of contents of the uh, 100 plus pages that were prepared and submitted, I mean, to the uh, FDA. Uh, in 2003, I went to Washington and presented as an expert uh, witness or scientific testimony um, regarding uh, the research that was at that time available on the health claim. And I think quite important uh, is um, the study that was done by Turner et al. in 2003 while the health 
claim was being filed, but not yet. And the purpose of this was to see what language is more uh, to be conveyed for the public. And in this study that was published in the negotiation of the health claim, uh, it tested four variations of health claim wording. And it shows that uh, it was more effective, one of the three, compared with the generic claim of the FDA. And the conclusion is that it is possible to meet the FDA standards, but being uh, more effective and being more friendly as far as the language. And here, out of the three tested, third one uh, is evidence suggests show that was more effective than the one that the FDA standard that is in, uh, uh, is, although there is scientific evidence supporting the claim, the evidence is not conclusive. So after showing this evidence, FDA agreed, I mean, to use the wording that was not the standard, uh, that was um, scientifically validated. So the health claim on NOTS says scientific evidence suggests but does not prove that eating one and a half ounces per day of most nuts, and here you have to replace whatever, almonds or, or, or whatever is the nut, as part of the diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. So, so what are the trends or what were the trends as far as consumption and production in the US? Here we have the graphics for about 20 years. In blue is almonds, and then uh, this is, uh, represents almonds, and on the other uh, notch, it, each one is independent, is, is, is to present. This is as far as the production. As you can see, the production had increased dramatically. What is the per capita consumption in the US? Because most of the notch produced in the US are also exported all over the world. So this is the per capita consumption in the US. And as you can see, is increasing steadily uh, at different levels, but it is overall increasing. Uh, so finally, I have one minute, and I think I'm going to make it in, in time. Uh, lessons learned, just three lessons that two of them coincide with the first speaker of the European Union. One is the scientific evidence. Scientific evidence that needs to be gathered. I mean, it varies from uh, place to place and also over the years. Second is the friendly language. And finally, health claims is not the panacea. Scientific evidence. Gathering the scientific evidence is very important. For three reasons. We have to check all the requirements by the relevant agency carefully. They do vary. Um, it was said that the European uh, not a specific uh, rules, is a general rule, but in the US there are very specific rules. Second, you have to gather all the scientific relevance uh, uh, and the evidence, and finally ensure that the soundness of the evidence uh, before submission claim will not be denied or revoked in the future. It's interesting, and I don't know if you pay attention, that the soy protein health claim that was approved in the 90s in 2017 was reviewed by the FDA. So the evidence for the soy claim uh, as far as cholesterol uh, found and further evidence made to be revoked. The health claim of nuts 20 years ago has not been revoked. Second, develop a consumer-friendly language. And I have, as I have presented, it is possible, at least in the US, I mean, to help uh, the Food and Drug Administration to see uh, evidence. So uh, the health claims are effective only if they are clearly understood by the consumer. And my recommendation or the lesson learned is do research on the effectiveness of the health claim. Uh, wording before authorization. And finally, the health claim is not the panacea. It helps in many areas, but 
we don't have to depend only on the fears that also help to convey the information, uh, the importance of the food, in that case, the nuts, uh, in the prevention, not on cardiovascular disease, but on diabetes and glucose control. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Joanne, for that wonderful talk. I'll make one correction, though. The FDA proposed to revoke the health claim for soy, but it, they've still they've been extending the period to, for the final rules. The final rule still hasn't been issued, and they've left open the door for a qualified health claim, but nuts have st stood the test of time, certainly. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll introduce our next uh, speaker. So uh, all the way from India, we're very, very pleased to be able to have Professor Noob Misra. Uh, he is a professor of, of medicine. Uh, he's also the uh, chairman of the Fortis um, Diabetes Center in the hospital. And he's the president of the Diabetes Foundation of India. Um, so I'm sure you'll have a lot to talk about of the Croatian Diabetes Foundation here, Dario, um, later on in our social program. But uh, it's wonderful to have you to share some new data uh, on this topic, premial load of almonds in people with prediabetes, familiaration of glycemia and remission. Professor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me here uh, and enabling my travel. Uh, John, Dario, and Elena from Almond Board of California, they're all here. I thank them. Uh, it's a beautiful country. It's a pleasure to talk in front of experts. Um, this is my disclosure. Uh, my sensitive team, Dr. Seema Glotti, my colleagues who worked on several of the trials last 10 years, and to all the patients who participated in it. Now we know that Indians have lots of diabetes, and our recent data show 100 million Indians have diabetes at the moment. But what is more important to see in this particular graph is that diabetes occurs a decade earlier in Indian population as compared to the white population. Also, the conversion of the, uh, from normal glucose tolerance to impaired glucose tolerance to diabetes, and you can see 12 to 18 times a percent roughly per year versus 5 to 11 percent in the white population. And if we apply the same diet and exercise in Indian population versus the white population, the reversion to the normal glucose tolerance is much less. And you can see 30 percent only versus 50 percent in the white population. And if we have to focus on one thing, we should focus on normal glucose tolerance with high risk for developing pre-diabetes and a pre-diabetic population at high risk for developing diabetes. Here, the dietary strategies are needed and new thinking is needed. So several dietary approaches have been tried for glycemia control and regression to normal glucose levels from any level of glycemia, whether diabetes or pre-diabetes should be the priority for Indians who have fast progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes. A simple yet innovative diet, which is culturally appropriate, should be the first. Uh, we have heard a lot from the top people here that there are mixed studies as far as nuts are concerned. Mixed results on the diabetes, on pre-diabetes, on insulin levels, and so on. So we have to think new approach. And here is the new approach. Preloading before each meal with protein and fat or changing the sequence of macronutrient ingestion, non-carb first, has been proposed as a strategy for prevention and management of postprandial hyperglycemia. It's not something very new. It is, has been there for a decade now, but available studies are limited and of short duration. So we developed our research design. We chose nuts because we have been working on nuts. We have had a good study on pistachio nut. We have a good study on almond supplementation, which is given right here. Nuts are easy to obtain in India. And acceptable snacks, traditional snacks in Indian population. And our previous research data show good results in type 2 so we plan three phases of research 
end so that they think in a very definitive manner. So a single intervention with O tolerance, continuous glucose monitoring study after multiple intervention over three days, and three months of intervention in free living people. 18 to 16, uh, 60 years was the age of the participant from oral glucose solids test. Amal pre meal low, 17 to 18 in number, 30 minutes before each meal. Uh, this is the uh, design of the study. This is a crossover design, both for oral glucose tolerance based study and CGMS based study. In the OGTT based study, one group was preload followed by 75 gram, 75 gram glucose, and they were crossed over. In the CGMS based study, three days, multiple intervention before each meal was one. Uh, phase of the study, and the second one was a controlled diet equal matched for macronutrient, and this was crossed over. Now uh, let's uh, have a look at the results of an OGTT based study. This was published in European Journal of Clinical Nutrition recently. Uh, we took multiple parameters: you know, blood glucose, serum insulin, C peptide levels. Plasma DPP4 levels. Now, we know now that DPP4 levels, when they are in circulation, are pathogenic for multiple organs. We also looked at GLP1 level and plasma glucagon level, but those were not significant. So, only significant data are being presented here. And if you look at the first graph on the top left side, the almond load was given at minus 30 and 75 brown glucose subsequently. And look at the graph of those people who received almond first the blood glucose was much lower, area under the curve is significantly lower. And same it has been seen in the serum insulin, although the graph, graph showed that the decrease was a little later than blood glucose. Serum C peptide was lower and DPP4 levels were lower, showing that there's a clear benefit as far as OGTT study is concerned, the preload of almond. How much was the decrease in the blood glucose levels? Um, magnitude of decrease of two hours post prandial blood glucose level. On the left side, if you see the table, 5 to 35 is the range. In 28% of the people on the right side, you say the average. So about 20 milligram percent. If you see the graph, uh, 20 milligram percent in 28% of the people. The range 36 to 70, averaging 50, middle bar diagram, 50. In 60% of the people, there was a drop of 50 milligram of blood glucose. And in 11.7% of the people, 90 milligram blood glucose, milligram per deciliter blood glucose was seen to be decreased. Uh, this is something which is remarkable because this is what we see when we give postprandial regulator like a carbose or DPP-4 inhibitor in treatment of diabetes. Overall, postprandial hypoglycemia area under the curve decreased by 18% in OGTT-based study, based study which I am going to present next. And let's look at continuous glucose monitoring based data, in which we put a CGMS device and which measures the blood glucose continuously for three days. This was a Metronic CGMS device. We published this in Europe and General Clinical Nutrition. Now, if you look at the now, three days for us monitoring, we averaged all that in people controls versus preload of almond, 60 participants each. Uh, and uh, I showed you the crossover design. Now, look at the decrease in the blood glucose levels at all times. And particularly, postprandial excursions were decreased, in fasting blood glucose were decreased. So this is a clear demonstration that it is working at least over three days when we give the preload of almond. And if you look at one good performance profile, uh, this is day one, day two, and day three of CGMS, and look at day two, a look at the excursions on the left side in control diet. Number of excursions up and down of blood glucose 
on the right side, relatively quiet, straight line diet. So clearly showing that these excursions are reduced. Now we looked at number of parameters as far as CGMS device is concerned, and I'm not going to bore you with that, but look at the uh, parameters that we look, looked at. The glycemic variability parameters, they were on the left side, and the stackle is significantly different. And glycemic control, number of parameters, but uh, I would like your attention on postprandial hyperglycemia and overall hyperglycemia era under the curve, all decreased. Let's uh, look at the final part of the study, chronic phase study, because we have looked at these in a fairly controlled environment and over three days. But what happens if we give this over three months period? Now uh, there, the problem occurs because of the compliance and so on, and we wanted to have a look at that part also. Uh, we published this study in clinical nutrition. Now just as they study design, uh, the initial inclusion exclusion criteria, then two weeks of diet and exercise run in, after that randomization to pre-meal almond load, 80 grams of almonds were given before breakfast, lunch, and dinner for three months. And standard diet. This was the, again, I should emphasize, and matched mostly for macronutrients. As I said, in one slide, I have put together all the parameters which were significantly different in the almond load, uh, preload arm versus the control arm. And they included weight, BMI, waist circumference, hip circumference, some of the skin fold signifying subcutaneous fat, which is very high as far as the Indian population is concerned. Hand grip strength, which is increased, meaning thereby the muscle power increased. This was done by Jamar dynamometer. Fasting blood glucose, but very importantly, postprandial blood glucose, postprandial insulin and HOMA IR, and also significantly different hemoglobin A1C, pro-insulin, and lipid load. So more important difference as far as postprandial uh, data are concerned, and uh, surprisingly, a good benefit as far as muscle strength is concerned. How many people reverse back to normal glucose regulation? And that is our aim. And now, you know, reversal of diabetes is something that we want to do. And reversal of prediabetes also is something which is desirable. Now look at this. If we take for, on the first bar, fasting blood glucose and two hours post oral glucose tolerance blood glucose, 23% reverted back to normal in the almond preload arm versus none as far as the control diet is concerned. If we take only fasting blood glucose, then 33 versus 13, this was not statically significant. Two hours, 76.7 versus 23. Now, this is something, again, I must emphasize, is something that what we see with repaglinide or dipeptidyl 4 inhibitors. And hemoglobin A1C decreased by 30, 30 in 30% of the normal normalized versus 3% in the control arm. So I summarize. Emerging research shows that a pre-meal load of non-carbohydrate food, and there are a number of studies, other studies, which I have not, because of lack of time, I could not tell you, can help control postprandial hyperglycemia. So this is a new approach as far as almond is concerned, where mixed results have been, uh, have been shown as far as other almond studies are concerned. In a series of studies in Asian Indians, where postprandial hyperglycemia is a major concern and faster conversion to, uh, from prediabetes to diabetes is something which is seen, we show that a pre-meal load of 20 gram of almond before each meal help lower postprandial glucose, C, decreased weight, subcutaneous fat, improve hand grip strength, and reversal to normal glucose regulation from prediabetes is possible with this above. So this is in prediabetes. Where else can we apply uh, this particular strategy? In two more conditions where pharmacological approaches are limited and that is type 1 diabetes, and we have applied it anecdotally 
in patient with type two diabetes, type one diabetes, and shown good result. And also in patient with gestation of diabetes, where again pharmacological approach is unlimited. There are very few data available as far as that is concerned. So thank you for your patience, and I thank uh, again organizing committee for giving this opportunity. Thank you so much. And I'd like to invite our last speaker of this session, Tom Volleber from Canada. And his topic is the effect of adding protein to a carbohydrate meal on postprandial onses, a systematic review and meta-analysis of acute controlled feeding trials. Tom, over to you. Thanks very much. I'm afraid, um, we're not going to talk too much about nuts in this study, so I guess the only reason which we could be in here is because we were nuts to do it, right? Um, I've wanted to do this kind of a study for a long time, and I'm very grateful for General Mills for providing the, the funding to do that. And uh, the three co-authors are employees of INCOS, a clinical research organization, but we have no other conflicts of interest to declare. Our objective was to synthesize the evidence of on the effect of adding protein to a carbohydrate meal on the primary endpoint of glucose AUC, incremental AUC over two hours. We also had uh, a number of other secondary endpoints, but I'm not going to be discussing these in the interest of time. We conducted the SRMA following Concord and Prisma guidelines. We, we selected studies which were acute crossover single meal control trials in individuals of all ages and all health backgrounds. Uh, the, the studies involved adding proteins, a protein source to a carbohydrate-containing meal. The control in the protein-containing meals had to contain equivalent amount of available carbohydrate. And we only included protein sources if the amount of fat they contained was less than the amount of protein. So in other words, this excluded nuts, high-fat cheeses, and meats or high-fat meats. We'd have some meats. Uh, data were pooled during, using generic inverse methods and uh, using Dorsaminian and Laird random effects model. Uh, pooled estimates were expressed as ratios of mean, of the mean control. And uh, we examined interstudy heterogeneity, study methodology, quality, risk of bias, and publication bias. Basically, we had about 8,000 reports identified by the literature search. We reviewed in full about 800 of them, and we included 67 reports in the, the uh, SRMA. 86% uh, of these studies had good methodology quality, which is based on the ISO method for assessing the glycemic index. That's the quality. 91% uh, of the studies had low risk of bias, and there was no evidence of publication bias uh, for the glucose area under the curve. So, uh, overall, we had 178 trial comparisons for uh, glucose area under the curve. And you can see here, there was a significant, uh, at that point, let's go back on that. This one, significant 26% reduction in glucose area under the curve for all studies where protein was added, but there was a very substantial amount of interstudy heterogeneity. The first FEC modifier we examined was um, diabetes status. People without diabetes had a significantly greater effect than those with type 2 diabetes, and people with type 1 diabetes, glucose actually increased after adding protein to a meal. We won't be saying anything more about that. That's been known for quite a while. There are only five comparisons there. We divided the proteins into major categories of animal protein, dairy protein, milk, by which we meant liquid milk. There were some milk proteins which were included in the dairy uh, category. Uh, plant proteins and mixed proteins. You can see there was a significant effect modifier of protein source, but this was because the milk had a smaller effect than the other sources, and this is probably because the protein dose was much smaller in the milk studies. Uh, this is one way to assess the effect size. I think a better way I'll show you is looking at the slope of the dose response curve because dose had a very significant effect 
on the, on the effect, obviously. The very high doses had no effect, no significant effect, probably because they were older studies and they used uh, their day areas under the curve were reported as four hours or five hours, and there were only a few of them. And the follow-up time was also a significant effect. That's how long it, we, the area under the curve was assessed for. Most of them were two hours. Uh, the ones at 180 minutes were the diabetes studies, but the other time, time uh, you, under the curve times weren't significant. Also, was uh, the effect modifier significant was data source. Uh, 44 comparisons did not report an AUC. In those cases, we calculated the two-hour AUC from the data given. They sh and when we calculated, it was significantly bigger effect than it was reported. And study methodology quality. They were poor quality, they showed no effect, and that was a significant difference. Okay, so let's get on to the uh, slopes, the dose response curves. This is for animal, dairy, liquid milk, and plant protein. The, uh, this is in people without diabetes. Uh, you can see the animal protein, the slope is not significant, but there is a significant dose response for the other three categories. The different colors represent different individual types of protein. Here we have uh, animal and dairy protein in type 2 diabetes. Neither of these affect dose responses are, are significant, statistically significant. <clears throat> so just to summarize uh, the slopes, these are the slopes of the curves in the 95% confidence intervals. There was no significant difference among any of these categories in, in the slopes. Uh, you can see that milk is a little bit higher than the others, but the main categories is no difference. However, when we get into the individual protein sources, uh, and the, the numbers underneath represent the number of tr comparisons, uh, first number is normal, or without diabetes, and the second number is, is with the type 2 diabetes. You can see that the effect of beef protein on glucose is significantly less than that for whey or soy, and the effect of the uh, casein whey mixture, that's CA stroke WH, is significantly greater than that for whey and soy. Although, because of the small numbers and the large variation, it's not different from the beef, curiously. <clears throat> I just wanted to focus on milk. I was quite interested in milk, uh, that it had a re relatively large effect. And of course, when we add milk to a food, Many of the studies added milk. Some of them controlled for the available carb, most didn't. Of course, we're adding carbohydrate, so that's going to affect the response. And also, we have milk has a low glycemic index, and that's going to affect the response. So the glycemic index of milk is 32, and the glycemic index of lactose, which is just carbohydrate, is 48. So does the protein in milk explain why it has a low glycemic index. And uh, so milk contains 0.7 grams per gram of protein per gram available carb. The slope for dairy pr protein that we found was minus 0.49. That means if you give one gram of uh, dairy protein per gram of lactose, you should get a response 51% of the lactose alone. So to adjust for the protein amount, you raise the 0.51 to the power of 0.7, because these are log slopes. 0 0.62, 0 0.62 times 48 is, voila, 30. I gotta say, that blew me away. <laughs> it's well within the 95% confidence intervals. Jenny Brand's uh, 14 GIs on the University of Sydney database. So the milk slope reflects the effects of, uh, theoretically, the carbohydrate and the protein in the milk. So does the carbohydrate have any effect? And we can examine that by using this formula here, which explains 96% of the variation of the response of different carbohydrate foods fed at different doses in uh, healthy subjects. So uh, just for an example, one of the studies added 400 mils of milk to 30 grams of carbohydrate from bread. The milk contains 15 grams of protein, grams of carbohydrate, the GI is 48 of the lactose. The bread is 30, and its GI is 70. The GI of the control meal 
the 70, the germ of the test mu is the glycemic load of the uh, lactose, which is 70 times 30, plus the glycemic load of the bread, of, sorry, the bread and the lactose, divided by the total amount of carb, which becomes 61.2. So we plug the amounts and the GIs into our formula, and that will tell us, that would suggest that if you added lactose to a carbohydrate source in that amount, you'd expect 1.2 per uh, a ratio of means 1.2. We observed 1.04. So the red dots here show the, the calculated effect for the carbo adding lactose to the, the carbohydrate sources. There's really no effect. There's no slope. The blue line and the blue, do the blue dots are the observed effects. And so the green line is what we've adjusted for the carbohydrate, which really is very similar to the blue line. So the carbohydrate in milk, curiously enough, does not have any real effect on, the, on when you add milk to its postprandial glucose response. So conclusions, adding protein to carbohydrate reduces postprandial response to a greater extent in people without diabetes, but it also reduces it in type two, but it increases it in type one. There's some evidence that proteins differ. However, there are really insufficient data here to compare individual protein sources and to compare the effects of people with and without diabetes. And you can see because we have such disparate amounts of studies or comparisons with different kinds of, so there's 30 in, without diabetes in milk, but none in diabetes. There's very little in diabetes with plant proteins, pea and soy. And obviously we have a lot of studies in casein and diabetes, but very few for normal and, and a lot in whey and without diabetes, few in diabetes. And then the final conclusion is that if the effect of adding milk is mostly due to the protein it contains. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That was, that was excellent. So we want to invite the speakers uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, you can sit right in the front here. There's microphones on the seats. So Hans, come forward. And then we've got some questions. I see Frank's raising his hand already. Uh, Cyril, Joanne. Okay, well, you can go on over there. Sure, take the microphones over. Tom, if you don't want to be alone, you can go. Or Hans, you can go over, sit with them. <laughs> Okay, so we'll start our panel discussion, uh, and Dr. Frank Hu, I think, had the first question. And we'll need a microphone passed uh, to him. Maybe one of you can pass your microphone to Frank. Yep. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Um, great presentations. I have uh, two quick questions. The first one regarding the uh, association between uh, nuts consumption and type 2 diabetes. Uh, the results are very uh, perplexing, <laughs> puzzling, given that, uh, um, I mean, nuts contain good fats, uh, high amount of plant protein, no glycemic index, um, and also nuts have been found to reduce body weight and beneficial for preventing weight gain. So uh, given that body weight is the most important risk factor for type, for type 2 diabetes, you would expect that uh, nuts consumption is beneficial for the prevention of diabetes based on the uh, beneficial uh, effect on body weight. I think the, the main issue in, with the meta-analysis is that the relative risks adjusted for BMI were included in the meta-analysis. I think that's an over-adjustment. It means that after you're taking away the benefits of the body weight, what's the effect of nuts on diabetes? I think that's not the most important question because, again, body weight is kind of like a uh, mediating factor for the benefits of nuts on diabetes. I completely, I completely agree with you. It's not all, only a problem of the meta-analysis, but also of some original data from mm -hmm. some studies. So Yeah, we, we reported uh, the relative risk uh, with, without adjusting for BMI, mm -hmm. but in the meta-analysis, only the uh, relative risk adjust for BMI were included. Okay. Uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's a problem in, in, in the meta-analysis. Okay, so uh, it's important to, 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 to reanalyze all of this, taking into, into account of this, uh, I agree with you, and also mm, 
it is necessary to reconduct the analysis of some original papers mm -hmm. that also have conducted the same. So uh, it is necessary to, to reanalyze this and also to expand this to other right. observational studies, but there are other observational studies in other parts of the world that never have been analyzed and I think that this could be very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is here up front. Mike ha had a question, right? And then Jenny. I wanted to thank Hans Leroy, Hans, for your beautiful, clear exposition of how EFSA is working on the health claims. I, I worked for the Joint Health Claims Initiative, which led to the process that was handed on to EFSA, and I found it interesting. And one of the issues at the very beginning was um, what powers are there to police the unfair claims, and, and how are they being used? Because we see claims on foods every day which are clearly not permitted, and who is doing anything about it? There is the, the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, which was accepted by the EU in 2006. Do you know if any actual claim has been challenged by the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive? Thank you. Thank you. The question. Yeah. Um, there's two different aspects, and I think you stipulated it uh, quite well. On the one hand, you have the scientific evaluation of the health claims, and I explained the procedure and all the guidance that EFSA went through, et cetera, and developed uh, what type of data you need to uh, deliver. Uh, so when it comes down to, let's say, having a, a health claim sufficiently, uh, no, sufficiently scientifically evaluated, and uh, EFSA says, yes, okay, stamp, then it's up to the Commission to take a decision on authorization uh, the Commission and the Member States, which they nearly always do, unless there are other legitimate uh, factors. I recall there was a case of uh, sodium. Sodium uh, is an, has an electrolyte function for good reason, of course, but the Commission said uh, that may be true, but we do not want to have a health claim on sodium. Uh, okay, so that's not a legitimate factor. Okay, that's how the process works. Um, there's also another work. Uh, some people or some companies for one reason or another do not uh, want to obey or do not know uh, how health claims are practiced. I did a navigation, I have to say, about uh, two years ago when I uh, started as a consultant. Um, a client of me said, uh, Hans, uh, can you identify that there is no health claims on the market that are not authorized? I said, no, I cannot. And I went to the local uh, uh, food shop, and I easily identified a few dozen of health claims that I could find uh, there uh, that are not authorized but practiced. And these are not the claims that are on the 1,548 uh, botanical uh, claims. No, there's others. These are typically in the area of uh, tea, some in the area of dairy, but also some others. And that identifies that on the one hand, you may have regulation, you may have authorized health claims, but then it comes down to enforcement of the regulation. And that does not always happen, I, I have to say. Uh, one of the reasons I identified it uh, to the National Food Safety Authority one day and said, no, public health is not in jeopardy. So let's say it is not on the top of our mind to go of after enforcement of claims. And then it's a political decision what to do about it. Uh, let's say, uh, on one hand, I'm very happy that we have the health claim regulation, that we put, that we require in-depth scientific evidence in order to substantiate a claim. Uh, I, as a scientist, I cannot go beyond and start enforcing uh, the claim, but there is an issue there, yeah, indeed. And um, maybe you identify to your local uh, countries, food safety, I, I forgot which uh, country you are from, but uh, it happens. Okay, so we'll go to Jenny Brand-Miller and then yeah. Jeff Mechanic will be next. This is a quick question to Geordie and Cyril because both of you recommended prevention, diabetes prevention studies based on nuts. And I'm wondering, given the evidence that Cyril presented on peanut butter in the observational studies, it was the most powerful, 
why not use peanut butter? Because it's cheap. Everybody loves it. You can give it to kids. You can't give nuts to kids. And maybe, maybe the effect is because peanut butter you have with bread. And that bread, that carbohydrate note, might be an important component of the diabetes prevention, not just the nuts, which contain very little carbohydrate, if any. So are we being elitist by recommending nuts and thinking nuts only? What's wrong with peanut butter? So I think it's the evidence that I showed you in this meta-analysis with only two studies. Oh, so yes, sorry. Okay, only two studies. So, uh, so butter has not fiber, for example. And nuts have fiber. So mm -hmm. I think it's better fiber. Fiber. You still so I think it's fiber. better yeah. in, in butter. I think I didn't know if. Uh, yes, it's true. It's uh, just. In, yeah. in olives, no. But in, in, in butter, it could be. But I think uh, at the end could be the same. So I probably think. we need to perform clinical trial with them, but the clinical trial in order to demonstrate this. And also, it is important to reanalyze all the data as well. So that Okay. So worth another study. It is another study. Yeah. Yes. Worth, worth an intervention study. Yeah. Could be, and I think the most appropriate approach in order to conduct clinical trials, especially after analyze, uh, after having this data in relation to the postprandial glucose, when you substitute carbohydrates, the best approach is this probably. To substitute okay. carbohydrate or fat in this from uh, okay. mm -hmm. vegetable origin or nuts. Okay. Thank you. So, next question. Oh, Hans. Jeff Mechanic. Hi, thanks. Jeff Mechanic, New York. Uh, thank you very much for the great talks. Um, here's a pragmatic question. Uh, I have a large uh, practice in the city, and oftentimes a patient will come in uh, with brain fog and uh, dizziness and flushing, and ultimately this is a tyramine effect. So one of the things I haven't heard in any of the talks was uh, commentary about tyramine, highest in walnuts and pecans, but if you go to Google, if you, you, you speak with the nutritionists, all the nuts and the seeds are part of these uh, foods along with other fermented foods and cured foods that are high in tyramine. And in fact, it's probably an under-recognized syndrome of patients who are having these, these weird uh, uh, complaints. Many times they undergo very large workups looking for something where just stopping the foods high in tyramine will take care of it. It's almost a magic bullet. My question is twofold. First, what do you think of that? And second, when you review the data and when you design your studies, are you interrogating the data, looking for uh, either designing a clinical trial or doing a, a, a meta-analysis, are you looking for these side effects, these tyramine-like side effects? Because it would be useful to the clinician to know what the dose correlate is. Is it 18 almonds? Is it 30 almonds? Uh, a lot of these patients are just injudiciously popping nuts all day because they heard they were healthy. So the question is about tyramine. Actually, I, I, I'm really not familiar with that, and I wonder if you have any anecdotal evidence linking nuts to um, some of the patients you've seen with that condition, with the brain fog. I'm sorry, what was the... Do you have any anecdotal evidence linking nut consumption with brain fog you've observed in your patients? Right, so um, the reason this comes up is because uh, patients with carcinoid, for instance, uh, patients who are in MEO inhibitors, you need to restrict, it's part of the standard practice to restrict tyramine-containing foods. Uh, you get catecholamine discharge. It, it, it stimulates and enhances uh, catecholaminergic uh, transmission. So I do have an experience of uh, withdraw doing a dietary history, which would be part of the, the medical encounter, and then having them 
cut them out going to the nutritionist, and yes, they do have remission of these uh, symptoms. So it is a phenomenon. I, I, I don't know how common it is or if it's been linked to, to nuts directly, so that I can't comment. It, it, there have been studies looking at nut and cognitive function, and there seems to be some improvement in some of the studies that Joanne has been involved with, Jordy has been involved with, uh, that have taken place in Spain. So. I mean, we do adverse events in our trials, and you know, we would be able to pick that up if somebody came in with a complaint, like we've not done any nut study. Uh, no, we have not observed any uh, adverse effect. The only thing that we have observed that some people said that hey, if they have at the end, some, some people, gingivitis, when they eat walnuts, but not other types of nuts. Uh, this is the only thing that we have observed in a few people. We have no other adverse event we have observed. Thank you. And the last question goes to Dan. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the, the, the presentations. These, these studies take a really long time to, to generate results. I've been working on, the, on, on pulses and blood glucose lowering for a long time. Um, but as we get health claims approved, um, we communicate these to the public for uptake. And that, so with my, the, the question that's going through my mind are, what's the significant reduction in blood glucose after consumption of nuts or other food? And secondly, if you recommend increasing or in incorporating more nuts into your dietary pattern, is there a concern around weight gain and increased energy intake? So what's a significant reduction in blood glucose? And is there an increase in fat or calorie consumption when you move uh, towards increasing your, uh, your nut consumption? If you're looking at postprandial effects, the, the effect is quite significant. We saw that uh, quite massive reduction. I think uh, for two, two ounces of pistachios, we had a, a minimum reduction of about, I think it was around 20% up to a maximum of around 40%, depending on the type of car carbohydrate source. Uh, so if you're looking at uh, clinical intervention studies, the, the effect is still quite significant, clinically significant. So. I think the effect is there. Okay. So the regulatory agencies define, like Health Canada has defined a significant reduction as a 20% reduction. I'm not sure if it's the same with EFSA or other. Uh, as far as drugs are concerned, at least 10% of uh, blood glucose reduction has to be there for drugs to be considered for the next phase of the trial and also 0.5% hemoglobin A1C reduction. So that's for drugs. I suppose this should apply for effective, any effective glucose reduction uh, strategy. And, and related to the weight, Stephanie, she, I think somewhere out there, she will be, she did a nice meta-analysis, uh, both of the prospective core studies and the randomized trial evidence showing no evidence of weight gain. And in the observation studies, it was associated with weight loss and weight circumference reductions. And I think, Jordy, back to you. So I have only the last question, I suppose. But it's a question for, for two of the speakers. I don't know if it's Joan Sabaté or the other one who speaks up in relation to the EFSA. So uh, is the question of why to have a health claim for nuts? Because we have health claim for nuts, for example, in the United States for cardiovascular disease, but uh, most of the, the, the companies that they produce nuts and commercialize nuts do not include the health claim. Or, for example, the health claim that we have for walnuts in Europe that is uh, beneficial for the liver function, this could not be understand, understood like by, the, by people so and at the end is not used. So in some cases, the, the, my question is, 
Faculty Beneficial Public University or for South it will be useful for uh, people or for uh, companies that commercialize not to have a health claim. This is my question, because in, in some cases it's not used by the industry. They have the health claim and they, it's not used. Or, and in some cases, people do not understand the health claim. So, for example, in Europe we have a health claim, health claim for walnuts and endothelial function, but people do not understand what is this beneficial effect. So this is my question. Maybe you get it back as a iterative question. I don't know the answer. Ask the food, <laughs> ask the food, food business operators. Uh, so if the science is okay, you can practice. You're not obliged to. Maybe you can. I, I think that, sorry? I think as far as the lessons learned, for which I learned myself, because I was not aware of that, is that the wording is very important. And I think besides the scientific evidence, if any organization wants to file a health claim, I mean, wording, working on the wording, on, on, on the language of the health claim, is as important as many other things. Because uh, what you are saying is confirmed what I just said. If a health claim is available, is, is authorized, but doesn't become useful, therefore uh, is, 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 is not use, I mean, what's the purpose of filing for a health claim? Okay, we'll, we'll close this session. We want to thank uh, the speakers for wonderful talks and uh, the audience uh, for wonderful questions and engaging in the panel discussion. It was a very long session. Um, we're a half an hour over. We were a bit over in the first session. Um, and so now we're at 4.30. So I'm looking to the organizers. Um, but I think we'll do a, a half hour break. Or are we going to do it shorter? 20 minute break. I think everyone still needs a break. So we're going to do 20 minutes.
So let's start in order not to be so late. Uh, we'll start the session number three on meal replacement for diabetes prevention, management, and remission. We have uh, three talks in, in the oral, or four talks, I think. So we'll begin with the first one uh, from Jeffrey Mechanic from USA. The title of the talk is Diabetic Specific Nutrition Formulas in the Management of Diabetes. Terrific. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is uh, my favorite uh, coffee come to always block it out here ahead of time. My wife is always asking me what's important about it. And uh, I think you just look outside and you have the answer. I'm going to speak about uh, diabetes specific nutrition formulas, but uh, rather than dwelling on what are they and some of the basic evidence, which has always been part of the topic in the past, I want to update the talk and put it in the context of some of the newer ideas that we have now. First, a framework to envision uh, cardiovascular disease in terms of its metabolic drivers, really conflating diabetes, obesity, lipids, hypertension, cardiovascular disease really in one framework. Now, the purpose of this is to expose opportunities for early prevention. Uh, this is a really important point because the, the current way in which we press medicine is we wait. Wait until somebody's A1C goes up, their BMI goes up, congratulate them if it's fine. Uh, or we wait until they have crushing chest pain and then in the CCU say, you know, by the way, you, you gotta get this uncontrolled diabetes or severe obesity managed. So the purpose is, is early uh, detection, uh, prevention, and sustainable prevention. And it's within that context that we'll talk about the diabetes-specific nutrition formulas. And I also want to talk about metrics, right? A lot of the, the validation and scientific substantiations in terms of not only blood glucose, but A1C. I'll show you some of the pitfalls there. And now with continuous glucose monitors, we have really a, a better way with these wearable technologies. And then I'm going to go right into some of the new digital twin technologies to really put this uh, more in perspective. So here's the model. Around the periphery of the model, you can see where a lot of our research efforts are right now. Uh, we have a network of uh, researchers uh, spanning maybe 10 or 12 countries around the world that are validating uh, this model, looking at the various individual drivers, solid-based chronic disease. Basically, in a nutshell, it's three dimensions. Uh, you have four stages of these driver-based chronic diseases. The first stage is risk. It's really where you want to intervene, right? Looking at the built environment and infrastructure. Uh, the second stage is pre-disease, where you actually have the pathophysiology, but you're not meeting consensus uh, definitions of what the disease is. And then you have disease as the third stage. Uh, and then you have the fourth stage, which is complications. So in a complication-centric model, the whole purpose of treating a high blood sugar is to prevent the vascular complications. The, the whole purpose of treating being a little bit over, being more overweight uh, is to prevent the, the weight-related complications. In this model, obesity would be stage three, adiposity-based chronic disease. Type two diabetes would be stage three, dysglycemia-based chronic disease. Now for each cell in this two by two matrix, each cell can then be modified or modulated by structural and social determinants of health. And in that way, what you're doing is you're lending precision to the way in which you interact with an N of one type medicine, an individual. If you look along the periphery, these are the ways that we're validating it now, not in terms of just clinical economic uh, burdens and looking at the cost, say, prevention. Sustainability, by the way, would be through nudges, technological nudges, and human touches. And that nudge-touch paradigm is something we'll talk about when we discuss the digital twin. So let's uh, this is... Uh, a study uh, from uh, John's group, uh, and looking at, uh, this is from 2019, just looking at meta-analysis, systematic review, looking at diabetes-specific uh, 
nutrition formulas and the effects on lipids, hypertension, uh, blood pressure, uh, blood pressure uh, adiposity, really the drivers for cardiovascular disease. And you'll note that for the dysglycemia aspect, looking, the metrics are A1C and blood glucose. We'll come back to that later when we talk about the continuous glucose monitors. That was a systematic review. Here's a narrative review that we did also with Jarvis, who's in, uh, who, was, who at the time was working with John, and then just reviewing the literature, uh, substantiating, corroborating some of those effects of these diabetes-specific nutrition formulas. Now, these are formulas that have uh, different car lower carbohydrate and also with the isomaltulose and an alpha-1,6 bond, a slower digestion, you theoretically are going to have blunting of the uh, mean amplitude uh, glycemic excursions and other markers of glycemic variability. You'll have uh, uh, cocktails of micronutrients, uh, which either with evidence or in theory uh, will, will facilitate uh, insulin receptor signal tran uh, transduction. Uh, there's also some pharmacoeconomic uh, benefits here as well. So then you take the data, right? The data's vetted, it's, it's meta-analyzed, and now it is incorporated into guidelines. So I pulled three of the recent guidelines. You can see at the bottom guidelines from this group. Uh, but at the top, the ACE guidelines in 2022. But there were no specific recommendations for the diabetes-specific nutrition formulas. I can tell you that dating back to 2011, when we wrote the guidelines, we did mention it, but there weren't any formal uh, evidence-based uh, recommendations. And uh, in the ADA uh, standard of care uh, guidelines, again, no specific recommendations. It's mentioned in the discussion on weight loss. And again, if you look, obesity or abnormal adiposity and dysglycemia are, are conjoined uh, together. EASD, uh, uh, the DNSG, uh, I can't confuse DS, you know, NF. You know, this has been driving me crazy lately. Um, but uh, you can see there are specific recommendations for uh, the diabetes-specific uh, nutrition formulas, uh, and you can see the moderate level of uh, evidence. So let's move on to continuous glucose uh, monitors, updating of, uh, of the evidence for this talk. And you can see in the four panels, they all have the same uh, A1C, by the way, I mean, I am sure that you've seen this. Uh, we had it in our textbook on lifestyle medicine, some photonic uh, data from Divna Gallagher from Columbia, looking at uh, body composition with the same BMI, but different percent body fat, different lean masses, different amounts of adiposity. Same as here, uh, true here. So with the same A1C, you have different uh, tracings in the continuous glucose monitor. You have different glycemic variabilities, different um, estimated uh, A1Cs, uh, different amount of times that the patient is actually using or interrogating uh, the sensor. Um, you can see on the far left the, the A1C versus the either estimated A1C or uh, one of any other metric from CGM. And the curves are not always linear, not always the same. In fact, uh, the curves can change uh, just depending on the scenario. Now, this is two outpatient studies. These are positive findings. Uh, this is look at diabetes-specific enteral uh, formulas, nutritional formulas, uh, looking at 24-hour uh, profiles in patients with type 2 diabetes. And you can see as you scan the various panels that there is a dampening effect of the uh, postprandial excursions. And it, it depends on how you characterize it. If, if you look at uh, various studies, you could, you'd have jackknife entropy, you could have standard D, just have the range, you could have area under the curve. There are lots of different ways that you can express uh, glycemic variability. It's an independent risk factor for outcomes, both in the outpatient and in the inpatient setting. And, uh, a couple of years later, and um, I think uh, Dr. Gar, who I've worked with, and again, uh, a lot of fiber, less carbohydrate, uh, you have the uh, excursions, and uh, you would think, well, everything's uh, great, this should work all the time, but now you have an inpatient study, 
20 step and he needs to be very careful uh, generalizing or extrapolating these about critical illness. Critical illness is a cytokine driven uh, environment. In fact, a lot of the malnutrition, it, it, a lot of the perceived malnutrition and changes in body composition, uh, the low albumin, for instance, which is really not a nutritional marker, a metabolic marker, they're not nutritionally sensitive. Uh, in the ICU, Grinsley from uh, Stanford Hospital, ischemic variability was an independent risk factor for outcomes, uh, ICU length, time on ventilator, et cetera. So it's not surprising to find this. And in fact, if you go back and you look at the ESPIN, Europe Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition guidelines on uh, diabetes-specific nutrition formulas, they say there's really no role. And that was at a time with the Leuven protocols we were using type glycemic intensive insulin therapy. So if you're going to be going on insulin, is there really a need, an evidence-based need for these formulas in the ICU? So remember I said that it can change depending on the population. And this is a pitfall in a lot of the data that you're going to see throughout the entire uh, uh, symposia uh, over the next uh, few days which is really parsing it out over different populations. So you have ethno-cultural uh, differences and not only social determinants, but biological determinants of disease, differences in polymorphisms for insulin resistance in beta cell mass, less beta cell mass in South Asia and Caucasians. And, and really here it's no surprise that you're gonna have differences in the correlation of uh, A1C and, and continuous monitoring metrics. By the way, we're moving away from just using and uh, trying to really confine our commentary to ethno uh, classifiers and descriptors. Uh, you can see on the right panel some of the differences in the branded uh, continuous glucose monitors, whether it's flash technology or otherwise. So you, it, you have to really read uh, these papers and look at the methodology. Uh, chronic kidney disease, long been known that it affects uh, the A1C measurement, underestimating the true A1C. And it's not only uh, some of the uh, metabolites that are there and the elevations in BUN, uh, but also the anemia that can attend and the malnutrition that can attend severe uh, chronic kidney disease. But this is the mismatch uh, that you see, so more mismatch in the blue than uh, with patients who have uh, CKD than patients who do not have CKD. <clears throat> now to digital twin. So digital twins uh, really began not with medicine, but uh, with NASA, with uh, industry, trying to uh, have digital representation, real world, analog world phenomena and uh, structure. But um, now with technologies and uh, really the components of the digital twin technology for metabolic disease would consist of wearable technologies, which would be continuous glucose monitors, activity monitors, pedometers, accelerometers, uh, would have blood pressure, hemodynamics, uh, and other wearable technologies. I mean, there, there are uh, e-tattoos now and medical paints that can be applied to the skin, which through plethysmography and, and some other uh, uh, really cool phenomenon, you can measure blood flow. So you're gonna be capturing all the sensor data and then turn out of things, putting it all together and positioning it for input to artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, uh, algorithms, and then what happens is you get an output represented as a technological nudge. And there's a huge amount of literature on how nudges can actually sustain a response. And when you couple that with a human being and a human touch, now we're gonna mince words here because a lot of the, the, rope, the chat bots that, that you see online, they're not really humans even though they with AI, they appear to be humans, but that nudge touch paradigm sustains a response. And that's really the core of uh, digital twin uh, interventions. So you can see here in an early study, uh, this is 90 days 
uh, notwithstanding the fact that there wasn't much improvement in glycemic variability, there was improvement in uh, hemodynamics and also in A1C. Uh, and then here's another 90-day study looking at the term they use as reversal. I'm not particularly partial to that term, but it's a partial remission. Uh, not a complete remission, so the A1C under 6.5, but still in the pre diet but on no medicine. So there are various stages of what reverse endpoint, uh, how, how much you've ameliorated, uh, at least the metrics of the hyperglycemia. Remember, though, that diabetes dysglycemia, it's not just all about blood sugar. Uh, and that's the point of comprehensive guidelines, like the ACE guidelines in 2011 and subsequently, and the way that we now have a complication-centric orientation to diabetes, type 2 diabetes, where we want to prevent those microvascular and macrovascular complications. See, whether you had obesity or not, you had improvement uh, in days with the digital twin technology. Uh, but here's the problem. And this was a very interesting paper. You know, you have to worry about unintended consequences of new technology, and, and the orientation here is towards children and, and the pediatric population, young adults. And what, what's happening is they're being marginalized from the established healthcare infrastructure. So as they have more wearables, as they have the digital twin and more technology, they're not gonna be seeing their doctors as much. They're not going to be traditionally engaging. Now, that may be the trajectory of where we're heading for healthcare. We'll leave that to another talk. It's not terribly futuristic because it's actually happening now. Uh, COVID was a force multiplier for that with telemedicine as we all. We need to be very careful uh, how we uh, gravitate to technologies. But the, the idea here is that the diabetes specific can fit into this new world with newer technologies, but we have to be prepared to adjust our metrics, particularly as we design our clinical trials. Let me conclude. The use of diabetes specific nutrition formulas is an evidence based intervention in the management of diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 gestational, et cetera. That would be atypical, mitochondrial, LADA, et cetera. Via dampening of the postprandial glucose responses and also the nutritional ecology. The use of CGMs is an evidence-based methodology to optimize diabetes care in general. And the impact uh, of the diabetes-specific uh, nutrition formulas in particular. The use of novel technologies, overall diabetes care, comprehensive prevention uh, within the framework, that cardiometabolic-based chronic disease framework that needs to be incorporated, and we have to do it to close. Research gaps, questions without answers, knowledge gaps, answers without awareness, right? Why do some people know one thing and other people don't know it? And then practice gaps. You have all the answers. You have all the awareness. You want to do it, but you just don't have a gym in your clinical practice so that all of the physical activity prescriptions uh, can be implemented. You don't have access to the diabetes technology. So with that, I'll conclude. And Thank you, and we move on to the next presenter, who is Alejandro uh, sanz uh, And uh, the topic is high in monosaccharide fatty acids in stress-induced hyperglycemia. Hello, I'm online. It's possible to show, to show my slides, please. Hello, I, I couldn't go to the symposium, but I would like to, to show you my, my presentation online. It's possible. Yes, okay. possible. Yes, welcome. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation. 
I, I'm sorry I couldn't go to the symposia because uh, you can see that I'm the, the head of the, the, the technology and nutrition service, and now we have three people uh, ill, so <laughs> we have not, no people to work. So I, 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 I will try to explain my, my ideas by online. Uh, well, in, in Spain, uh, the specialty is in the technology and nutrition. So uh, we usually visit patients uh, with diabetes and uh, patients with malnutrition who needs enteral or parenteral nutrition. So uh, it's very, very frequently that uh, we, we can... Excuse me. Uh, yes? Can, can you hear me? Uh, is there a technical problem? Okay. Could you say, could you tell me? Could you listen to me? Hello? No problem, please continue. Could you listen to me? Yes, okay, okay, I can, I, can I continue? Yes, yes, please. Okay, okay. I, I, I was uh, trying to explain to explain you that uh, because I'm endocrinologist, uh, clinical endocrinologist, uh, I usually uh, attend patients with diabetes and patients with malnutrition, and uh, so it's very very easy to in, in my in my usual work uh, to to attend patients with enteral nutrition because of mal malnutrition and diabetes. Uh, could you pass the next slide, please? Next slide, thank you. Uh, the, the topic today is about the, the hyperglucemia because of stress. Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very frequently situation uh, in patients with uh, high stress and in patients with uh, artificial uh, nutrition. And this, this situation is uh, linked with uh, high mortality and and morbidity, uh, not only because of the hyperglucemia, uh, because of uh, glycemic variabil variability. Could you pass the, the next slide, please? This is because uh, these patients uh, show uh, insulin resistance, like uh, type 2 um, diabetes. So at the end, it's, it's, uh, we can find uh, high levels of glucose with a very, uh, very, very frequently goes to hyperglucemia and hypoglucemia. Next slide, please. Next, thank you. Uh, that's why uh, there are some uh, uh, diabetes associations who uh, present or recommend us different uh, different ways to control this, this hyperglucemia in these uh, stress patients. And uh, one of the, of the line to to treat these patients is using the, uh, the specific uh, enteral nutrition uh, formulas. Next slide, next please. Uh, so in these patients is, uh, is uh, very, uh, the basic is uh, the high inflama inflammation with high uh, nutrition requirements. Uh, so uh, these patients has a very high risk of malnutrition because of these high nutrition requirements plus uh, low uh, ingestion. And the, the, we usually use enteral nutrition uh, by tube or uh, oral supplementation. If it is not possible because the, uh, the, the, it's not functional the intestine, we use uh, parenteral nutrition, but uh, usually we, we try to use enteral nutrition. Uh, next slide, please. In this uh, revision, uh, within in our group, in the Spanish group, we present this study uh, the, of these recommendations based in, in the, the, the evidence uh, where we recommend that the goals of metabolic control uh, of these patients with enteral nutrition uh, should be the same that another uh, diabetic patient in, in, in the general. And the caloric intake the, the needs of this uh, caloric uh, nutrition, it, it could be the same that if the patient were not di diabetic or were not in, in the, in, with hyperglucemia. Uh, 
and about the, the, the specific enteral nutrition formulas, we say that uh, these formulas should be uh, with a low uh, glucose index uh, because of uh, uh, special carbohydrates and a high percentage, per, high percent, percentage of um, monosaturated fatty acids. About the, the contain of fiber, uh, usually um, uh, all formulas are rich in fiber, but uh, this, this content of fiber is not important in the reduction of postprandial uh, hypoglycemia. And uh, we say that this special diabetes formulas, it will be more interested in patients with uh, intensive care or in enteral nutrition at home. Next, next slide, please. But the, the problem is that there, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, specific um, diabetes formulas, enteral formulas. In this slide, you can see not all, not all <laughs> the, the formulas that you can find the, in the market in Spain. And you can see that, for example, the, the, the percentage of fat or the carbohydrates, for, for example, the, the, you can see the, the, the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth uh, column, you can see the, the percentage of carbohydrates. And uh, you can see that there are one with uh, 46 percent uh, by carbohydrates and the, the next 29 percent of carbohydrates. So uh, the, the total uh, calorie content. So you can see that there, there are a lot of formulas and this, these formulas uh, are in the market like specific diabetes formulas, but you can see that the composition is quite different. So the, the first question for the, the, the clinical uh, is uh, which formula is uh, really a diabetic specific formula and which one is just an, a, a standard formula with, with fiber. Next slide, please. Uh, this is because uh, really there is not a, 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 a special diabetes formula for, for oral recommendations and uh, all the, the, the formulations of these enteral formulas are, are from the, the, the oral recommendations. But if there are not uh, really specific oral recommendations, you can use everything. Uh, in these ESPEN guidelines, on uh, hospital nutrition, uh, you can see that one of the recommendations is that uh, for patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes patients should offer the standard uh, hospital diet. So there, are, there is not a special uh, diet for, this, for, for these patients. So in, the, in this way, uh, you can, if, if the enteral formulas are based in the, in the diet, uh, oral diet formula, you can you can uh, present uh, uh, whatever standard or uh, standard formula. Next slide, please. Hello, thank you. So the question is, how this the diabetes specific formula should be? In in the early the the, the European uh, Society of Parental and Internal Nutrition guidelines, they saw that the, the first classic diabetes formulas was just a standard formula with fiber, but in the, uh, the, 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 there was new formulas high in monosaturated fatty acids. High, how, how much high? Uh, how much uh, lipid formula? Uh, in, the, in, this, in this recommendation, they say about uh, more than 40% of total energy from lipids and more than 20% in form or uh, monosaturated fatty acids. In next slide, please. And in this, another recommendation of the ESPIN, they again say that the, the specific diabetes formulas, uh, they should be uh, lower car of carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates complex, uh, like uh, modify maltodextrins, starch, fructose, somaltose, and saccharomaltase. And, and, uh, and uh, this ESPEN group uh, recommend the, use this, this kind of uh, specific formulas. Next, next slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, I would like to show you this poor uh, meta analysis. Uh, you can see that the, the earlier is uh, from uh, Elia, and there there was another for Ojo, uh, another for our group, and the last one is uh, in patients with uh, intensive care. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the earlier uh, meta analysis. Uh, say that uh, the, mm, the, the, the enteral formulas specific for diabetes, uh, it could be mm, interested in type 1, type 2, and stress diabetes, stress diabetes or stress hyperglycemia, and uh, in patients with oral nutrition supplements or by tube. Next, please. And the, the, the another, uh, another meta-analysis uh, are... Mm, study in different point of view. The, the uh, meta-analysis of OHO, uh, they compare a standard by versus specific, but they don't say what, what is specific in their nutrition, and only with patients with type 2 diabetes. In our meta-analysis, we compare a standard versus specific, and in this meta-analysis, we only mm, use uh, like specific uh, mm, formulas if they have 20% uh, of monounsaturated fatty acids or 40% in fat. And uh, we explore uh, not only diabetes and uh, stress uh, hyperglycemia. And the, the last meta-analysis compare a uh, standard versus specific formula without, uh, of course, again, high uh, fiber, high monounsaturated, low carbohydrates, but uh, without uh, determination the, the, the exactly the, the composition in, in patients with uh, in, in intensive care uh, and uh, assess only uh, glycemic control and insulin needs. Next, please. And now we are comparing the, the results of these uh, of these four meta-analyses in the postprandial studies. Next, please. In our study. Uh, we we saw we we found that uh, the, these specific uh, diabetes formulas have a lower uh, peak postprandial glucose, incremental glucose response, and plasma insulin after intake. Next, please. In the in the earlier uh, meta analysis, the, uh, Elia found the, the same the same results with less study. Next, please. Uh, in this, in this uh, graphic, you can see the, the studies we choose for a study the peak postprandial glucose. Next, next, please. In the earlier meta-analysis, uh, so this, uh, this, uh, th this only three studies with the, the same result about the peak, the peak blood glucose, postprandial glucose. Next, please. About the, the incremental glucose response, we, we can found that the specific formulas are uh, better than standard formulas. Next, please. And uh, there was the, the similar uh, in the earlier meta-analysis. Next, please. And uh, even in our, in our meta-analysis, we look for the, the curve of plasma insulin after uh, postprandial insulin. And uh, we found the, the, mm, the results are better in the specific formulas. Next, please. And what about long term? Because uh, mm, the, there are, uh, I think that all, all the, stud the studies show that the postprandial glucose response is better with uh, specific formulas. But what about medium long term uh, studies? Uh, next, please. In the earlier, in the earlier study, uh, earlier metabolic, uh, earlier <laughs> uh, study of uh, Elia, uh, they they saw with these uh, four studies uh, that uh, the the specific formula is better in in long term um, about glucose concentration. Please. In our meta analysis, we we look for uh, mean blood glucose level. Uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, glucose variability, this is a very important point in the morbidity and mortality, glucose variability, 
mean administrate insulin dose, mean blood uh, triglyceride, triglycerides and HDL uh, cholesterol, and then the adverse events, the complications in these, in these patients. Next, please. When we compare the results uh, in these three meta-analyses, our meta-analyses, the OHO and the, the, the intensive care meta-analyses, you can see in the in the three in the three meta-analyses the result is the is the is similar about the the blood glucose mean media. Next, please. And when we we study about the, the glycosylate hemoglobin, the results are similar in our in our meta analysis and in the meta analysis of the intensive care uh, uh, patients. Next, please. About glucose variability, again again we found the same result than the in in our study and in, in only in patients with. Uh, in, in intensive care. Next, please. And about the, the dose, uh, the dose insulin ne necessary to control the glucose. Again, if you use uh, um, uh, specific formulas, it's, it's, bet it's lesser the, the, the need uh, uh, in, in our study and in the study only in, in patients with uh, in intensive care. Next, please. And uh, in this uh, in this meta analysis uh, in patients with uh, in intensive care, uh, they they different, differentiate uh, in between diabetes and uh, hyperglycemia stress, and they found that the glucose level was different, but the the, the insulin uh, necessities was was the same. Next, please. And what about uh, the, the cardiovascular factors like cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, HDL or triglycerides? Uh, in, in the earlier meta-analysis, uh, Elia couldn't found uh, any, any differences between these, these two um, specific formulas. But in, the, in, the, in, in the another uh, meta-analysis, our meta-analysis and the, and the OHO meta-analysis, we, we could uh, find this, uh, these effects with the, the specific formulas. Next, please. And in not only in uh, cholesterol, even in triglycerides in our study, but not in the, in the intensive care patients. Next, please. And uh, the, the, the conclusion uh, for the earlier uh, meta-analysis uh, Elia said that uh, these internal formulas rich in monounsaturated fatty acids improve glu glucose control and uh, could be could be reduce the cardiovascular complications, but without uh, statistics uh, significance. Next, please. And uh, in the in in the in the meta analysis of the in the intensive care. They say that these enteral specific formulas control fasting blood glucose, uh, glycosylate hemoglobin, and HDL cholesterol. In our meta-analysis, we, uh, we are more concretation. We, we are interested in the uh, exactly definition of uh, these enteral formulas, specific formulas, and we say that uh, the formulas who contain 20% or more or total energy by monosaturates are mm, the, the formulas who can uh, show mm, better benefits in, in peak postprandial glucose, incremental glucose response, and very important glucose variability, uh, both in diabetes and stress uh, hyperglycemia. Next, please. Uh, in, in the another study, uh, they say that uh, these enteral formulas uh, show uh, low, lower blood glucose, lower daily administration insulin, low, lower glycemic variability, but, but in, in the, in the meta-analysis meta couldn't find any uh, statistics significant in, in uh, evolution. Next, please. And uh, to, to, to finish, 
I could show you this this, uh, this study where we can found that using these enteral special formulas in 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 patients in out in, in outpatients, uh, they they show uh, less uh, hospitalizations, and in this way uh, there was a 65 percent lower cost in, in the, the economic uh, because of the um, less hospitalization. If we add the cost of the of these enteral formulas, uh, the, the 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 cost again is less uh, than 40 percent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have the third uh, talk. It's from Professor Mike Lin. He's going to talk about the uh, middle replacements for diabetes remission. Uh, the lessons from direct study. Professor. Thank you very much. And we have a slide. I'm going to go quite fast now because a lot of you have heard about the direct trial. Um, we start with the, the, my title, which is to talk about meal replacements, and I'm speaking here not about formula diets used to avoid weight loss, as we've heard in the last talk, but to generate weight loss. And it, the composition uh, really doesn't matter if you're only consuming a total, let's say, of 800 calories a day or 200 calories in a meal. It's not going to matter very much what's in it. Um, Meta-analysis done by the Oxford Group, and I'm just showing two slides here. One year results. On average, about four to eight kilograms weight loss, depending on the level of support in all these different study designs. And at two years, three to five kilograms weight loss. And the importance of this is that this is not enough weight loss to generate enough numbers of remissions of diabetes for this alone to be successful. One example which has kind of shown us quite nicely this is, of course, look ahead. My meal replacements were used by a, a large group. The, the, the blackish line there, the gray line, which has the, the, the steep fall, um, both for weight and for hemoglobin A1C, which mirrors it exactly, um, and with a, a regain after the first year of weight and a regain in hemoglobin A1C. The remission rate at one year in Look Ahead was about 11%, um, which, is, which is good, but um, we can go on and come back to that in a minute. Meal replacements. Um, for diabetes care, type 2 diabetes care, is mainly about achieving a degree of weight loss and maintaining, if possible, and, of course, to achieve remission. And they can be used in, in three different ways, really. Firstly, the too efficient way is to use total diet replacement. That means replacing each meal with a formal diet. We have used 850 approximately calories a day. There are very low-calorie diets which go down Weight losses are no different because people simply can't stay at that level, which, so the weight losses are exactly the same in uh, Copenhagen studies. Next is, of course, as an option for weight loss maintenance. Now, you don't continue total diet replacement uh, for long-term maintenance, but you can relax one meal a day, perhaps two meals a day, um, as a strategy, a potential strategy for long-term weight loss maintenance. Um, and that can be done either as um, one meal a day for eternity or by using two days in the week with a total diet replacement of perhaps 800 calories um, and eating sensibly for the other days. There's different strategies around that. And finally, there's an, a, a use of meal replacements as what we call rescue plans. When people have lost weight, perhaps got a remission of diabetes, and they tend to put it back on again, there is the possibility to use a short burst of total diet replacement at that point. Um, the tolerability of total diet replacements in our hands, although this is the preferred option for people going into direct, they prefer to use uh, formula diet, total diet replacement, rather than having to make decisions about foods and, and get it wrong, which they've done repeatedly through their lives. Um, the tolerance to continue it is somewhere around eight weeks in most cases, up to 12 weeks in some other cases. And as you know, we also allow people to take holidays, to take breaks from that, to be able to get the weight losses that they, they were aiming for. So those are some background thoughts there. Um, what we're talking about is formula diets, which come in all these different shapes, um, designed to replace the normal meals and normal foods that go into them, but always as part of a, an integrated program so that there's a, there's a, a plan for integrating that into a long-term maintenance in the end. Um, 
and nutritionally balanced to meet the requirements, the essential requirements for minerals and um, vitamins, minerals, proteins, etc. I don't know why that picture's there. Somebody put that on. I have no idea who she was. <laughs> Total diet replacement as a way of getting, inducing weight loss works in our hands, and it works pretty much everywhere in, in this slide. All over the world, little stars mean total diet replacement at an average of 10 kilograms at a year, 11 kilograms. And well, well done, the men. They seem to do better. That's wonderful. Not many things that we do better. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> other studies, and I'm just not going to linger, same weight loss on average around about 10 kilograms in young people, teenagers, um, who are using total diet replacement in the same sort of way. Similar weight losses in insulin-treated patients who need to lose weight, 10 kilograms on average here. And a trial, which, as you know, was a randomized trial, first randomized trial, offering the formula diet, 850 calories a day approximately for 12 weeks, allow for their holidays, food introduction over, over a couple of months, meal by meal, and then weight loss maintenance, during which one of the options was to use one meal a day um, of the same formula, formula meal, formula diet, as one um, maintenance strategy. In, in, in practice, around about 60% of our, our patients did do that for a period, but um, the total time using them was only about a third of the total. So most people did not want to continue using meal reversing the message, something useful. The results you, you have seen already at one year, which fell at two years to 36 percent, 10 kilograms at one year, eight kilograms at two years, that was the average. And those, that loss of remissions was to do with 15 individuals who regained weight to come, to come closer than 10 kilograms to their, their baseline. It seems like keeping 10 kilograms below your diabetic weight would keep the diabetes away for at least two years. And we also showed regain of um, weight was associated with reaccumulation of the ectopic fat, the liver fat, and the pancreas fat, which seems to be so uh, important in driving the disease process. And as a, as a side thought here, We've kind of, I've realized over 40 years of working in diabetes that type 2 diabetes is the same as obesity, is the same disease process, um, which is defined by WHO as excessive or abnormal fat accumulation. And in this case, it's largely abnormal um, ectopic fat accumulation. It's the same disease process, and we should treat it in the same way. With the Remission is well maintained at um, two years, so if people were able by uh, by the amount of weight loss, so if people were able to lose 15, is that thing on the screen? Yeah. Oh no, it isn't. 15 kilograms still in remission at two years, and put those two top categories together, um, over 10 kilograms weight loss maintained would allow three quarters of patients to be free from diabetes for at least two years. Everybody was very excited about this. It's changed the way type 2 diabetes is being managed in the UK and indeed in other countries. With it, there was the fall in blood pressure. And I think one of the other things we learned in direct was that blood pressure was very, very closely related to being overweight. And if you can achieve and sustain weight loss, you can treat blood pressure much better than any of the medications that we have available. Um, so that was good news. And stopping the medications on day one when they go on to the um, total diet replacement was very important because otherwise you're going to get postural hypotension. And we've had anecdotal cases of people blacking out in their gardens when drive cars, all sorts of things. Postural hypertension is dangerous. Um, and stopping the medications when they, they start falling weight, uh, falling, losing weight is important. All, all great. We did detailed analyses, cost effectiveness analyses, which showed that people would live a little bit longer on, in, in principle if they managed to lose this amount of weight and free themselves from the hypertension and the diabetes and the dyslipidemia. Um, they would feel better. Quality of life improved quite significant, significantly. And the cost of providing the uh, intervention was outweighed by the saving in fewer medications, fewer clinical complications. During that, in, in that um, cost-effectiveness analysis, we assumed that all remissions, 36% um, of them, would all disappear after three years. So we were very conservative um, in making that, that um, analysis. Uh, but it left these big questions. Beyond two years, can the weight loss be maintained longer? Can the remissions be maintained longer? And will we see 
can we see clinical benefits? Can we undo that disease process, including medications? And the design of direct was not going to do that. So in three years extension to take our intervention group up to five years to begin to look at, in an observational manner, some of these questions. And this was the, the direct extension study under a separate funding also from Diabetes UK. Um, 95 of our original 149 intervention group patients remained at the two-year point. They went into an extension which was low intensity provision. They were seen every um, three months for uh, an appointment with the dietitian or nurse, whichever was available in, in practice. And they, remember, they never came to hospital. They were seen entirely in their villages in the, in the clinics where they went. That had to be changed a little bit because of COVID, so a lot of it was done virtually um, in the later stages. And we were able to look at the results of these 95 individuals and compare them with what we call the no extension group, which is the 54 people who had dropped out from the intervention group and were no longer there to do the extension, and with the original control group of 149 who were simply being followed up in routine care. It's important also that after the randomized trial and the rather striking results, we shared those results with all the participants, including the control group, and, and urged them to maintain the lowest possible weight uh, to get the best outcomes from their diabetes. So a lot of them then went off and started to lose weight. That was how it worked, three monthly repair. Um, they were given this option of one daily meal replacement, um, which about, as I say, about 60% gave it a go for a bit, about 30% uh, uh, persisted at any one time. And they also had the option of rescue plans, which allowed once to, to um, undo a weight gain if it went, if a weight regained by over two kilograms. And not all of them took that up. Did I jump a slide? No. No. Um, there are the way here. In the green are the extension group. These are the people who we, we managed as we would like to have managed them from the beginning over five years. And you can see that the weight regain for three years was, was quite striking. But after three years, they maintained a weight loss of somewhere around six kilograms. The yellow group that there are dropouts, the, the um, or included, sorry, in the yellow group was the entire intervention group, including the dropouts, and they're put behind. The control group had, as they started to learn about results, started to lose weight. Firstly, they learned from the Daily Mail, because Michael Mosley uh, published a piece telling everybody the results. We think there was a leak from Newcastle. Is there anybody in Newcastle here? We know there was a leak from Newcastle. Um, and at the end of two years, of course, they heard the results, and a lot of them did seek help to, to lose weight. Um, here are the five-year results. The numbers we had left at five years in the, that extension group of 95 was now 85 um, out of the original 149, 82 in the control group, so similar number. Weight change from base baseline, 6.1 kilograms in the extension group compared to 4.6. So well done, the control group, but 6.1 kilograms weight loss maintained for five years is rather better than most studies have found. With that, the hemoglobin A1C um, will be similar in the two groups um, with uh, 13, 14 percent uh, below 48 millimoles per mole. However, that was with 40 percent of those in the extension group no longer or not at all on uh, medication, whereas only 13 percent of the control group were, were off medication, many more requiring medication. And the remission rate at that point, 13 percent in the um, extension group and only 5% in the controls. And that 13%, you can look at in different ways. Obviously, it's a, a big drop down from 36% at two years. On the other hand, it's better than look ahead at one year. No cheers? OK. <laughs> the Americans over here are going to throw things at me soon. Um, blood pressure we measured in the um, uh, extension group it was not measured in the control group. It remained baseline, but with only 40, with 47 percent of them not required to 35 percent in the control group. So blood pressures tend to come back up again, but some. And quality of life, and this is really important, was improved by almost 10 percent year, each year throughout the five years in this extension group. Whether that was they were self-selected people who wanted the support of an, a program, of course, we can never say, but they felt better about being managed in this way, uh, and there was no such improvement in any of the other groups. This slide gives you just in the same color scheme the remissions year on year, and you can see that there's this really quite 
smart fall in the green, the, intimate, the, the extent group, which is our supervised group, um, from years one, it was up as high as 61%. That's similar to the Tahiri group in, in Diadem 1 trial, 60 something percent um, at one year, which fell down to around about 20% at three years and then settled down at 11, 12% in years four and five. Um, the extension group, the, sorry, the, the control group, despite their quite good weight loss, did not see the rise in remissions which you might have expected at that point. And there are many reasons why that might be. It, they did it later. Perhaps their diabetes had got worse in the meantime. There was no strategy for therapeutic withdrawal of their medication, which may have played a part. And also, uh, their weight losses may have been aided by medication in some cases. And I'm, I'm hoping to get those results today for you, but I'm afraid the email hasn't arrived yet. I don't know how many of them were on um, uh, GLP-1 Agnes, but some of them. I think it was only a small number. Um, quality of life, and that's just showing you how, how in the um, extension group um, with supervision, the quality of life improved from baseline to year one and then remained at this high level throughout. And that, that was a, a testimony to, to their, their commitment, I suppose. We also looked and tried to look as best we could in a, power, a study which was not part of the subject at clinical outcomes over the five years. Um, in the uh, intervention arm, the entire intervention arm, including those who dropped out because we had data up to the point at which they dropped out, um, compared to the control group, a, a far greater number spent time, a period of time, with weight 10 kilograms below baseline. That was 27% of the, of the five years against 8%. They spent longer with a, a hemoglobin A1C in the sub-diabetic range below, below 48 mL per mole, 29% versus 15%. They spent much longer off the anti-diabetes medication, 51% compared to 16%, and in remission, 27% of the five years spent in remission compared to 4%. And perhaps associate, we like to think associated with that, the adverse events, serious events in the intervention group were less than half those which were recorded in the control group, 5.1 versus 10.3. All these, of course, highly significant. And I can tell you a bit more about that. The, the, um, we looked at these, those are the serious adverse events again. We also looked at MACE um, events uh, that, um, can't do it, major adverse cardiovascular events. The study was not part of this. We didn't expect to get big numbers. We did not get them. We also looked at what we've called MAID events, which are major, moderate and major adverse diabetes related events. And this is things, I'll show you a list of them. And again, over the five year period, we did not see a significant or any difference between the control and the intervention groups. However, we also looked at freedom from uh, these events. There was no message at all about cardiovascular MACE events. However, for, the, for freedom from diabetes-related events in the next period or over the five-year period was associated with spending longer with the weight loss below more than five kilograms below, weight, um, below baseline. Um, and with a lower body mass index, and with a lower hemoglobin A1C at different time points, and with duration of remission. So all these outcomes of the intervention were associated with freedom from diabetes-related events. It's maybe slightly out of order. Um, the the diabetes-related events included the MACE events, and, and these are shown here um, with um, cardiovascular type events, uh, which we see in, in these patients. Um, and I've got here the, the white line are the controls and the green, the extension, and there's no big difference there. Um, the infections were very significantly more in the control group whose diabetes was less well controlled, and that's probably what you'd expect. Um, they had more biliary disease, they had pancreas. So the control group here, you can see, had more of these type of events which we considered related to diabetes. Um, and the other striking thing is that in the serious events, serious adverse events, there were seven cancers in the control group and zero in the control in the intervention group. Now the numbers, these are fortuitous numbers if you like, but it's in the direction that we, uh, that we would hope to see a message. So I, I threw these numbers out um, and those are, those are the, the cancers which we found in the control group and I say none occurred in the extension group. There was one lung cancer in somebody who had withdrawn from the study at an early stage. So the conclusions from this look back at the, at the five-year data, which are not yet published, but hopefully will be shortly. And good luck to any of you who might be refereeing this paper. Um, 
<laughs> we, we have seen with that, that low intensity support over five years, a maintained weight loss of 6.1 kilograms, 13% remissions, which I say is as good as look ahead at one year, and 50% fewer serious adverse events. And if that is maintained in, in larger numbers, can be, can be demonstrated in, in much bigger studies. So this will be quite exciting. Um, I just throw out some other slides, which sent to me actually by George Tom, one of my colleagues on direct. He, this is a useful study which showed how people do not believe that our interventions are very effective for weight management. And you see weight loss pills are down at the bottom and NHS delivers, National Health Service delivered weight management programs, which includes the use of um, meal replacements, are not considered to be effective by uh, over half the, the, the respondents here. This was general public and health, healthcare professionals, which is a bit worrying when we're now producing quite powerful evidence that they absolutely are effective. And the paper that George led on um, and published two or three, well, five years ago now, which I think he has asked me to mention, and I will, and that's a, that's a famous picture of George himself sitting on a fence. Because what we, what we said here was that um, looking for the optimal diet, and this is what this group has been doing for 40 years to my memory, um, we find time and time again that the differences between diets are really very small, they're quite marginal, and what probably matters more is the preferences of the people who we're trying to help, and that if we can, that we need to optimize adherence for their doing, rather than pushing them down one route or another. And again, this is again George's um, kind of final word, if you like. This horrible business of how do we maintain people on a diet in, in the long term? The belief that actually we should we, we're tilting at the wrong windmill by going for calories, and we're trying trying to punt the evidence of people. What we need to do is why they're eating, which is much more to do with the emotions on the football. Who did win the football yesterday? It was important, wasn't it? Um, and it's like, rather than health concerns. So there you go. Behavior change interventions are more likely to work than behavioral, the dietary restraint. And I say thank you to all our team there, and a special thank you to Roy Taylor. And I'm going, can we activate the little GIF there? Can anybody, does anybody know how to do that? Anybody behind the scene there? Can you see the, the GIF on that thing in the middle? Can you go on? Give us a laugh. That is my latest grandchild. <laughs> and uh, Roy Taylor saying hello to it. On that happy note, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. And the last presentation of this session is uh, by, uh, given by Bettina Schuppelius from Germany. And her topic is weight loss induced uh, by low caloric reformer diet is associated with improvements on liver outcomes independent of formula diet type. Please. Thank you much. So, yes, I'm very grateful that today I have the chance to present you some of our results of our just um, completed FAIR trial. First of all, I declare that I have no conflict of interest in the context of this presentation. And our study is named FAIR, which stands for Fasting Induced Immune Metabolic Remission of Diabetes. And the trial is based on the direct. So as we just heard a very interesting talk about this, I'm going to keep the background real brief. As we heard in direct, um, a majority of people with type 2 diabetes achieved the remission if they lost more than 10 kilograms. However, not all individuals achieved um, a, a, a type 2 diabetes remission. We also learned that it is important to decrease the liver fat percentage. As we all know that um, type 2 diabetes like fatty liver disease and obesity. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I will from now on say NFLD, um, is the most common liver disease worldwide. And um, the most effective treatment known so far is weight loss. So what we need are potent and feasible weight loss programs um, to treat all these three diseases. And for this reason, 
whether the consumption of a very low caloric formula diet for three months had effects on the diabetes remission, the weight loss, and the liver enzymes and the fatty liver scores in patients with type 2 diabetes. And moreover, we also looked at the different formula diet composition and whether it affected these outcomes. And we defined remission of diabetes as a glycated hemoglobin of less than 6.5% after at least two months of all diabetic medications. So to achieve this rapid weight loss, we put our participants on a very low caloric diet for three months. And this diet was uh, composed of three to four shakes per day. And in addition, the participants can con can could consume uh, 240 grams of uh, non-starchy vegetables. This resulted in a daily caloric intake of calories per day for women and around 800 kilocalories per day. And after a successful screening, the um, participants were in when came to us for a baseline uh, clinical visit, uh, which was also the starting point of their um, meal replacement diet. And after seven days, they came back for a second visit, and then again after 12 weeks. At all visits, fasting blood samples were drawn, and we um, did anthropometric measurements. At visit one and visit three, in addition, a mixed meal tolerance test was performed. So we randomly assigned our study participants to either the OptiFast formula or the HEPAFAST formula diet. The OptiFast formula diet is um, the powder there is mixed with water before the people eat it. And for the HEPAFAST, the powder is mixed with the low fat milk and then consumed. And in the table below, you can see the um, resulting content of macronutrients the participants consumed per day. And the major difference is that the HEPAFAST contained less carbohydrates and therefore more fiber. We assessed 94 and 52 of those were enrolled into the intervention. Continued the intervention, so 47 completed the intervention at the end. And of those, 38 participants achieved a weight loss of more than 10 kilograms. And um, for 24 participants even lost more than 15 kilograms. And as you can see, we had a very high um, diabetes remission rate in this trial. So even the people that lost less than 10 kilograms, 78% um, of them achieved a diabetes remission. Um, and this uh, remission rate increased to 95% if they lost more than 10 kilograms and to 96% if they um, lost even more than 15 kilograms. So as we assume that the people that lost less than 10 kilograms were not compliant to the study protocol, um, the further analysis will uh, focus on the weight loss on the people that lost more than 10 kilograms. And these 38 people 20 of them were females, 18 were males. They had an average age of and the BMA, BMI of 36 and a hemoglobin of 6.9%. So as expected, the participants already had a significant body weight, fat-free mass and fat mass reduction after one week of the very low caloric diet that further decreased after three months. And interestingly, the fat-free mass significantly decreased after one week, whereas the fat mass significantly decreased after three months. And we found no difference between the HEPA-FAST and OptiFAST group in terms of weight loss. So as expected, we found very strong improvements of glucose metabolism in our subjects. As you can see here, all the values significantly decreased in response to the diet. And here also, we can, did not detect any differences between the HEPA-FAST and OptiFAST group. And in line with the previous results, we also found an improvement um, in terms of the indices 
and the insulin resistance represented by the HOMA IR decreased significantly, where activity and the insulin secretion increased. And again, we found no difference between the two types of the formula diets. In metabolism, the total cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol progressively decreased the study. Unfortunately, also the HDL cholesterol did, and the triglycerides um, showed a very pronounced decrease already after one week of the very low caloric diet that slightly um, decreased a little more after three months. And here we also found no significant differences between the mean or the delta values of the formula groups. However, the HDL decrease was not significant in the OptiFast group, only in the fast and the total cohort. If we look at the liver enzymes, the AST and the ALT initially increased after one week, but then after three months decreased even below the baseline value. The GGT decreased progressively over the course of the study. And he actually found a significant difference between HEPA-FAST and OptiFast. The decrease of T between visit two and three was significantly higher with the HEPA-FAST diet compared to the OptiFast diet. We also calculated the NAFL D scores um, to estimate whether the liver fat content decreased. And as you can see, improved very significantly over the course of the study. And at the base according to this uh, indices had a, a fatty liver. And here we did not find any differences between the two types of the formula diet. So, taken together in the present study, we confirmed in kilograms to formula diets as a very effective approach to alcoholic disorders, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and non-alcoholic fatty liver. The different composition of the formula diets, however, did not affect the success of the very low caloric diet. And now I'd like to thank you for your attention and, of course, my group for the great work on this study. And Thank you very much. And uh, now we have, um, I think, time for one, two questions. We are a bit late. Uh, are there questions for the speakers? The microphone is just for you. A question for you. And I also, um, so the direct trial was very impressive. Uh, the come in front, please. The speakers to come in front in order to be easier. Oh, it's Simon Liu from Brown University. From my very impressive trial. So I'm curious about the extension periods. Is how do you define remission? I might have missed it. Like, so do you continue to define it, the remission, or do they? We, we how how we define remission is using the now international agreed criteria, which is the hemoglobin A1C below the diagnostic threshold of 48 millimoles per mole without medication for at least three months, well, and in this case for up to five years. So you do it at the end and at the end? So, so this is last five. They had hemoglobin A1C in the intervention, extension group. The hemoglobin A1C was measured every year in everybody, including the controls. It's measured routinely as part of the NHS care package for people with diabetes. So we had hemoglobin A1C and weight on everybody in the, in the trial, all the original participants. Do you also have post-prandial? No, we have no post-prandial anything. These were people at home it's being managed in, in their villages. So, thank you. So if I might take advantage of that, your trials, what are the BMI uh, of the, the patients in your, in your trial? Because, because it's 600 kcal per day uh, for women and 800 kcal is extremely low, obviously. So I wonder whether or not even affecting the basal metabolic way and whether or not those guys are basically on survival mode for three months. Uh, so what's the BMI of your comparison group? Of the comparison group? 
comparison group? So yeah, the, the intervention versus comparison group, because you didn't show the BMI, or how, how obese they begin with. Ah, they begin with the BMI of 36. Yes, and the mean one to be that. Can I ask, because yes, sure. you didn't mention it, medications, were they on medication when this was started? No, they were, so before they were on medication, most of them, but low insulin. And then uh, they took off, we took them off the medications three days before they started um, and the trial. And they had a hemoglobin A1C of 6.9% postnatal stress. So if you start with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5%, you don't surely get 50% remissions because of variability in the assay. Th th that's true, but this first initial, um, it's still with the medication because we took the blood and it's a, it's a long-term parameter, so. Yes, John, please. Thank you, everybody, for wonderful presentations. Just a question, I guess, to Mike and a bit to Bettina as she thinks forward. So I was chatting with David before, uh, and the question, I guess, is about that stepped food reintroduction for two weeks. And have you looked at different dietary approaches there? I mean, obviously, in preview, they looked at manipulating GI and protein. But have you looked at things like whole grain or fiber or glycemic index? So maybe what did you do for the, uh, the step reintroduction? And have you looked at different um, ways of doing that to improve that long-term uh, maintenance? I'm not sure I understand the question there. Well, you have the two weeks of, of stepped food reintroduction after, because this temporizing measure, right? You've got the 12 weeks for the weight loss of the 20, and then you have your rescue okay, yeah. plan. So it's, it's what yeah. to do in the food reintroduction. Yeah, it's actually once you get your replacement. So the, the principle we used in the REC was that we wanted the cost maintenance to be maintained in the context of people living in normal homes and normal jobs in Scotland and the northeast of England. And so basically we had to use, we decided to use foods that were very similar to what ordinary normal human beings use, nothing unusual. Um, and we've learned from experience that if you ask people to do something unusual, they will do it for a short time. And then this goes back to this issue about therapeutic diets being truly sustained because they are simply not what people do. So we used, we used a, a diet program administered, designed by the dietitians, delivered mainly by practice nurses, um, which was based on the ordinary foods that people eat. We didn't do anything unusual. Uh, I have one question to Ben here in the front. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you look at the, the total cost or actually across the ratio? Uh, no, 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 no. That might be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering if you can speak a little bit on uh, the example of participants that actually were on these really low calorie diets because I know a lot of uh, food is <clears throat> is social, right? And, and being able to kind of enjoy your, your food. And I'm just wondering what your perceptions on that were. Who? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, well, I can tell you I enjoy my food and we... <laughs> <laughs> Me Absolutely too. agree with you. And it goes back to John's question here. We, we felt that the foods have to be things which people enjoy. And what they enjoy is what they've been doing for all their lives. And if that's similar to that, I may be wrong, but that's what it is. Yeah, I agree. I think it's quite social and it's, it's okay. And they do it. And we were really surprised how good the people actually stick to the diet. We also didn't expect them to accept this so easily. So we were positively surprised. Um, but yeah, for a long term, I also think it's um, not good. Um, so that question actually is about the, in the writing of the recently pub published guidelines, it opened up this question about whether we should be recommending therapeutic diets, which clearly, or what, for what purpose should we be recommending therapeutic diets? Because they are very unfamiliar. The sort of specialist diet, and we know this from um, renal diets in the old days, people just wouldn't stay on them because they're totally unfamiliar, not nice. And many therapeutic diets are considered not nice. My daughter was on the DASH diet for two years. Her blood pressure was 200 systolic. It became completely normal. But after two years, she said, enough, she had this problem. So she gave up. Um, does anybody want to say any more about liking food? Thank you very much. I'll give it to you just in a minute.
Michael, there's just one more in here. That's a fantastic presentation. Great study. Why do we present data in QGAM and not in percent rate laws? Because we've learned that that's much more important. Uh, Anna's asked why we present in kilograms, not in percent rate laws. The average, the mean weight is 100 kilograms. <laughs> Same in preview. Um, I just wanted to say from the point of view of not a patient but an ordinary person that I have been consuming a, a total meal replacement as a breakfast every day for the last 12 months and I absolutely love them. They are satiating. They fill me up until lunchtime. Um, I make them up with ice so they taste like a McDonald's smoothie. Honestly, I, I don't understand why people think that they are less than. I find them more satiating than muesli is it. Thank you. I'll stick to my porridge. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? The last one. Uh, I have a question for the speaker that was online on the screen, so I'm not sure if he is listening. <laughs> but uh, maybe you, he can answer me because it was results of the diabetic specific formulas and it was postprandial results. And I was thinking all the time, postprandial, I, they were in the EU and I was thinking they have always administrate the continuous. Um, the continuous uh, enter on nutrition. So I just, who, who need, the, who have the real, the bolus administration and are there really postprandial results? Because that is dependent on meals, isn't it? So that was my question and I, I didn't understand that. I guess I'll just fill in unless the speaker's still online. No? So th the problem in the ICU is exactly what you say. It's a heterogeneous population. Most people are not eating in the ICU, uh, nor are bolus feeds uniformly done. So it doesn't represent the totality of the ICU experience as a population. And that was one of the reasons why you saw the negative study that I presented. And ESPN has sort of uh, had to deal with this issue of diabetes uh, specific nutrition formulas. They sort of waffled a little bit earlier on without data. Uh, they weren't supporting it. Later on, they were mentioning it and including it in some of the recommendations. But I, I think that's a very good point. It probably doesn't have as much applicability to the critical illness experience. Thank you. I had the privilege of uh, staying with Mike Lean once. And I must say, his porridge is very good. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. The porridge and is good, but the company was terrible. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And now uh, I have to invite, I think, uh, Jordi and Maria for the next session. Good afternoon. Uh, it's for me a great honor and privilege to to co-share this session, that this uh, plenary session of the DNSG symposium. Uh, 
the symposium is on diabetes and nutrition, and if someone uh, has worked on this one is Dr. Frank Hugh, that has, uh, that I have had the privilege in the last few years to work closely with him, 120 meetings during the last ten Monica, uh, Maria Lakinen uh, from Finland will introduce you. Okay. okay, thank you. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker, Professor Frank Hu from Harvard, USA. He has a great experience of studies investigating gene environment interactions in relation to risk of obesity and diabetes by integrating cutting edge omics technologies into epidemiological studies. So the title of his plenary lecture is Precision Nutrition for Diabetes. Is it ready for prime time? Please. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, my name disappeared on the screen. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's really a great pleasure and privilege to, to be here. And thank you, uh, John and Cyril, for, for inviting me. And uh, it's also very nice. To, uh, to be in, um, in this country. And uh, this is actually uh, my first time in Croatia. And, uh, I'm really impressed by uh, such a beautiful and friendly uh, country. So um, I'm going to give a quick overview on precision nutrition uh, for diabetes, which is a very hot topic right now. But to get started, I think you're familiar with the, uh, uh, the obesity data um, in the last um, uh, several decades, as you can see, that uh, globally the prevalence of obesity has increased dramatically uh, from about 4% in uh, 1980 to more than 12% uh, in uh, year 20. And uh, the prevalence of obesity has continued to increase, especially in low and middle income countries. But in the last several decades, the most dramatic increase in obesity prevalence has occurred in, in North America, actually, uh, especially in the US. Currently, 42% of adults are obese, and 20% of U.S. children are obese. Um, in parallel with the uh, obesity, uh, the prevalence of diabetes in the world has also increased dramatically. Um, the number of people with diabetes uh, has increased from about 150 million uh, in year 2000 to uh, more than 460 million in uh, 2020, and uh, this trend will continue to increase. Again, the epicenter of the global diabetes epidemic is actually in low and middle income countries, especially in Asia. Uh, we know that uh, genetics plays a role in the development of obesity and diabetes. However, uh, the genetic differences across different populations do not explain uh, the population differences in obesity and diabetes risk, and certainly cannot explain uh, the recent increase in global obesity and the diabetes um, uh, epidemic. Uh, instead, the current uh, obesity and diabetes epidemics are driven by changes in, in our environment, in our diet, in our lifestyle. So here we're talking about three uh, nutrition transition means transition from traditional diet and lifestyle to westernized diet and lifestyle. Epidemiology transition means transition from male nutrition infectious disease to chronic degenerative disease. But in many populations, uh, there is still coexistence of undernutrition and, and overnutrition. And then demographic transition means uh, the transition from high fertility and high mortality to low uh, fertility and low mortality, which has led to accelerated aging uh, across many countries in the world. Um, many risk factors uh, have been identified uh, for type 2 diabetes. Uh, as you can see, there are many modifiable risk factors and also many um, uh, non-modifiable risk factors. Among the modifiable risk factors, of course, overweight obesity is the single most important risk factor for type 2 diabetes. However, unhealthy diet uh, is also an important de determinant of diabetes risk, independent of uh, body weight. So I think that's a very important point to keep in mind. Uh, this is a summary of a meta-analysis of prospective cohort studies on uh, nutrient intake and the uh, risk of type 2 diabetes. As you can see, that uh, higher intake of uh, human iron, high glycemic index, and high glycemic node 
uh, strongly and robustly associated with increased risk of diabetes. On the other hand, high intake of magnesium, uh, cereal fiber, high uh, blood levels of vitamin D uh, associated with lower risk of diabetes. Uh, in terms of uh, foods, uh, processed red meat has the strongest positive association with diabetes, followed by uh, unprocessed red meat and uh, white rice, which is typically high in uh, glycemic index and glycemic load. On the other hand, uh, green leaf uh, dairy products, especially yogurt and whole grains, uh, associated with lower risk of diabetes. Among beverages, uh, it's not surprising that uh, regular consumption of sugar sweetened beverages uh, is strongly associated with increased risk of diabetes. On the other hand, regular consumption of coffee, including decaffeinated coffee, and also moderated consumption of alcohol uh, associated with low, lower risk of diabetes. So those are the uh, eight most important dietary factors for type 2 diabetes identified uh, in the nurse's health study cohorts. Uh, so the uh, risk factors, the dietary risk factors for diabetes include uh, gasmine, high glycemic index, trans fat, sugar sweetened beverages, and red processed meat. So those are the four uh, most important um, positive uh, or, or risk factors for, for type 2 diabetes. Uh, on the other hand, there are four uh, protective factors against diabetes, high intake of cereal fiber, high polyunsaturated fat to saturated fat ratio, uh, uh, regular consumption of coffee, and also regular consumption of nuts. And using those eight uh, factors, we created um, a diabetes risk reduction score. So this score is very powerful in terms of predicting future risk of uh, developing type 2 diabetes. And what's, what's so interesting is that uh, the risk reduction associated with a healthy dietary pattern is consistent across different as, uh, ratio and ethnic groups. As you can see that uh, the results are very consistent uh, um, for uh, whites, uh, Asian Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, and Black Americans. So it means that a healthy dietary pattern uh, is very important in the primary prevention of diabetes, uh, basically across uh, many different and ethnic groups. Uh, among uh, various healthy dietary patterns, uh, the Mediterranean diet has been shown to reduce risk of uh, both cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes in the PREDIMED trial. Uh, so in the PREDIMED trial, uh, Mediterranean diet intervention uh, supplemented with extra virgin olive oil or mixed nuts reduced uh, the risk of CVD incidence by 30% and uh, uh, reduced incidence of type 2 diabetes by 25% compared to the controlled diet. So I think that's uh, in terms of dietary uh, or nutritional factors uh, uh, for type 2 diabetes. So the question is how we can make recommendations to individuals or populations in terms of uh, dietary prevention of type 2 diabetes. I think everyone would agree that one size doesn't fit all. And um, the reason is that there is a huge uh, between individual difference, uh, differences or variability in terms of, of uh, metabolic response to the same food or same meal. So those are the data from pr PREDICT-1. You can see huge variability between individuals in terms of post-prime uh, triglycerides, glucose, and the insulin responses. Uh, even among identical twins, I mean, they, they have ident identical genes, almost identical height, but they have very different uh, uh, postprandial glucose and uh, triglyceride uh, responses to the same diet. So uh, this kind of observations has led to this concept of precision nutrition or personalized nutrition. And there are some parallels between the concept of precision nutrition and precision medicine because the goal of the precision medicine is to find the right drug at the right dose for the right patient, whereas the goal of precision nutrition is to find uh, the right food at the right amount for the right person. Of course, precision nutrition is much, much more complicated than precision medicine. So how do we define precision nutrition? Uh, there is no uniform uh, definition of uh, precision nutrition, but based on the 2020-2030 strategic plan for NIH nutrition research, pre precision nutrition is defined as a very broad framework uh, conversing a wide array of features, including your genetic ground, your microbiome composition, your circadian rhythm, your socioeconomic status, and so on and so forth. So this is much broader than the traditional concept of uh, personalized nutrition or nutrient genomics, which is aimed to tailor 
nutritional strategies to individual characteristics such as uh, your genes or your microbiome. And also precision nutrition recognized that humans are inherently different uh, from one another. So when, why, and how we eat is exactly as important uh, as uh, what we eat. I, I will come back to this concept later. Um, last year, NIH awarded $170 million, $170 million for precision nutrition study uh, as part of the NIH's All of Us research program. This is probably the largest uh, investment by NIH on a single nutrition study. Uh, and the goal of this, um, uh, of this project is to develop computer algorithms to predict individual responses to food and uh, dietary habits. So what does precision nutrition really mean? It may mean different things to different people. For example, it may mean that uh, being more precise in dietary recommendations at the population level, or being more precise uh, in giving dietary advice at the individual level, or being more precise in measuring diet and nutritional status using biomarkers or smartphone apps, or being more precise in quantifying individual responses to diet, for example, using CGMs for uh, monitoring your blood sugar, or be more precise in understanding biological mechanisms and the health outcomes, or be more precise in uh, computer algorithms that drive personalized diet or AI diet. So it can mean a lot of things. It can mean uh, different things to different people, but the concept of precision nutrition is much broader than the traditional concept of personalized nutrition. So to a large degree, uh, dietary advice is already uh, personalized um, based on um, individuals, age, sex, um, different life stages, food-related conditions such as allergy, food intolerance, uh, medications, certain metabolic disorders, your culture and food preferences, and, and so on and so forth. So this concept is not new. It, I think uh, what is important is that uh, at this point, the precision nutrition uh, is primarily focused on developing uh, genetic and omics-based testing so that uh, you can use uh, molecular data to personalize uh, um, dietary uh, recommendations so that more effective uh, dietary um, um, uh, therapies can be developed for uh, disease prevention and management. And also more recently, a lot of uh, excitement has been uh, focus on AI, developing AI-based algorithms for personal, personalized nutrition. Uh, this is another way to look at the precision nutrition pyramid. So at the bottom of the pyramid, so I think general healthy uh, dietary guidelines should be given to everyone. So everyone should eat more fruits and vegetables, uh, eat more whole grains, uh, eat, uh, consume uh, less sugar sweetened beverages, and then on top of that, specific dietary recommendations should uh, be based on uh, individuals' health conditions and food preferences. So some people uh, may uh, prefer Mediterranean diet uh, over uh, a low-fat diet. Other people may uh, prefer uh, vegetarian diet or, or vegan diet. Or some people may want to follow a ketogenic diet or uh, intermittent fasting diet. And then um, uh, beyond that, uh, you can give molecular nutrition advice uh, based on omics data and also our understanding of the biological mechanisms. So I think that's the, 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 the essence of uh, precision nutrition that we are talking about today is to use molecular biomarkers to guide uh, dietary recommendations and the dietary advice to achieve more eff effective uh, uh, health uh, uh, treatment or prevention of uh, uh, disease outcomes. Uh, I think among the various omics uh, technologies, uh, metabolomics, I think is probably the most exciting, most useful uh, technology for precision nutrition research. Um, currently, both targeted and uh, uh, untargeted metabolomics uh, technolo technologies have been widely used uh, in um, nutrition epidemiology studies and also in intervention studies. Um, about um, 12, uh, 13 years ago, I, I had the opportunity to collaborate uh, with Clara Kalish at the Broad Institute because he developed uh, a very robust um, uh, a metabolic platform using LCMS. And this platform uh, can generate, uh, can detect more than 700 
Pacrit metabolites mostly the amino acids, metabolites, lipid metabolites, as a catechin metabolites, and then thousands of uh, non pacrit uh, uh, metabolites. So um, in the past 10 to 15 years, we have been um, trying to incorporate uh, this kind of technologies into our large cohort studies. I, I think this kind of technology, especially metabolomics, has the potential to shift the, par the research paradigm of nutrition epidemiology to from black box epidemiology to systems epidemiology, which would um, uh, incorporate the system biology tools such as uh, metabolomics into uh, large epidemiological studies. And I think now system epidemiology is recognized as uh, important a new direction in nutrition and uh, metabolic, uh, metabolic disease research. And also metabolic, metabolomics has the potential uh, to improve dietary um, uh, assessment. That's something I'm going to talk about in, in just uh, two minutes. And uh, another important utility of metabolomics is to facilitate uh, uh, developing more um, effective precision nutrition or personalized nutrition uh, tools for prevention and management of type 2 diabetes. Of course, at this point, we're still facing a lot of uh, uh, challenges uh, in, in this area, including a lack of robust and reproduce, reproducible results, high costs of uh, omics technologies, and so many methodological uh, issues. However, uh, when we combine metabolomics technology with nutrition epidemiology, I think it opened up a, a lot of new opportunities for nutrition uh, risk, uh, including improving dietary assessment uh, in free living populations, calibrating estimate of dietary intake, by the objective biomarkers of uh, adherence to dietary interventions and dietary patterns, and also proving uh, prediction of future risk of diet-related diseases and, and therefore uh, facilitate personalized or precision uh, nutrition. So uh, in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, we have um, conducted a high throughput metabolomics analysis uh, in a um, uh, large number of participants in our three uh, cohort studies, uh, the nurse health study, professional follow-up study, nurse health study two, he already uh, has already mentioned uh, some of the, uh, the cohorts. Um, so far, we have metabolomics data for more than 20,000 participants in our cohort. So those, co those participants also have repeated measures diet for decades, for three to four decades, and also have GWAS data, we have also collected 20,000 stool samples from those participants. So you can imagine that by integrating metabolomics data with genomics data, microbiome data, and also uh, decades of diet and lifestyle uh, data collected, uh, in those cohorts can really provide a unique and powerful opportunities uh, to uh, delve into the complex relationship between diet, uh, metabolic pathways, and the, and the various health outcomes. Uh, in the past 10 years, I also have had the, uh, uh, the pleasure and the privilege to work with Jordi and, and Miguel uh, from the Pratimax study. And currently, we have uh, two ongoing NIH projects in which we um, con have conducted large-scale, high-throughput metabolomics profiling of the Pratimax participants and to look at um, the effects of the Mediterranean diet dietary interventions on changes in, in those metabolites and whether changes in those metabolites mediate uh, the benefits of uh, the Mediterranean dietary interventions on risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So in general, we can say that precision nutrition has three uh, different utilities. The first one is to improve uh, dietary assessment and, uh, and, and also monitor compliance in the intervention studies. And the second is to better understand biological mechanisms. And the third one is to develop more effective personalized uh, nutrition strategies to improve health outcomes. So in terms of dietary assessment in the last uh, 15 uh, years, um, numerous metabolomic studies uh, have been conducted to uh, identify uh, novel objective biomarkers for dietary intakes. So using the combination of uh, intervention studies and uh, observational analysis, many plasma or urinary metabolites have been identified to reflect 
uh, intake of a uh, uh, wide range of, uh, of foods, food groups and dietary patterns. So you can imagine that some of those uh, metabolites can be used as uh, biomarkers for uh, food intake. However, at this point, um, most of those biomarkers are not uh, very specific. Uh, one example is uh, plasma concentration of PMAO. We know that high PMAO is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. If you measure uh, plasma concentration of PMAO, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell whether this person is a high red meat consumer or high fish consumer because uh, PMAO can uh, derive from the metabolism of uh, uh, carnitines in red meat and can also come directly from fish. So that's why measuring plasma metabolites alone is not sufficient to, um, to have an accurate and a comprehensive assessment uh, dietary habits. Um, it means that we still need traditional dietary assessment tools such as uh, dietary records, 24 records, or FFQs. Uh, recently, we published a paper in which we identified a, a metabolic signature to uh, distinguish between healthy versus unhealthy plant-based diets. So uh, this signature include um, a multiple uh, lipid metabolites and also branch chain uh, uh, metabolites and the polyphenol metabolites from various plant-based foods. And we found that uh, this signature is strongly associated with uh, lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And even after the adjusting for um, for BMI and other dietary factors. So potentially this signature can be used to assess um, uh, individuals' adherence to uh, a healthy plant-based diet versus an unhealthy plant-based diet. And it also can be used to uh, predict future risk of uh, uh, di diabetes. Uh, in this uh, analysis, we used the PREDIMED cohort as a discovery cohort and, and the developed a metabolic signature uh, for adherence to Mediterranean diet. And this signature comprises 67 metabolites, and we were able to uh, validate uh, this signature in uh, uh, our large cohorts. And then we look at the association between the signature and the subsequent risk of uh, coronary heart disease. We found that this signature is associated with lower risk of CHD in both the Spanish and the US populations. And then we uh, did a random randomization analysis using genetic variants uh, associated with the signature. We found that uh, uh, um, genetically inferred metabolic signature is also associated with lower risk of uh, uh, CHD and stroke. Um, we are currently uh, a part of the uh, dietary uh, biomarker development consortia jointly funded by NIDDK and uh, USDA. Uh, the goal of this consortium is to identify food-based biomarkers using the state-of-art metabolomics technique combined with uh, 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 pharmacokinetic studies, dose-response feeding trials, and observational analysis. So uh, the consortium include uh, three clinical sites, uh, Harvard, uh, Fred Harch, UC Davis, and the GCC is the Duke University. We're currently in the second year of, of this uh, project, and uh, hopefully in the next year or two, we will have some interesting results to report. So the second uh, precision nutrition is to uh, elucidate biological mechanisms. Uh, I think at this point, using multi-omics analysis, uh, it can really um, enable us to have much better understanding the biological pathways, uh, um, uh, especially at molecular level. And also, this, the multi-omics analysis can help us better quantify individuals' variability in response to uh, dietary interventions. Several years ago, uh, Mata Gosh uh, in our group conducted the first meta-analysis on uh, metabolomics and type 2 diabetes. Uh, at that time, uh, there were only uh, eight prospective cohort studies and in total 8,000 participants, and only a few uh, metabolites uh, were found to be a robust predictors of type 2 diabetes. And then last year, we updated this meta-analysis, and um, um, in this updated meta-analysis, we have uh, 44 prospective studies with uh, more than 80,000 participants. So you, you can say that uh, the number of uh, studies, diabetes studies using metabolomics has exploded in the last few years. 
and um, uh, the sample size uh, for the cohort studies uh, almost increased by tenfold. And also, uh, we were able to uh, identify more than 100 metabolites that were statistically significantly associated with uh, type 2 diabetes, even after uh, multiple testing uh, adjustment. So this is a really remarkable uh, progress advance within a very short period of time. And many novel uh, metabolic pathways were identified for uh, type 2 diabetes. I don't have time to get into the details, but among the more than 100 uh, metabolites that confirmed in our meta-analysis, many of them belong to amino acid met met uh, metabolism pathways uh, and also leaf metabolism pathways, acetylcholine metabolism pathways. So I think this kind of studies really enhance our understanding uh, the uh, etiology or pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. And using the repeated measures of uh, metabolomics data, we look at changes in uh, metabolomics profile over 10 years and subsequent risk of type 2 diabetes. And um, the, the, the results are really interesting because using the change, uh, metabolic change data, we were able to uh, not just confirm uh, the metabolic pathways that were associated with type 2 diabetes in previous studies using only baseline metabolic data, we were able to identify uh, some novel metabolic pathways that were associated with uh, increased risk of diabetes. Another fascinating area we have um, uh, worked on is the uh, tryptophan metabolism pathways and, and the risk of type 2 diabetes. Uh, as you know, tryptophan is an essential amino acid. Uh, it plays a very important role in uh, immune function, in brain function, and also in obesity and the diabetes uh, metabolism. So, um, Tryptophan is metabolized by uh, two major pathways. One is pathway, and the other one is a gut uh, uh, microbial uh, metabolism pathway. And uh, these two pathways compete with each other. And also, uh, these two pathways are influenced by uh, different uh, dietary uh, intakes. And so that's why in this study, we uh, look at the interplays or interactions between uh, genetics, uh, diet, and microbiome composition uh, in relation to um, uh, uh, metabolic pathways and how those metabolic pathways influence uh, incidence of true diabetes. So uh, for this study, we use the uh, Hispanic Community Health Study. The study of Latinos was so as the primary or discovery cohort because this cohort has uh, very rich data uh, not just uh, um, uh, various omics data, but also uh, very uh, carefully collected data on diet uh, among various Hispanic uh, 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 populations in the U.S. And uh, uh, for the replication, we used Eric Framingham Heart Study, PredMed, and uh, the Women's Health Initiative. Uh, I don't have time to get into the details, but the several I think very important takeaways from, from this study. The first one is that the host tryptophan and its heteronin related pathway metabolites showed a positive association with true diabetes, whereas microbial pathway metabolites, especially in the propionic acid or IPA, showed the inverse association. So it means that uh, IPA, uh, the microbial metabolites, is beneficial for, for diabetes, whereas the uh, creatinine. Uh, metabolize uh, 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 positively associated with uh, diabetes. And then I think what's even more interesting is that we found that uh, plant-based dietary, uh, plant-based uh, fiber-rich diets were associated with increased beneficial metabolites like IBA. And uh, on the other hand, a diet high in animal protein associated with uh, this um, uh, adverse metabolites, creatinine uh, metabolites. And also the effects of fiber-rich diets on uh, beneficial metabolites uh, are mediated through uh, gut microbiome composition. Uh, so it means that if you eat plant-based fiber-rich diet, uh, it can shift the metabolic pathways of tryptophan from a host met uh, metabolic pathways to more beneficial gut microbial pathways. So I think this is just an example of how 
integration of various omics data, metabolomics, gut microbiome data into a nutrition epidemiologic study can help us uh, better understand the biological mechanisms through which various dietary factors influence diabetes risk. And also can, um, I think, help us um, formulate more uh, personalized, more effective dietary interventions to reduce the risk of diabetes. Uh, in terms of personalized uh, dietary advice, uh, at this point, there are not r many good examples of uh, this kind of advice based on genetic background, even though, I mean, there is a lot of hype about the nutrient genomics. So uh, the classic example uh, is that uh, the avoidance of dietary phenylalanine uh, for uh, individuals with uh, PKU, uh, but this is a very rare condition. This is, uh, again, a classic example of gene diet uh, interaction. Other examples include a gluten-free diet based on, uh, for example, uh, celiac genetic and biomarker testing, a lactose-free diet based on lactase-persistent genotypes, uh, decaffeinated coffee for individuals carrying uh, slow uh, caffeine metabolism genotype, and also avoidance of alcohol for individuals carrying alcohol flushing uh, um, uh, genotypes. So this kind of examples, I think, are interesting, but they don't, do not necessarily apply to uh, pre prevention and management of chronic diseases. So one example I want to give to you is the, um, the study we published recently looking at the interaction between a polygenic risk score for type 2 diabetes and diet quality and the risk of type 2 diabetes in our cohort. So we initially hypothesized that uh, uh, people who have high genetic risk score may benefit more from high quality diet in terms of primary prevention of diabetes. But what we found is that there is no, absolutely no interaction between diet quality and the, the genetic risk score. It means that uh, a healthy diet is beneficial for uh, prevention of diabetes uh, regardless of your genetic background. On the other hand, we found many reproducible uh, gene interactions for obesity. Obesity, of course, uh, is much easier to study in terms of gene environmental interactions because BMR uh, is a continuous phenotype and uh, has much more statistical power. So in this analysis, we found that uh, um, people with high genetic risk to score for obesity uh, are more susceptible to deleterious effects of uh, sugar sweetened beverages. So uh, you can say that uh, most people gain weight uh, uh, as they uh, consume more sugar sweetened beverages, but the amount of weight gain is much greater uh, in the highest quartiles of the genetic risk to score than those in the lowest quartiles of genetic risk to score. So it means that individuals with uh, high genetic susceptibility to obesity, they are most, uh, also more susceptible to that deleterious effect of uh, sugary beverages. Uh, on the other hand, you can also say that regular consumption of uh, sugar sweetened beverages actually amplify the deleterious effects of uh, obesity genes. So this means uh, interplay or interaction between our genes and our diet. But what's the public health implications of, of this kind of findings? Probably not much because we should advise everyone to reduce sugar sweetened beverages regardless of their uh, 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 obesity uh, genetic uh, um, susceptibility, susceptibility. So this is like uh, cigarette smoking. Everyone should stop smoking or not smoking uh, uh, regardless of their uh, response to uh, that deleterious effects of cigarettes on either cardiovascular disease or lung cancer. Uh, in recent years, microbiota uh, targeted interventions uh, have emerged as, uh, uh, I think, a very promising area for personalized nutrition or precision nutrition. So there are m several uh, microbiota targeted interventions, including the whole diet approach, uh, fermented foods, um, um, probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics uh, interventions, and also fecal um, uh, micro, uh, microbial tr uh, transplant. So these different strategies can be uh, potentially tailored to individuals' uh, health conditions and the microbiome composition. However, uh, based on the clinical trials that have been conducted so far, the interventions used in probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics approaches uh, had only very modest benefits on glycemic control and blood lipids among people with uh, uh, diabetes. And those effects are actually much weaker 
then the whole diet approach using uh, either the Mediterranean diet intervention or um, uh, or uh, uh, parent or vegan uh, diet interventions. Uh, recently, Daniel Wang uh, published a very interesting study looking at the interactions between uh, microbiome composition and uh, uh, adherence to Mediterranean diet in relation to cardiometabolic disease risk uh, using data from our cohorts. So as expected, adherence to the Mediterranean dietary pattern is associated with a healthy microbiome composition. So the uh, increased abundance of uh, bacteria uh, that are involved in plant uh, polysaccharide degradation and the short-chain fatty acid uh, uh, production. But what's really interesting is that uh, um, the microbiome composition of the individuals actually modified the uh, protective association between uh, Mediterranean dietary pattern and uh, cardiometabolic disease risk. So for individuals who uh, carry a, a lot of uh, uh, this um, species bacteria, uh, Provocatella uh, capri, uh, they benefit more from the Mediterranean diet uh, adherence than those who uh, carry uh, a lower amount of uh, the same bacteria species. So it means that uh, uh, individuals' response to Mediterranean diet may depend on um, uh, your microbiome composition. But again, what's the public health implications of these kind of findings? We are recommending healthy dietary pattern for everyone, regardless of their microbiome composition. But uh, this kind of data, if uh, they're robust, reproducible, can be your in terms of uh, making more personalized uh, uh, nutrition recommendations. Uh, in the last several years, um, several computer algorithms have been developed for uh, personalized nutrition or uh, precision nutrition. So the first one was developed by a research group at the Westman Institute in Israel. Uh, it was published um, uh, in 2015. This is really a seminal paper. And uh, they developed a computer algorithm uh, uh, to design a personalized diet um, to lower postprandial glycemic response. And then a couple of years ago, uh, Tim Spector from the UK uh, developed a computer algorithm to predict human postprandial responses to uh, food and, and, and meals. So those computer algorithms um, were, um, I think, were, were very robust in the study populations, in their study populations. So the question is whether those computer algorithms can be generalized to other populations, uh, I think at this point is still uh, uh, unknown. Uh, so these computer algorithms or the publications have uh, sparked the emergence of uh, uh, personalized nutrition companies like Day2 uh, from Israel and uh, Zoe from, um, uh, from the UK. Uh, so those companies offer microbiome testing and also personalized uh, nutrition apps, but it costs a lot of money, a few hundred dollars to uh, just uh, do one program. Uh, so far, only a very few studies have um, evaluated um, the performance or the efficacy of those personalized nutrition programs like day two. So this is a very Next study uh, conducted by uh, the Westman um, Institute researchers. So they compared uh, personalized uh, diet intervention group using the uh, the day two program uh, with uh, Mediterranean diet intervention. Uh, the intervention lasted for six months. It's a pretty long term intervention, and uh, they found that the personalized diet intervention using the day two program was much more effective in terms of reducing HbA1c. Uh, reducing uh, um, postprandial glucose response and also reducing body weight and was improving triglycerides. So those results are very promising, suggesting that this personalized approach may be more effective than the standardized uh, approach. Uh, what's really interesting is that uh, this personalized dietary intervention actually uh, led to a low carbohydrate diet. So at the end of the trial, uh, the intervention group consumed about 23% calories from carbohydrate versus 46% of calories for, uh, in the, uh, from carbohydrate in the control group. So uh, I think that's really interesting finding. The question is, uh, is the uh, personalized diet app 
or is the low carbohydrate diet <laughs> really uh, uh, improve the health outcomes among people with pre-diabetes or diabetes? Uh, I think that's something uh, need further um, uh, investigation. Uh, just recently, this paper just published uh, in AJSN uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, this uh, similar study was conducted among pre-diabetic uh, and uh, moderate controlled uh, type 2 diabetic patients uh, in New York City. And um, again, they used the um, day two app uh, in the uh, personal intervention group. And then the control group was a standardized diet and low fat. Uh, intervention. After six months intervention, uh, they found that the personalized diet did not result in a greater reduction in uh, glycemic variability or HbA1c uh, in patients with pre-diabetes or moderate control diabetes compared to the standardized diet. So uh, the, the results, of course, are, are quite disappointing. But of course, the, uh, there are many differences between the Israeli study and this study. Uh, besides population uh, differences, uh, a major difference between these two studies is the compliance to the, uh, to the personalized diet app. So in the Israeli study, um, through six months, um, majority of the participants, 80% of them, uh, continued to use the uh, personalized diet app to monitor their diet. But in the US study, only 20% people uh, use the, uh, the personalized diet app at the end of the trial. So this means that even if you have a perfect um, personalized diet uh, program or app, if people don't stick to it, uh, it's not going to be uh, uh, effective in, in the real world. So to can summarize the three utility of precision nutrition, uh, so in terms of dietary uh, assessment, I think uh, metabolomics and other omics technologies uh, hold uh, uh, promises novel biomarker discovery for food intakes and dietary patterns, but they are complementary to rather than uh, replacement for traditional nutrition uh, biomarkers and the self-reported dietary assessment tools. In terms of biological mechanisms, I think this is probably the most fruitful area of research in precision nutrition. As I mentioned earlier, those technologies uh, have shifted the nutrition research paradigm from black box epidemiology to systems, bio, uh, 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 systems epidemiology. However, we should recognize that although new mechanisms may be discovered, clinical translations are still challenging and will take time. And in terms of personalized nutrition advice, um, I think the AI-based tools are very exciting but they're still in the early stage and probably not for prime, prime time uh, uh, in terms of diabetes management or prevention at this point. And uh, in many situations, the commercial products outpace uh, the ad evidence. And another concern is that the, the personalized nutrition tools uh, may actually widen health disparities. So there has been a lot of debate uh, uh, regarding the pros and cons of the public health nutrition approach versus nutrition approach Currently, uh, precision, precision nutrition is very hot, um, and a lot of money uh, is, uh, has been poured into precision nutrition uh, research. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, NIH uh, has funded a huge, enormous precision nutrition project. On the other hand, uh, public health nutrition approaches like uh, lifestyle behavior changes have been um, uh, uh, always um, underfunded. And we know that uh, um, type 2 diabetes and other chronic diseases are largely preventable by diet lifestyle uh, modifications. So in this study we published more than 20 years ago, we found that uh, adherence to five low risk factors, not smoking, maintaining a healthy weight, uh, moderate to exercise, uh, to vigorous exercise half hour per day, uh, eat a relatively healthy diet, uh, moderate alcohol consumption. So adherence to those five uh, low risk factors can reduce risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 90%. The population attributable risk is 92%. It means that the majority of type 2 diabetes is potentially preventable through those. Unfortunately, only 4% of the uh, participants in our cohorts get to all the five uh, low risk factors. We also found the adherence to those five low risk factors 
can extend life expectancy by at least 10 years. So here for females, for those who didn't follow any of the five uh, low risk factors, their life expectancy at age nine years old. However, for those who followed uh, all five factors, their life expectancy at age, age 50 is 43. So it means that uh, uh, there is a 14 year difference uh, in terms of the uh, adherence to um, uh, the five low risk factors. And also uh, those low risk factors, not just to improve um, lifespan, but also improve health span. What we found is that most of the life extended by following those lifestyles are chronic disease free life years. So it means that uh, it improves both quality and the quantity of their li li diet and lifestyle modifications. And that's why I think we need a, a policy solution uh, to uh, curb uh, current obesity and uh, diabetes. Uh, pandemic, of course, is very important to develop effective new drugs for treatment of those conditions. But for primary prevention, we have to uh, address societal, environmental, and, uh, um, and the behavior effects. And to improve our food environment, we do need uh, policy uh, uh, solutions like taxation, uh, so that uh, uh, sugar sweetened beverages uh, limit uh, restricting marketing of uh, unhealthy food to children and also food labeling. Uh, so again, we have to deal with not just the individual factors, biological factors, but also our food environment and the built environment. Uh, before I close, I just want to briefly mention uh, several of our current actions, uh, including the food-based uh, biomarker discovery using metabolomics, AI-based uh, smartphone apps for dietary assessment, uh, and uh, multi-fluid and multi-omics interviews in our uh, large cohorts. And I also want to mention that uh, a faculty in our department, Sheila uh, Isalaka, uh, is doing a very exciting study using microbiota guided interventions for male nourished children in Africa. I think this is probably much more effective than chronic disease prevention. And also, uh, Joseph Matai uh, is adapting the PREDIMED interventions to low income Latinos in Puerto Rico. So, the study uh, is called PROMAD uh, Puerto Rico uh, Optimized uh, Mediterranean Diet Intervention. Last but not least, uh, Lillian Chen. Uh, and the colleagues eating interventions um, to improve diet quality and chronic diseases. So, so this come back to what I said earlier, precision nutrition is about not just uh, 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 what we eat, but how we eat. We know that mindless eating has been a major public health problem because it leads to positive energy uh, balance and obesity. And recently our school launched uh, a, a center called um, Tik Lahan, Center for Mass in Public Health. This is a very exciting uh, center. The goal of this center is to use mindful interventions to improve human health and also the health of the uh, planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this exciting, at the same time, provocative uh, <laughs> lecture. I think that it was a very good decision of the steering committee to bring Dr. Shuang here. We have some some uh, minutes mm -hmm. uh, for potential questions from the floor. Sure. John? John? Yeah. Uh, tremendous. Thank you. I'm wondering, as you're showing, or we're seeing time and time again, whether it was with um, the trial or what you're showing, adherence appears to be the most important determinant of gaining the benefit of any diet. You've got to get it past the mouth, and people have to be able to sustain the change. Is there any metabolomic or approaches, multi-mix approaches, to actually identify uh, that would correlate with different dietary approaches, a Mediterranean or mm -hmm. vegetarian, vegan, or you know, more fruit, vegetable, forward diets, mm -hmm. so we could actually help match people to help your diet? Well, I mean, this has already been done for various uh, um, uh, intervention studies or cohort studies. I understand that the, the direct trial is also developing the metabolic signature for adherence to uh, the uh, long-term adherence to 
to dietary interventions, uh, potentially these metabolic signatures can be used as objective markers of adherence and also used as uh, uh, intervention target. Yeah, can you? Frank, that was a superb Thank presentation. You. I can't say enough. Um, so many things I'd like to say, but there was one thing that stood out to me. You, you have a slide that's an advantage for people with lactase in to consume lactose-containing products. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it got through to the large bowel. Uh -huh and then provided an interaction mm -hmm. that improved, um, I think, the better. Right, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, you have a wonderful uh, observation because this is very subtle in, the, uh, 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 in our um, uh, 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 paper. So lactose uh, can be used as a prebiotic. People who, have, um, uh, who carry lactose uh, some uh, genes, and they can metabolize um, um, lac lactose. But for people who don't carry those genes, they cannot metabolize uh, lactose. So the lactose passed down to the small intestine, metabolized by by the bacteria. So uh, that's why some people can adapt to um, to milk after yes. a long time. <coughs> so the bacteria is very important. Um, play a very important role in metabolize uh, mm -hmm. lactose, but it has to be introduced to your diet gradually rather than having uh, two glasses of milk <laughs> yes. every day. So. Yeah, and, and the implication long to me is that feeding those bugs is really mm. important, and we don't really talk much about it except in fiber terms, that lactose becomes a fiber or any yeah. any fermentable or unabsorbable carbohydrate mm -hmm. could therefore be used for the same purpose uh, perhaps yeah exactly yeah. so yeah. i mean fiber is widely recognized especially certain type of fiber is widely recognized as a prebiotic compound and then polyphenols are also uh, metabolized by the bacteria in the gut that's why we have so many secondary metabolites you can measure uh, in blood or urine samples and uh, those metabolites reflect both your intake uh, of fruits and vegetables and other uh, polyphenol-rich foods and also the composition of the bacteria. Because if you don't carry those bacteria uh, or you not have those bacteria, then uh, the metabolism of the polyphenol-rich food is going to be uh, less efficient and then you are not going to have the secondary metabolites which can play a very important biological role. Yes. <coughs> Two other questions? Mm. Hello? Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Here you okay, are. my name is Sarah. I'm a medical associate. And uh, if you don't think about money but only about health, don't you think, based on your research, that um, a CGM would be the best tool for a person with type 2 diabetes to find out what the right thing to eat when and when? or she should eat? Sorry, I <laughs> didn't quite understand uh, what you say. You say, okay. you talk about C the role of CGM? Yeah, what do you think about a CGM for all per type 2 diabetes? Oh yeah, I think that's a fantastic tool. And uh, I, I think, I mean, CGM uh, is, has revolutionized uh, how uh, diabetes can be managed, especially for type 1 diabetes, of course. But for type 2 diabetes, uh, I think, I mean, all the precision nutrition studies have used CGM to monitor their blood sugar. And also, uh, individuals can learn uh, what kind of foods are good or not good for their diabetes by uh, monitoring their glucose use using CGM. I, I think the main issue, of course, is long-term long compliance. So those patients have to be motivated to continuously use CGM or um, after I mean certain period, uh, they are able to follow or s stick to the diet that the uh, kind of identified CGM um, kind of self intervention period. John Sabatier. Mm -hmm. Frank, thank, thank you 
trying for you re uh, database presentation and also with a good balance approach. <coughs> I'm intrigued by the last sentence of your slides. As far as <laughs> the mindfulness. Minute. Mindfulness, right. Uh, it has been always said, I mean, among the Mediterraneans, mm -hmm. not only what you eat, but how you eat, when right. you eat, and mm -hmm. why you eat, mm -hmm. and especially among uh, mm -hmm. why you eat. I mean, there mm -hmm. are many reasons for becoming whatever, mm -hmm. vegetarian or any other. So I wonder, I mean, what would be the research agenda of Created Center, if you want to elaborate a little right. bit. Right, well, so Lillian Chen, she uh, wrote a book on hand um, 15 years ago called Savor, so it's mind but um, house. And Thich Nhat Hanh, as you probably know, uh, is a master, and um, he uh, has been a, a global advocate of mindfulness approach, not just uh, for our health, but also for the health of the planet. He passed away uh, last year, so we, our department has the uh, honor uh, to use his name, to name the center. Um, and uh, so what Lillian Chen and our colleagues are doing is to develop mindfulness-based interventions for, uh, for um, prevention of childhood obesity and also for um, imp uh, elderly people. So there are a lot of interesting preliminary data that have already been published by using this approach to improve diet quality, to improve body health, to reduce stress, to reduce anxiety, but how to incorporate mindfulness framework into public health, into nutrition, I think that's a major agenda for, for our center. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Just um, very briefly. Sorry. <laughs> Are you going to look at <laughs> NRAM University of Copenhagen, Denmark? So wonderful presentation, very, very uh, inspiring. Um, but the who and the what and uh, the why, et cetera, but what about with whom you eat? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a kind of, a, <laughs> that's kind of a how, you, how question. I mean, how, as John Sabatai just mentioned, the Mediterranean tradition uh, is eating uh, with your friends, with your family, and, uh, and take time to appreciate the foods and the wine. And, and, and it's not like, uh, I mean, fast food culture in the US and people uh, walk and well eating or just uh, swallow <laughs> a whole burger within like uh, mm. 20 seconds. Mm. So I think the, this is an important aspect of uh, precision nutrition or, or uh, personalized nutrition. Yes, and we, we have seen that the Sardinians, for instance, live very, very long because they don't smoke or drink or whatever. It's because they're very social, they're never alone. So it's uh, mm -hmm. probably extremely important for, right, for right. health. Thank you. Right, thank uh, Frank. Great, great talk. I, I just wanted to submit a different, make a clear points about the balance between public health nutrition and yet you argue that we have spent too much money or too much resources inve invested in precision nutrition or nutrition. Now, if we think harder, a lot of the uh, evidence base for public health nutrition, I worry that a lot of what we do, if you look at the history of our profession or our, our field, a lot of what we do was often sort of untoward consequences for the public nutrition. And I think a large assumption that often overlooked by many in our field, I think unfortunately, is that we feel like we know a lot. As you already very mm -hmm. clearly articulated, that nutrition diet is extremely complex. It's a way of life that right. we are trying mm -hmm. to study here. And the big assumption that is that our current understanding of the biology is still so mm -hmm. to the level that we cannot.
not really predict confident that what would happen or con consumption any type of diet now. Obviously, we have a couple of uh, really trial, high quality mm -hmm. trial, including the Women's Health Initiative, mm -hmm. including the pretty map that you have shown, like some of the landmark trial. But by and large, recommendation for nutrition is still uh, very sensitive, but not mm -hmm. specific, meaning that that leads to a lot of the folks won't come. Mm -hmm. Right, so the data is also documented. Eighty percent of the U.S. population, for example, don't pay attention or don't adhere to uh, the authoritative recommendations of what kind of diet they eat. So uh, this is my long way of making an argument that oftentimes make a lot of recommendations, develop a lot of guidelines again and again. Uh, almost like a academic exercise, and yet we don't seem to be able to truly provide mm -hmm. uh, long-lasting solution, particularly mm -hmm. field of nutrition and health. So I, I example analogies like in the field of astrophysics, for example, physics, they can do the kind of experiments that involve a physicist to find the truth. And it's that case to do that experiment. And yet for us in New Child, the leaders are oftentimes to set up their own domains and never really work together to truly tackle a true, mm -hmm. um, true solution. Right. And I yeah, invite I, you to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I see what you are saying, um, but a public health nutrition approach should also be evidence-based. I mean, when we talk about uh, improve the quality of school lunch programs, uh, talking about improving the quality of SNAP, the foods in, in SLAP program, or uh, lifestyle medicine that Jeff and I talked about yesterday. I mean, the problem is that nutrition is not even in the medical school curriculum. And lifestyle medicine uh, is not widely uh, incorporated in uh, clinical practice. So there's so many gaps that we need to fill in terms of public health and medical education and the training of uh, health professionals. So I, I think those two areas are not mutually exclusive, but I think it's, good, I think it's important to have some balance so that, uh, um, I mean, we can individual health in the meantime also improve population health and the health of our planet. So, all right, I'm negative one minute. So thank you very much. Uh, time is flying. So uh, before Simin, we had uh, half time for half a question, but now we do not have the time. Okay. So. <laughs> all right, thank you very thank much you for very your much, attention. Uh, okay. Uh, everybody, we are going to uh, reconvene back here in about 10 minutes to start the next session. So get up, stretch your legs, and then hurry back, please.
So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Are you hungry? <laughs> so don't worry, this session will, will uh, be a very short session. But before uh, the, uh, the final session of just three lectures, very short lectures, uh, after that we will have opening ceremony. But unfortunately, we have to, to make a little bit change. Uh, as a hierarchy, and it's a rule that uh, the most important uh, on hierarchy is person who has to speak at the end of opening ceremony. But unfortunately, the, the Ministry of Health uh, and State Ministry of Health uh, couldn't uh, join us till the end of this meeting and till the end of opening ceremony. So we will make a little bit change just for this situation. We will continue with the next, next session, which I will chair uh, co together with Professor Jeffrey Mechanic. And we will have the opening ceremony. And after that, don't worry, we will have dinner. Uh, I already uh, checked, and dinner is uh, already pre in pretty good situation. So we will have very nice dinner, I promise. So uh, to make long uh, story short, I will kindly introduce our, uh, our State Ministry of Health, Professor Bubash. Uh, she will uh, briefly uh, speak uh, on behalf of Ministry of Health and also on behalf of President of uh, our government. So it's our great pleasure to have you here in front of uh, so many important people and with uh, very um, uh, important speech. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you and having you here. Um, I would be very happy that you could stay till tomorrow. I know Me because <laughs> because of your obligations, but. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you thank very much. You. Dear Daria, thank you. I see that Daria is very excited. Uh, <laughs> but uh, since this uh, short talk I have had with him um, just last few minutes ago, uh, I'm kind of excited too. Uh, I'm ki I kind of realized that um, I'm not only greeting the academic society or worldwide academic society, um, I'm greeting you in, in front of the government of the Republic of Croatia and the Prime Minister and Minister of Health, Professor Beros, and of course in my own name. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, to the organizers, the Croatian Society for diabetes and uh, metabolic diseases of the Croatian Medical Association and to the University Clinic Vukvar Hlad. And I would like to say that I'm overwhelmed that the whole world of um, diabetes is here. The scientists that deal with uh, this important uh, disease that has been enabling and influencing many persons' lives uh, since we have changed the, the, the um, order of, of speech, maybe we can turn the wheel for diabetes as well, I don't know. Uh, since I have here also the um, abstract book, I have, I have had the chance to see who the speakers are and who the speakers were, and I have the chance to read the abstracts and I think that and I hope that you will exchange your know-how and knowledge and experiences for the better of our patients and for the situation in Croatia I think that uh, here in the room we have people that know more of diabetes than I do but I have to say that um, from the perspective of Ministry of Health we have entered the second wave of our reform and it's prevention oriented and having in mind that 88% of the expenditure uh, for, for diabetes is um, directed towards treating complications of diabetes, then I, then I think that prevention is even um, more important and has even more important role. And speaking of the fact that this is the land of Andrea Stampar, I, I think that I don't have to explain who Andrea Stampar was. Then this ministry has 
perceived in, in the, in the, um, as planned to have in this reform also the mobile units for treating diabetic patients and for prevention of diabetes. So in this regard and having in mind that this is 40th International Symposium on Diabetes and Nutrition, I would like to thank the organizers and I would like to welcome you in Croatia and in this beautiful city of Pula in Istria. I would like that you have a good conference, you exchange knowledge and experiences for the sake of our patients and also to enjoy a little bit. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Bubash, for your um, kind words for uh, as introducing uh, this uh, 40th International Symposium on Diabetes and Nutrition. And it's my great pleasure to, to announce, as you can see, that the Ministry of Health is uh, patronize, uh, patronizing uh, the, uh, this symposium. So please uh, express my gratitude to the Ministry of Health and also to the Prime Minister of the Republic of Croatia and it's my special thanks goes to you because it wasn't easy to, to come from Zagreb just to, to be here for, uh, for a very short period of time and to go back to Zagreb because of your other duties. So thank you very much and I wish you a safe trip and I, I would kindly ask uh, for one set of applause for our minister. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, I had to m make a little bit change in our programs, and, but uh, I believe that you can understand. It's my great pleasure that my good friend of mine, uh, Jeff Mechanic, Professor Mechanic, I don't have to introduce uh, him to you because he's worldwide, uh, world known uh, professor uh, of endocrinology and diabetology. So it's my pleasure to be with you here. And uh, right now I have a pleasure to introduce our first speaker in this session. It's uh, another good friend of mine, uh, Professor uh, Bojan Milaković. Professor Bojan Milaković uh, is a professor of medicine. He is uh, president of Croatian Society of Hypertension. Uh, he's also president of Croatian League for Hypertension. And also he's a full uh, member of uh, uh, Croatian Academy of uh, Science and Arts. Uh, but also I already mentioned him uh, during the first session because I spoke that uh, I said that he will speak about uh, the soil production program in Croatia. Uh, I really believe that it was a worldwide famous project and I'm very grateful that uh, he did a great job in soil production program in Croatia, but also uh, I uh, admire him because he has so many energy uh, uh, in fighting against uh, salt uh, consumption in Croatia. We are doing the same, we are trying to do at least the same uh, with sugar consumption and also uh, uh, beverages, uh, sweet, uh, sweetening beverages, but together we can do a lot. So, and it's my great pleasure because uh, we are very good friends and we are supporting our societies. And he will speak about a uh, very nice program, soil production uh, uh, program in Croatia. So, Professor Jakovic, uh, welcome to Pula. And it's my great pleasure to be here on this conference. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dario, for nice words. Good, good afternoon or good evening to everybody. Well, uh, I will not speak about diabetes and obesity or nutrition. I will, some, how I will speak about nutrition because about salt consumption. I will start with hypertension. As I'm hypertensiologist and this is the main focus of my interest. And I would like to remind that high systolic blood pressure is the killer number one worldwide. As, uh, as you could see here from data uh, from the last report published in Lancet, 
almost 20 of the deaths are related to high systolic blood pressure, not to hypertension, but to high systolic pressure. And of course, it is followed by dietary risk, by obesity, by uh, diabetes, etc. So what is the next problem? And we heard excellent talk uh, in the previous session, the public health and uh, possibilities of prevention, and it's failed. And as you could see here also, instead of decreasing, uh, all the risk factors increasing. So for instance, high systolic blood pressure was ranked seventh place in the 1990s, and now it is first place. And Croatia, unfortunately, is a red zone for every for high systolic blood pressure, for smoking, for dietaries, for obesity, for diabetes. So we have all those here. So uh, I will just like to show you briefly how is the situation changing in Croatia. Something is going wrong, something is going better. But what is important and what is alert, the prevalence of hypertension is increasing. And you can see here, 15 years ago, this is the crude uh, prevalence. The prevalence of hypertension was 45%, and now it's 51%. So the prevalence is increasing. Uh, but the good news is that the control of treated hypertension is better. It's the same situation for men and women. And you can see here, in comparison with other countries, Croatia in some issues better than others, but as I told you, the prevalence is higher than in majority of westernized countries. However, in some countries, the situation is similar as in Croatia. And what is hypertension? Hypertension is not high blood pressure. It's everything. It is poor lifestyle reflections. And this is how we uh, present these uh, bad lifestyle uh, to our general population. We call these demons, demons of hypertension, but it could be also called demons of diabetes. It's high salt intake, obesity, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, and smoking. And of course, stress is here, particularly in our country. So if you add to this poor blood pressure measurements and poor adherence, what is the uh, situation with diabetes, uh, then we have some early scenes of hypertension. And again, here comes stress and something new. Air pollution, noise, what is also mentioned in the previous lecture, as independent risk factors, not only for hypertension, but also for diabetes, which is the consequence of, which is uh, related to climate changes also. So these are uh, two maps of Europe uh, 15 years ago, and one is, uh, this one on your left side is uh, showing the prevalence of hypertension, and on your right side is showing the, high so the salt intake in countries. And Croatia at that time was here. Uh, the prevalence was, as I said, 45%. And salt intake in Croatia was 30 grams per day. And this is the report published recently, last year, uh, WHO for the European region. It was a, a systematic review of all studies conducted in different countries. And Croatia is here. The average salt intake in men at that time was 30.4 grams, and for women it was approximately 10.5 grams. And it was similar for Montenegro, in Slovenia, all countries who used to live in one country uh, several decades ago. So se same culture, same civilization, same uh, in habits. And then we decided to uh, change something. And we start, as I call this 16 years old salt war and I will show what we have achieved. Uh, World Action on Salt and Health was launched, and only a year after the Congress of Croatian Society for Hypertension, we launched a declaration about the importance of national strategy of salt consumption. Then we called it CRASH, Croatian Action on Salt and Health, and next several years, years we spent uh, um, with research because we, we wanted to do with, uh, we wanted to have evidence-based facts. And then you can see here we are in 24 urine, and this is the data I showed you before. Then we also conducted several clinical studies to show uh, the association of salt intake and blood pressure because Croatia was not included in the intersal study. And then in collaboration with our partners, Croatian Food Agency, we determined the content in the bread. 
and you can see here that salt content in bread at that time was 2.2 percent so the largest salt content in uh, worldwide and we immediately start with educate awareness of general population but also physicians and uh, stakeholders and start negotiation with food industry and government and then you see the first success appeared very early uh, two years after we have start the first uh, decreased salt content uh, from 800 milligrams to 120. Then in uh, 2011, WHO uh, launched nine glo uh, global voluntary goals. You all are aware of them, and it was followed by UN resolution. And then next success, see uh, we approach bakery industry, and they have changed the approach and they have changed and they start to decrease salt and this is the first bakery industry which decreased salt from two percent to 1.8 percent then we publish scientific opinion on effects of salt reduction in food and the same year ministry of health started a strategy for Sosha. then minister of agriculture who is in charge uh, uh, for fruits uh, for food stuff uh, launched the regulation of grain and bread stuff and said the content of salt, should, salt in bread should not be more than 1.4. And the next success, and this is the world record, the biggest meat industry in Croatia, big Kerberets, decreased for 25% in all their products. So you can imagine how this uh, was hard to negotiate with this biggest meat industry in Croatia. And then suddenly, Minister of Health stopped the strategy. But we didn't stop, we continued. And then we, uh, we in collaboration with Minister of Agriculture, uh, launched the next uh, regulation, we slowly decreased salt content. And now it was uh, said that salt content should not be more than 1.3% in bread and bakery. And then we uh, tried to, uh, we wanted to be sure whether they are following our instructions and then we determined salt content in bread and you can see here, uh, 10 years ago it was 1.85 and now it is 1.59. Uh, so they are truly following our recommendation. We published several scientific opinions and we conducted next salt mapping and this salt mapping default intake in Croatia significantly decreased. So this is our declaration, this is the crash and our motto is less salt more health. Then this is some of educational materials we, are prepare, we prepared and this was very popular that one. And then this is this mineral water, this, this is WHO and UN resolution, and this is the bread which first decreased salt content without any regulation. This is the scientific paper, and this is the, this document strategy for salt reduction, which is unfortunately stopped. Uh, so it was said in that document that we should decrease gradually 40% per year, that we had to increase awareness on salt harmfulness, and then we had to define food categories of prime interest, bread and bakery, processed meat, cheese, etc., and then to determine salt intake by measuring 24 urine sodium excretion, and to develop this in collaboration with food industry. We achieved almost everything. And this is this audience on cereal and products and uh, cereal and products from cereal. And this is uh, truly something uh, for uh, which Croatia should be proud about because not so many countries have such, such regulation. This is this meat industry and less salt, more health and education materials. And we are educating also population that salt is not related to high blood pressure, but also to, to cancer, to nephrolithiasis, to osteoporosis, to uh, heart disease, to stroke independently of blood pressure, and so on. And now I would like just to show of salt mapping we conducted in Croatia. It was part of this uh, project, Epidemiology of Hypertension and Salt Intake in Croatia, EHUG2. So what is EHUG2? It is a nationwide pro project which included random sample of general population and 
hypertension prevalence, severance treatment control, uh, and salt intake were the main uh, aims of this project. And But we didn't all, only determine salt. We also, as you could see here, determined potassium because the ratio between salt and potassium is even better and more important than salt. And also we determined iodine. But we also analyzed prevalence of overweight obesity, prevalence of edemia, pre-diabetes and diabetes, and we will sh very sure soon have data about this. Then prevalence of hyperuricemia, prevalence of arterial stiffness, central blood pressure, uh, atrial fibrillation, HFF, CKD, the whole cardio metabolic uh, continuum will be uh, covered with this project. And of course, thyroid gland, because many of uh, Authorities still doubts that decrease of salt intake could be related to increase of thyroid diseases, what is not sure. So uh, I will show just only objective three to determine salt intake using the gold standard 24 urinary sodium and to compare the result intake with data obtained in research conducted eight years in the framework of the national program. So this is just the way how we randomized our population. And this is, we use very strict uh, uh, rules for 24 urine collection. It was single 24 urine collection, but we uh, collected on regularly working day to avoid big family, friends, meetings, and eatings, not during the festive seasons. And the participants were given very strictly and precise and clear instruction how to collect and handle urine 24 period. Then we, we exclude all urine during the samples, and you can see here how we uh, decided which urine sample will be accurate and which one will be inaccurate. And this is how usually salt, uh, salt urium sodium is converted to the salt intake. And I will show you just data uh, we, before the COVID, and we, because the COVID stopped our project and we continued after the COVID. So this is, the, and you, as I said, uh, you can see here, the salt decrease men almost to two, two grams per day. And in women, it was less, but they started from the lower uh, salt contained sodium intake. So it was um, acceptable. And then uh, our plan was to decrease 4% per year. That means three grams in five years. So is this failure or it was achievement? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? And I would like to say this is a good result. We also, I would like to show awareness in our population. This is street epidemiology. We are conducting this every year at the World Hypertension Day or during the My Measurement Month. See here how in these nine years, everything was uh, increased. Uh, population are much more aware of harmful effect of salty. They are getting more information from physicians. They are aware of breathing too salty, and many more uh, more uh, thinking that they, they would be able to reduce salt intake. And many are now believe that bakery products are main source of salt. And then this year, in fact, this is action we are still uh, conducting this uh, to uh, my measurement month. We, this is the first results we have. You can see here that everything almost is in the right direction besides two points. Uh, this is the, the less information uh, uh, the general population get from uh, physicians. And you can see here, less uh, population believe that baker products are main source. So very probably because now they know already that baker products are the main source, and this is the reason, but what about physicians? So now you can see here the, who are giving now information far more information, and there are key pieces of data. It could be said that there are uh, missing link in uh, non clinical chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes. I think you should also use pharmacies much more education as we have. And you can see here, uh, media are also proclaiming what we uh, wanted to do, and this is the reason why physicians now are uh, the last percent of physicians is in this uh, found. And as I said, you can see here that now the salt content in bread in Croatia is 22% less than it was 15 years ago. And they measure blood pressure, and you can see here the average population blood pressure is lower, 3.4 over almost two millimeters of mercury at the population level. So what does it mean? Two millimeters of mercury lower, that means 7% less deaths of coronary heart disease and 10% less death of stroke. 
So, but salt intake is still high in Croatia. And we are, as I said, despite Ministry of Health is not uh, supporting us. And I would just make comparison with North Karelia project, which was conducted, as you all know, in Finland. And North Karelia project began in 1972. And what they have achieved related to salt intake, you can see that in this 30 years period, they decreased salt intake for three grams per day. And it was associated with the 10 milligrams mercury uh, decrease in, in population level uh, and uh, resulted to a decrease of 75% less stroke and coronary heart disease. And when we put this in context with Croatian data, then it, you can see here that we are on the halfway. But we have achieved this not in 15 years, we have achieved this, in fact, in last eight years. So we are faster than Finland. So to conclude, in last 12 or 16 was achieved in Croatia. We increased the awareness of harmful effects of salt, cooperation with food industry, particularly bakery and meat industry. We published uh, several regulatory documents, and this is a nice example for many countries in Europe who do not have it. Uh, we, decrease, we also observed a decrease in average blood pressure in general population, but salt intake is still very high in Croatia, even higher than we thought before. And we need uh, continue this even stronger, but now we much more support for policy, for politicians, for stakeholders, and I hope it will be changed. And you know, the Hippocrates is our father, and he said prevention is better than cure. Everything in excess is opposite to nature. We just have to follow him. So, and our project we called the hunting the silent killer. So we started this, uh, this hunting season, and I'm inviting all of you to be hunt. Uh, silent killer, regardless you call it diabetes or hypertension, you have to be aware of salt. And I hope the dinner will be with less salt tonight. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Nelako, and dear boy, and it's my great pleasure to, to have you here. We will have the discussion at the end. Fine. As, as I already mentioned, I am proud to be Croat, and uh, I really believe that after this lecture, uh, you agree with me that uh, it's nice to be Croat, and we should be proud on our country and, and physicians like you. Thank you very much once again, mm -hmm. and I would kindly Thank ask you, Professor Mikhailov, uh, who is our next speaker. Great. Thank, thank you, Dario. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce our friend, Professor Tanya Lenkovich, uh, truly a pioneer in diabetes education and president of a lot of things I've, I've learned. Uh, Macedonian Diabetes Association, Macedonian Scientific Association of Endocrinologists and Diabetologists, and also chair of the Macedonian National Diabetes Committee. And Macedonian, uh, North Macedonian National Diabetes Committee. Anyway, we'll be uh, hearing our talk on uh, your talk on evolution of education. Thank you so much for the kind uh, um, introduction and great thanks to my dear colleague and friend, uh, Professor Rakhavich, for this kind of honor to be with you with this so important symposium to share with you my thoughts about the diabetes education, which uh, should be a central part of diabetes treat treatment. I'm not sure that it is. Uh, so, uh, uh, at the, almost, the, the approach or the patient-doctor relationship was quite journalistic. And uh, doctors usually were making decisions on behalf of their patient without their consent on, or, or even their knowledge. What, what was the common behavior at that time? Uh, so, uh, but very soon after insulin discovery, it became very clear that the patient need to have certain education about the, diabet about the diabetes treatment to avoid not just hypoglycemia, but to meet many other challenges uh, regarding the insulin treatment at that time, how the patients were teached to treat their diabetes were quite different worldwide. So um, the history of diabetes education is uh, at the beginning of last, last, starting beginning of last century, almost simultaneously 
in USA and, uh, and it was Elio Jocelyn in USA, in Europe. There was uh, Ernesto Roma, it is a Portuguese um, physician who uh, actually uh, uh, first established the Association for the Protection of Poor Persons with Diabetes, APDP, which exists now and it is the oldest association in Europe. And they're treating patients in a very specific manner. Uh, they have everything on one place for treatment of diabetes, which is very, very unique and important for patients with diabetes. But I think so that the crucial figure in uh, diabetes education is Professor Philippe Assau from, from, from Geneva University, who make a, a therapeutic patient education. And uh, Michael Berger in Düsseldorf was the first who introduced the structured diabetes education program for patients with type 1 diabetes. And this is the uh, foundation of diabetes education study group, 1979 in Geneva. It was the first symposium and all the uh, important persons for diabetes education at the time was present at this first symposium. Uh, but uh, actually, the, the diabetes education works and can improve the outcome of diabetes uh, uh, shows uh, this paper, which was published in 1970 by Leona Miller, of course, uh, a woman from USA, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this uh, this uh, very interesting work, and she showed that after uh, diabetes education program, the patients were able to reduce acute diabetes complication together with hospitaliz hospitalization about it for up to 70 to 80 percent, which shows that diabetes education can work. And this was the beginning of a new model or new approach in patient-doctor relationship with more empowering model and the patients were, were actually put into the center of, uh, of the treatment. And, and, and of course, the patient is very important part of the treatment of, of his own disease, her, his, her own disease, and he make the main decision about the treatment, which is absolutely a healthcare team, and he uh, should have a great, uh, make this, uh, this uh, decision for his disease. So this approach was um, on many other human sciences, uh, science, like sociology and many others. And of course, um, we came to this structured therapeutic diabetes education, what was at the beginning uh, of the diabetes education. And according to WHO uh, definition, that this education was uh, uh, approach to patients to help to acquire a certain knowledge and ability to treat uh, his own diabetes, but also to help the family of the patients to help him to deal with the disease, uh, to live more healthily and with the most, uh, uh, the most uh, higher quality of life. But since then, the things uh, were changing because the beginning when, when uh, the scientists were trying to evaluate the, uh, the diabetes education. There are attempts to evaluate the diabetes, and very soon was uh, clear that uh, the education can increase diabetes uh, knowledge of the patients, and also can increase their skills to manage diabetes, and even to influence their motivation to treat their diabetes. But this wasn't enough to make some uh, some bigger, uh, bigger achievement in the diabetes. So it became clear that the behavior is the most important part of patient behavior. Uh, if we try to change his behavior, then we can maybe affect the outcome, outcome of, of his diabetes. So, so we came to this model, Diabetes Self-Management Education and Support on BSMS which is a lifestyle intervention. And I think so we have a lot of in common with uh, Diabetes Nutrition Study Group because it's the mainly uh, education of these seven uh, the topic parts about diabetes, which means healthy eating or healthy nutrition. 
then physical activity, monitoring of diabetes, regularly taking medication, but very important, problem solving during diabetes, healthy coping, finally reducing the risk of the disease. So DSMS, actually, uh, this is the program that involves many different educational, but also psychological and behavioral intervention, uh, which is tailored to a specific need, needs of the patients, and it depends on the period uh, of diabetes uh, that the patient is at, at the moment. So uh, it is the self-efficacy is the one of main points of DSMS, and also, it is often uh, considered as a part of diabetes education, which actually is not, it is a step forward. It, it means not just education, but empowering patients to take control over uh, its disease and to try to solve the problems during the, uh, during the disease. So it's uh, that there is a four crucial time for this uh, education to be uh, performed at the beginning of the disease on the regular controls each year, then during the complication and in any other transition during the uh, specific uh, patients and, and his life with uh, diabetes. And it should be part of routine care, it should be patient-centered, and very important, it must be reimbursed or recognized recognized from the third part. So somebody must recognize diabetes education as a really vital part of diabetes treatment. So uh, until now, we do know that, that there are a lot of benefits out of education. It can improve metabolic control, quality of life, uh, uh, patient uh, higher satisfaction. It can decrease complication and healthcare cost. Uh, also, there is a, two very good uh, examples of programs like this in mainly in UK and English-speaking countries. Uh, Daphne for patients with type 1 diabetes, which shows a lot of improvements, even in metabolic control. And also Desmond in patients with type 2 diabetes, and they're still active in, in English-speaking countries and are very helpful in, in dealing with, uh, with uh, diabetes. So until now, uh, we know that the patient education is quite effective tool in this so many aspects of diabetes, in metabolic control, in, in, in patient satisfaction, in quality of life, and, and so. But um, according to the literature, just uh, it is very different, but we can find that one to 50% of whole patients with diabetes actually have access to diabetes education. So it means that uh, even half, at least half of the patients, they, they are not getting the proper education during their diabetes, because in many countries, diabetes education is not recognized as a part of diabetes treatment. And despite that, we have a lot of uh, new insulins and very uh, modern and, and expensive drugs, we are not meeting the targets in diabetes treatment. And I think so that we uh, very often miss, miss this education, which can fulfill the gap between science and the real practice with, with, that we are uh, having in our everyday uh, life with patients or people with diabetes. So even if we, we uh, just uh, look this our final uh, or last guidelines. We are seeing at the upper part of the slide that <laughs> there is a very important role of education, but the main of the slides are so many, so many uh, new drugs, and somehow we are forgetting that, that still the central part of uh, diabetes treatment should be approach to patient and also his proper education for all these complicated treatments that we are offering to the patients. So in my summary, I should have that, uh, should, should, I want to say that we have a very good scientific evidence that education is very helpful in diabetes treatment and um, that we have plenty evidence and that very different ways of education 
I mean, group education, individual, even telemedicine way, and everything can uh, work in different patients. That's why there is no one uh, size that fits all methods, but it is important for patients to have education, no matter what type of education. So we are here just to provide our patients a condition uh, and they should treat their diabetes together, together with us. So I'm for that, that we would like to provide them such a condition to treat their diabetes. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Milenkovic. It was an excellent talk, like always, and it's, I'm, I'm great. it's my great pleasure that Professor, uh, this is our anniversary. It's not of this symposium. This is 40 anniversary. Uh, of international symposium. And can you imagine that 10 years ago I met for the very first time Professor uh, Milenkovic in Chennai, in India. We, did, uh, we, we haven't chance uh, to meet each other before, met each other in, uh, far away from our countries in India. And since then, we are uh, so close friends and thank you very much for your friendship and also support of Croatian Diabetology. She is the president of the uh, Society of Endocrinology and, uh, and Endocrinology uh, of North Macedonia, as Professor already said, but also uh, she is recently became the president of Diabetes Educator Study Group, but also she is a member of uh, Executive Committee IDF Europe, and now it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, who is the president of uh, International Diabetes Federation of Europe, uh, Professor Nebrisha Lalic, who is um, the professor of medicine at the University of Belgrade. He's director of Clinic of Endocrinology and Diabetes at the uh, Serbian uh, University Clinic Cent Clinical Center, but also he's dean of School of Medicine and he's a full member of Serbian Academy of uh, uh, of uh, science and arts. He will join us virtually. Unfortunately, he was in Athens, uh, in Greece, Harris. Uh, he was in, in, in your country uh, uh, last weekend uh, together with Professor Milenkovic because they had the board meeting, as you know, uh, of IDF Europe there. Uh, and unfortunately, he, uh, uh, he couldn't come because of health issues, but uh, hopefully, Nebojša, that you you were recovering right now. I'm I'm really sorry yeah. that you couldn't join us and uh, welcome at least virtually to Croatia. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished chairman. Uh, thank you very much, dear Dario. And uh, it is uh, a great pleasure uh, to be at this meeting. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation and also for understanding that I couldn't come in person, but uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes when you travel all around, uh, you, 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 you catch something and have to make, to make a, a certain break. However, uh, I'm also grateful to you that uh, I will have uh, some space to present uh, the latest uh, developments uh, in uh, IDF Europe uh, uh, and uh, to, to, to just uh, show to everybody uh, present uh, in your auditorium uh, that uh, th th there is an attempt uh, to uh, change uh, the policy, to upgrade it and uh, to uh, upgrade the position of the people with diabetes in Europe, which is, I think, uh, the goal of all of us. So, uh, I hope that now I could, uh, could somebody from the technics, can, uh, can I have the next slide then? can be taken for support maybe to, 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 to change the slides so you can change the slides and professor can just sorry professor can you just share your screen you you are the only one who has a control of your presentation so unfortunately you have to uh, just uh, change your slides just please 
Please try to do that. Mm. Yeah, that's in the yeah here 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 no here. Okay. So uh, sorry for this uh, this uh, uh, break. So uh, the the uh, a, a, any organization that would like to be uh, functional if not successful has to have its uh, vision and mission and uh, uh, the vision and mission of uh, IDF Europe uh, uh, has uh, changed slightly but has always been uh, is there another way to improve the lives of people with diabetes and the, of those at risk and uh, uh, in order to put it in a, in a more more specific terms uh, the mission uh, is to be the voice of people with diabetes, uh, but uh, slightly more than that, and it is important because everybody now is uh, uh, still thinking that we are just the voice of um, people with diabetes acting that their needs are not fulfilled. And uh, we would like to engage with them and all stakeholders in creating a person-centered diabetes ecosystem. And uh, we are not selfish in that. Uh, we would like to do that within an informed uh, and health-promoting uh, promoting environment. And uh, in this context, uh, uh, in the context of improving the life of people with diabetes and those at risk, uh, we do think that in this two years period of time, we would like, uh, our, our priorities would be to reduce diabetes prevalence, to improve people with diabetes quality of life and health outcomes through better access to quality care. And this is the world that is especially, I think, interested uh, for some regions of Europe uh, that are uh, still not having uh, uh, balanced access to the latest uh, opportunities and, uh, and, and uh, the latest uh, drugs and uh, procedures uh, improving the quality of care. And finally, uh, we, didn't man we didn't forget the idea to increase the voice of people with diabetes uh, through the uh, an intention that they would be uh, uh, and uh, uh, not noticed, but participating in important decisions. Uh, in order to uh, fulfill uh, these uh, these tasks, uh, we have uh, our work plan, which has uh, three main three main uh, components. One is driving policy change. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, especially communicating for impact, because uh, there is uh, there, there is an impression. And until now, we didn't have enough impact in the international community, even not uh, among the uh, non-communicable diseases. Then building capacities, uh, uh, especially in our member associations, supporting them to, uh, to create something which would be near to the people with diabetes. And, and finally, transforming ourselves transforming IDF Europe, uh, first of all, as it can be expected, uh, diversifying the funding and optimizing the uh, network uh, value uh, by uh, increasing the communication among the, uh, among the member, member associations. Uh, with that, we are, as I said, uh, neither selfish nor alone. And uh, this is the number of partners with whom we are participating and uh, is European Diabetes Forum. But however, there are others uh, with whom we are participating in different uh, activities, uh, uh, but uh, uh, having our own agenda and uh, trying to, to um, associate them uh, to uh, our, all, our program, as well as to participate in accordance to our opportunities, op uh, opportunities uh, in, in their activities. Uh, so in this context, uh, based, based on what I, what I mentioned, um, there are, uh, we, we have defined some projects and programs 
for this year. And uh, I would like, uh, uh, this is the list of our priority projects and programs, which is not, uh, which is not short, as you can see. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, we would uh, continue our tradition of uh, celebrating uh, World Diabetes Day and uh, having a separate symposium at EASD and also to give uh, uh, our special prizes by the end of the year at the regional council. But however, uh, we have also some more specific uh, uh, activities, uh, one of which is centenary of the insulin campaign and then try to, to uh, tackle with uh, some of them specifically. Uh, uh, one, uh, something which uh, we would like to put an emphasis on is uh, uh, the idea of Europe policy and advocacy program, which, uh, which uh, ended up in uh, a number of documents uh, which we uh, managed to present uh, in Europe uh, and with the diabetes in the center. Uh, in this context, uh, on the 22nd of November of the, uh, last year, the new diabetes resolution has been uh, adopted by European Parliament, and uh, uh, which uh, implied a number of activities on uh, with the Commission and uh, uh, with uh, uh, with other other levels, uh, and uh, that that would be our task. Uh, for this year regarding EU. But however, um, due to the fact that, uh, that uh, the uh, idea of Europe uh, involves uh, 77 organizations from 46 countries, uh, uh, there, are, uh, there is a significant number of them out of the EU. Uh, and uh, we wanted uh, to uh, uh, to, to uh, make it as a sort of comprehensive activity, put, uh, putting all the countries together and reframing uh, with, with an idea of uh, uh, making a high level summit by the November of this year uh, in order to uh, encompass, in order to include all the countries in Europe uh, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that, that would like to follow uh, follow this uh, this example. Uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, everlasting idea of centenary of insulin campaign, why everlasting? Because we uh, uh, wanted to recognize the thing of uh, that there are, there is uh, uh, there are hundred years after the discovery of insulin as the hundred years of a modern diabetes care. And uh, so not to restrict only on the beneficial uh, miraculous effects of insulin and discovery, but also uh, to improve uh, diabetes care in all its aspects, uh, technology, um, uh, approach to the patient, uh, access to care, and so on, uh, up to the rights of the people with diabetes, uh, and uh, we decided to make a program which, last, which would last for three years, starting in 2021 uh, until January 2024. And in this context, uh, we um, have proposed uh, some, uh, 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 some activities that would be uh, capacity building uh, through the twinning program strengthening the network between diabetes association and stimulate the knowledge sharing and strengthening the impact of association activities uh, in order to make uh, the whole organization more uh, more uh, functional and less uh, less formal because uh, uh, previously due to the maybe like uh, financial means uh, or like of initiatives, uh, it was restricted to yearly meetings. And nowadays, we uh, paved the way to 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 increase this uh, this network of member associations and to exchange good examples and uh, the possibility of resolving some important problems. Uh, 
uh, in the next next task would be the European uh, uh, Europe uh, IGF Europe's community of people living with diabetes. And in that context, uh, we thought for a decade now, and uh, uh, Dario was very active uh, also on the IDF level uh, in, the, in the development of youth platform for the future, um, uh, future uh, we call them leaders in the, in the uh, diabetes care, young people who themselves do have unfortunately diabetes or not, but uh, they would like to uh, help uh, to, uh, um, after the special courses that we are having uh, every year uh, to, to help uh, promotion on the peer-to-peer -peer level uh, in order to, to pave the way for the future education, capacity building and community building. Another thing that we recognize that is really the problem in every country is that uh, people with type 2 diabetes are uh, in, a, in a sort of second, uh, uh, second row of, the, of, the, of our, our activities. They are less active, maybe they are because of the thing that they are overwhelmed by other duties. But however, the advocate, uh, maybe they don't believe in this type of organizing, but uh, uh, nowadays we have launched a number of advocacy initiatives in that area to, to uh, just uh, improve this advocacy platform. Uh, finally, uh, IDF uh, uh, Europe has started um, this, uh, a year ago and uh, hasn't yet finished due to many other activities as uh, some type of diabe European diabetes code, which would explicitly give to the people with diabetes what are their rights, what, uh, how they can express their voice, and uh, how can they, uh, in, in what of the social activities they can participate. And we are at the very end of this initiative uh, um, in order to, to uh, empower the people with diabetes uh, going on with this, uh, with this, uh, 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 with, with uh, the, uh, having the diabetes code in their uh, their own hands. Uh, it, uh, the, we have continued the tradition of IDF Europe, which was uh, that uh, IDF Europe uh, had a lot of uh, leadership uh, in publications. Uh, there was there were a number one uh, a number of them like in innovations in medicine uh, we are preparing innovations in medicine technology innovations of care delivery and the position statement papers and uh, uh, different webinars are conducted throughout the year but what I, what I would like to emphasize in the end is uh, leveraging the new EU diabetes resolution uh, on uh, both national and European level. Uh, we uh, have prepared a toolkit for member associations to guide their advocacy within EU member associations, uh, at their advocacy efforts at national level, and uh, we, we try uh, to intensify the consultations with, uh, with them. On the other hand, at the European level, we uh, we have developed European Diabetes Code. Uh, in uh, we are there to uh, to help the future activities within EU that are following the resolution at the Parliament. And finally, we are uh, preparing for the high-level summit in di on diabetes. Why a high-level summit on diabetes? Because uh, uh, we uh, have an idea to uh, make uh, um, to make the uh, the the, uh, uh, the an advantage of the, this momentum to uh, go on with the, uh, to 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 uh, go on with the new documents and uh, to have a uh, platform uh, for the whole Europe 
European region by WHO definition. And in collaboration with WHO Europe, we are preparing the high level summit at which all European countries would send their representatives uh, by, uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it is settled now that it's going to be by uh, the end of November this year, which would uh, uh, not only reinforce uh, those uh, uh, principles that, uh, that are already in the EU resolution, but also that would uh, go to further on uh, in, this, uh, in this agenda. And I would like to go on, but now there is a problem with the slide. Okay, so uh, why high-level summit on diabetes? As you can see, there is the whole continuum of these type of documents that started from St. Vincent's Declaration in 1989, which was very uh, brave uh, idea to improve uh, diabetes care with some goals that were listed uh, uh, it appeared to be that it was uh, too ambitious for uh, the the uh, the time of the resolution. But, uh, uh, um, however, it was the first attempt to gather all the European countries at one place, and the ministers uh, have signed the, the declaration. Uh, how, uh, however. Uh, the, uh, the the immediate uh, happenings after its historical ones after 1989 did not uh, allow uh, and the overall circumstances uh, since this declaration goals uh, to be uh, to be fulfilled. But however, uh, it uh, was the first attempt in the right direction. Uh, national plans, diabetes national plans was uh, the consequence and for the first time mentioned in this declaration. And then we had a number of, uh, of uh, uh, attempts, uh, first EU diabetes resolution in 2012, but very recently uh, uh, on the occasion of Century of Insulin, uh, we have these three type of events. WHO Global Diabetes Compact, which was dealing more with NCDs than diabetes, new EU resolution, and finally, a high-level summit on diabetes, which would, uh, I think, lead to the other event in 24 and uh, 2030. And so uh, th this, is, uh, this is why we, uh, we, we decided to, uh, to, to go for this high-level summit which would uh, 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 finally uh, show what are, in more specific terms, uh, the goals of a diabetes community, community in, in, in Europe. And uh, thank you very much for having the, uh, the, uh, the, the patience at the end of this uh, interesting day to uh, listen for the activities of IDF Europe, and uh, if somebody would like to uh, just uh, um, visualize uh, the activity through IDF Europe org, it is it is on this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Valich. Uh, thank you very much, Dylan and Boisha, uh, for joining us. Uh, hopefully, you will stay because uh, uh, on behalf of IDF Europe, we will have uh, just a few words in opening ceremony. Of course. Uh, uh, I'm quite sure and I'm proud to say that uh, Croatia was also very important in the creation uh, of St. Vincent Declaration. Uh, and the late Professor Skrabal was there and also uh, the Croatian, famous Croatian model uh, lead, uh, led by uh, Professor Skrabal and after that with Professor Metelko uh, and Professor Granic and Professor Tsar and other, uh, other people at the University Clinic, Vuk Vrhovac University Clinic was uh, worldwide famous. Um, probably you will, uh, you will agree with me, Professor Valic. And, and yeah, yeah, yes, of course, uh, it was the time then, uh, by, by, by the way, I'm an awardee of uh, Vuk Verkhovets, 
yeah. award uh, for the young diabetologist. I was I was young by that time, <laughs> you oh, know. Oh. Well, I'm proud, that, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm proud that I'm proud that right now uh, I'm chairing the uh, Vuk Vrhovac University Clinic for Diabetes, and yeah. I'm proud to, to say that as a president of Croatian Society for Diabetes and Metabolic Disorders. I am proud that our society is a member of IDF, and I was a part. Uh, I was a member of executive committee of IDF Europe in bi biennium 2019 and 2020, and I was a secretary of IDF Europe. And I know how uh, hard we work IDF Europe, and also as you mentioned in IDF uh, Global, because I was chairing, as you already mentioned, the young leaders in diabetes program. Because young people are uh, the future of uh, diabetology. I, usually things that, uh, think that I am young, but probably I'm not as young as I, I, I believe, but that's, that's life, it's destiny of all of us. So uh, I will kindly ask, thank you very much once again for, for your excellent talk, and right now I will give uh, the, the uh, word to my co-chair, Professor Stephanie Kendall. Great, thank you, Dario. Dr. Kendall, how many uh, minutes, how many questions do you think? Two, one, got it. Okay, if we could have just the speakers up front and ready. Um, two questions or comments, but really keep it short and to the point, and the answer short and to the point. John. Thank you very much for the excellent presentations. Uh, Professor Jelakovic, I've got a question for you regarding the salt reduction strategy. I'm wondering, uh, you've targeted the main food sources, so processed meat and bread, um, but have you, and you're, you're working with producers, so that's one approach. But have you also, in terms of public health policy as it relates to diet, are you trying, are there activities to reprocess meat, for example, consumption? So it wouldn't just be that it'd be reduced within processed meat, but people would actually consume less processed meat. Uh, <coughs> yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, not only bread and bakery industry, but also meat industry is also uh, included in our pro program, if I may say so. And we started our negotiation with them more than 10 years ago, and it took time they had to change the formulation and recipes. So it is also was not only bread and bakery, but also meat products. And in parallel, we are educating people and population how it is important to read labels, to know what they are eating, and to try to avoid the salty food. Great, thank you. I guess you. my question is, are you are trying to shift your diet more plant-based and maybe limit processed meat as also a public of health Of course, yeah, sure, sure. This is also plan of our strategy. And you know, uh, furthermore, we are talking now with meat industry to change the ratio of salt and potassium. And now they are doing this, they're increasing potassium and decreasing salt in the products. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Um, does the does the strategy is in Croatia for salt reduction? Who's the question for? Um, the first speaker, Professor Lubovic. Yeah, does this salt reduction strategy in Croatia include, for in fact, label label warnings? Well, yeah, it was our wish and our hope, but for this we need support from ministry, you know, and for government, and so far we do not have it. So we are struggling alone, you know, uh, scientists and physicians and nurses, nutrition, this is our project, not project of government. Thank you very much, Professor Jalakovic, and uh, to, to uh, all speakers in this session. I, I told you that it will be a very interesting session, and I'm proud to, uh, to say that we have really good uh, strategy and salt reduction program in Croatia, as I already mentioned in, in the beginning. So this session is, uh, I'm, I have to close this session. Thank you very much, Professor Montani, and thank you. <laughs> and right now we will start with opening ceremony. I promise it will be very short opening ceremony because we are waiting for a welcome drink and after that for a dinner. Thank you. So, once again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I don't know how many times this evening I said good evening, but still, uh, let me say just a few words. It's my privilege to, to be a local organizing, uh, organizer of this uh, international symposium on diabetes and nutrition for the third time. 2013, 
2019 and 2023. I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Cyril Kendall and also to Professor John Sivan Piper, but also to previous chairs, Professor Ursula Schwab, to Professor Ulf Rieserus, uh, Professor uh, Pfeiffer, and all uh, previous professors who were chairpersons of Diabetes Nutrition Study Group. Also, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to the secretary of the group and also uh, to uh, our friend Paris. Sorry, I always have a problem with pronunciation of your son. It's very difficult. Uh, probably my surname is also difficult for, um, for other, uh, other people. Uh, so that's the reason why I call you Harris and you know that I really respect you. Also, I would like to express my gratitude to all uh, members of executive committee, not just this one, but also previous one, who gave me opportunity to be the local organizer. I would like to express my gratitude uh, to all uh, speakers, to all uh, chairpersons, and to all of you. You are my friends, and I hope that you will have a nice time here in Croatia. We will have fruitful uh, meeting and also discussions, but also I believe that we can make even better connections because here are people from more than, you wouldn't believe, 40 different countries. At the end of the day, we will have, not today, but uh, at the end of tomorrow or the day after, we will have more than 140 people in this room at this conference. And my special uh, uh, thanks goes to people who are uh, coming from very, very far away, like you, Professor uh, Jane Brand Miller from Australia. It's not easy, or from Canada, or from Singapore, or some, some other countries. It's not easy to come to some small country with 3.8 million people. But I believe that you will have a nice time here in Croatia, because Croatia is a very nice country, more or less. Uh, all of you have already been here, not here in Pula, but I believe that you will have a nice time here in Pula. I would like to express my gratitude to, uh, to my vice president of society and also the former president of Croatian Endocrine Society, Professor Željka cenčević orlić my vice president of uh, uh, Diabetes Society, Professor Klobučar, and also to my organizing committee uh, and also uh, the uh, executive committee of our society. But also, I would like to express gratitude to our, uh, the Croatian, uh, Croatian Academy of Science and Arts, uh, because they are co-organizers. Uh, my special gratitude goes to the Department of Medical Science of Croatian, uh, Croatian Academy of uh, Arts and uh, Science. And also, this meeting is under the patronage of Ministry of Health and uh, also the president of our government. So I would like to express gratitude to them. And uh, once again, my dear friends, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, welcome to Croatia. I hope that you will spend nice time here in Croatia, in Pula, this beautiful place close to Italy, just very close to Adriatic coast uh, or to Adriatic Sea. I hope you will even have opportunity to swim in our Adriatic Sea. Uh, uh, Adriatic uh, Sea. There are no sharks here, so don't worry. We are not. We are far away from Hulgada and from from other places where uh, sharks are. So I wish you a safe place here. I wish you a, a nice stay here in Croatia, and I really believe that you will have a nice time. And once again, thank you very much for your support. I would like to express gratitude also to pharma industry for sponsoring us and also to uh, technical organizers. And uh, right now, I would like to uh, once again to invite Professor Cyril Kendall to come to say a few words. And thank you very much, Cyril, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, I, on behalf of the, of the DNSG, I would just like to thank Dario and his organizing committee for doing a wonderful job in putting this together. Uh, the first day has been fantastic. I think it's been a great program. <laughs> and I'd like to thank all of you for hanging in this long. It's been a long, long first day. And let's go for dinner if we may.
Thank you very much. This is a person with experience. He, he said just few words and he said everything. And, you know, I need time to, to uh, have that experience. Right now, I would like to kindly ask uh, Professor Milicic, who is the Vice President of Croatian Academy uh, of uh, Science and Arts, uh, who will speak on behalf of the Department of Medicine of, uh, of our uh, Croatian Academy of Science and Arts. Uh, he already uh, had uh, his lecture and uh, uh, he will speak on behalf of uh, the Academy. Thank you very much, Professor Milicic, uh, for joining us and thank you very much uh, for your uh, co-organization of this symposium. Uh, good evening, Dario. Good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, an honor to uh, deliver a short speech on the opening ceremony of this uh, anniversary meeting. It is the 40th meeting, and it was really a visionary uh, approach to establish a yearly meeting on diabetes and obesity 40 years ago uh, when these problems were not so uh, important as they are nowadays. Today, diabetes became a very attractive field of medicine, gathering together not only diabetologists, but also uh, some other specialists, cardiologists, as I am, nephrologists, uh, neurologists, nutritionists. It's a very uh, interesting uh, dynamic field with new technologies and with new med medications. And really, we have to uh, share that interest in uh, best treatment of diabetic patients uh, today, uh, the very challenging and, and, and very, very nice uh, to talk about that. Uh, of course, uh, as the second topic, uh, there is obesity. And it is also very important to, to share the newest uh, thoughts and uh, evidence-based uh, data regarding obesity, which is really pandemic and uh, which is going to uh, shorten the life expectancy of uh, contemporary people. Uh, we have to, to, to act fast to, to stop that negative trends. And uh, this is the right way how to discuss it and how to make some improvements locally and globally. Of course, I'm very happy uh, and proud that this meeting uh, has been hosted uh, in Croatia, and uh, I greet you on behalf of the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts, which is uh, the leading representative of science and arts in Croatia, connecting, of course, our science and arts with the rest of the world. Uh, I greet you also on behalf of the Secretary of the uh, Medical Department, uh, Academician Vida Demarin, who was not able to, to attend. And personally, I'm also very sorry that I couldn't join uh, here physically, but uh, I think uh, you can understand and you know how busy uh, men can be, particularly in this part of the year when, when there is full of uh, not only routine job, but many meetings, congresses, travelings, and therefore I, I, I simply couldn't join. Uh, but I attended a, a part of the first day, which was very busy and very interesting. I have delivered the lecture, and I was very happy about that. And uh, I wish you, of course, a very nice continuation of this fantastic meeting that would last uh, another two days. And I hope you'll, on, you'll all enjoy beautiful Pula, Croatian hospitality, and... Uh, I hope uh, there would be another meeting in Croatia or in the future, uh, either in Pula or anywhere else. Thank you very much, and uh, I wish you a nice continuation of the meeting. Thank you very much, Professor Milicic, uh, for joining us. Uh, hopefully next time you will be here uh, together with us. I, I can understand, I, I really understand your uh, obligations, but I'm glad that you, you managed to, to join us at least virtually. Uh, so thank you very much uh, once again. 
And right now I would like to kindly invite uh, Professor Lalic, uh, who is the, as I already mentioned, uh, president of the International Diabetes uh, Federation of Europe, just to say a few words on behalf of IDF Europe. Professor Lalic. At this meeting and uh, uh, I cannot resist uh, trying to remember that uh, it was either in 2013 or 2019 that I participated in uh, the same meeting, uh, which was in Dubrovnik, was it? it? Yeah, it was 2013, was in Dubrovnik, 2019 was in Opatia. Then it was in 2013. And uh, uh, when, I, when I saw this time the agenda and how many uh, lectures are there and uh, the, 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 the size of the meeting, I would like really to congratu uh, uh, congratulate uh, all of you, and especially you, Dario, for for um, ha having the 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 the, the strength to uh, put all these interesting topics together. Uh, we 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 speak about so many things, and in the previous talk, you know, we we have heard that diabetes in somehow in focus. But uh, although uh, I'm not the one that especially involved in nutrition research, uh, I must uh, uh, confess that uh, uh, we are not uh, speaking that much about, uh, about diabetes, uh, uh, about the nutrition and uh, consequently obesity, but even more about the nutrition in diabetes, like uh, uh, we are speaking about new drugs or, or new uh, combinations uh, or new therapeutic technological approaches and these type of meetings have even uh, the, the even more significant more significance more significance compared to uh, to uh, the, the the usual ones compared to just uh, see uh, cross-sectionally what's going on uh, in order not to prevent you from uh, the dinner, uh, and uh, and I would like to wish you all the success, and uh, uh, I and to apologize that the, this year I could not be in person in person with you in uh, uh, ever attracting area of uh, Istria, Pula, and Croatia in general. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Lalic, for your kind uh, words. So at the end, uh, I have to mention also my team uh, where I work, people, physicians, and uh, also medical nurses and uh, clinical dietitians at uh, my hospital. It's Vukvrhovac University Clinic for Diabetes, Endocrinology, and Metabolic Disorders of uh, Merkur University Hospital. Of course, I have to mention our society, which I mentioned, society, the Croatian Society for Diabetes and Metabolic Disorders of Croatian Medical Association. And also I have to mention my uh, School of Medicine of Catholic University of Croatia, uh, which I'm part of it, and uh, all organizing this conference together with Diabetes Nutrition Study Group. And at the end, I would like to express my gratitude to my family, uh, because they are supporting me all the time uh, uh, and all around. I would like to express my gratitude to my wife, who is somewhere here, but I cannot see her right now, But probably, uh, and also to my daughter and son, and also my late parents, uh, mother and father, uh, who supported me a lot uh, to achieve all these great things, and to dear God who helped me to, to come here, and also to be able uh, and to be enough strong from a small country to organize such a meeting like this. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you very much, and I wish you a, a pleasant dinner, and also I'm inviting you for welcome drink, and also uh, to uh, hopefully very tasteful dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you.